I'm going to go ahead and start the webinar. Um, so we will end practice session. I ask everyone to mute their microphones and we'll let attendees in. Thank you. All right, good morning. Thank you for joining us for today's Planning Commission meeting. Today's date is September 14th, 2022. And today's meeting is completely remote via Zoom. So we have a couple of different ways to participate in today's meeting. If your computer is equipped with a microphone, it is recommended that you participate via the uh, Planning Commission Zoom meeting link, which is posted on the Planning Department's homepage at sccoplanning.com. Alternatively, if your computer is not equipped with a microphone, you may provide comment by telephone today. To call in, please dial 1-669-900-6833. And when prompted, please enter collaboration code 814-8152-8029. This information is also posted on the Planning Department homepage. So during key points in today's meeting, time will be provided for members of the public to provide their testimony. Speakers will be muted until called on to speak. I will ask participants who wish to provide testimony to either raise your hand remotely by selecting the hand icon on the Zoom link, or if you're calling in by telephone by remotely raising your hand by pressing star nine on your phone. I will call on participants by either your name or the last four digits of your telephone number. If you're participating via the Zoom link, when I call on you to speak, you'll see a pop-up on your screen that says unmute. Please accept the pop-up, state your name for the record and provide your testimony. If calling in via telephone, you must unmute yourself by pressing star six. And I'll remind everybody of these instructions as we move forward. And if at any time uh, a member of the public has difficulty connecting to today's meeting via the Zoom link or by calling in via telephone, please email me at Jocelyn, which is J-O-C-E-L-Y-N dot Drake, D-R-A-K-E at Santa Cruz County dot U-S. I'll be checking my email periodically throughout the meeting and I can take a moment to assist you. All right, it looks like we are situated. I see we have our commission with us this morning. I'm going to chair, turn it over to the planning commission chair now, Tim Gordon. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, Jocelyn and everyone. Thank you for uh, the intro and thanks for everyone for joining us today. Today is September 14th, 2022, and uh, we can now start the uh, planning commission hearing for the day um, and call this meeting to order. Ms. Drake, could we please have a roll call? Um, yes. Thanks. Commissioner Shepard? Here. Commissioner Dan? Here. Commissioner Violante? Here. Commissioner Lazenby? Here. All right, and Chair Gordon? Here, thank you. All right, move on to uh, our scheduled items today. Agenda item number two is additions and corrections to the agenda. Do we have any today, Ms. Drake? Uh, no, there are none. Okay, great. And then moving on to item number three, Declaration of ex parte communications. Do any um, commissioners have anything to declare today? Okay, I've received uh, a few emails um, regarding today's uh, sustainability update. Uh, and that's that's it for me. So, um, Okay, moving on to item number four, oral communications. This is the part of the hearing where members of the public could have the opportunity to speak on things that are not on the agenda today. Um, Ms. Drake, do we have anyone that would like to speak at this time? Uh, let me check, I see one hand raised. Sorry, my camera. <laughs> I don't know what you're seeing right now. Just okay. to be really clear, so everyone who's gonna raise their hand uh, understands this is for things that are not on the agenda. So if this, if you're gonna raise your hand about the sustainability update, um, that time will come to speak in a little bit. Thank you. And you'll be given two minutes to speak. And I am seeing one hand raised. 
um, by Michael Lewis and Jean Brocklebank. Um, good morning. Please restate your name for the record. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Uh, this is Michael Lewis. I'm here with Jean Brocklebank. I will be giving my comment and then Jean will follow with her comment for her own time after I'm finished on this same connection. I want to talk to the commission today about the, the Planning Commission agenda. Uh, the agenda does not contain instructions for public participation for these uh, remote teleconference meetings on the agenda itself. Uh, you'll notice <clears throat> at the top of the agenda in all caps, please follow the instructions that will be posted on the Planning Department's webpage at, and it gives the URL for the Planning Department webpage. That is not a clickable link. So someone has to know to copy that URL and paste it into their browser in order to get to the Planning Commission, the Planning Department webpage. But that doesn't do any good anyway because the Planning Department webpage does not have instructions for public participation uh, for the uh, Planning Commission meeting. In fact, there is no link on the Planning Department webpage to the Planning Commission webpage. The link that's on the Planning Department webpage if you know what to click on, is to the sustainability update, not to instructions for public participation for general planning commission meetings. And the this new sustainability update, update pages are on a uh, new website that is not accessible to people who have older computers with older operating systems. Uh, for some reason, it requires the very latest uh, operating system and browsers in order to uh, get to that. So it, um, it doesn't help the public at all in getting to these meetings. So what I'm asking you to today is to please direct the planning department staff to include specific instructions for public participation in planning commission meetings on each and every agenda, and to add that link to the planning commission webpage onto the planning department homepage so that we can have full and um, easy access for all members of the public who wish to take part in planning commission meetings. Thank you. Now, Jean Brocklebank will have her own time. Okay, we'll reset the timer for two minutes for Jean. Go ahead. Um, am, are you <laughs> time to begin? Sure, go ahead and start. Okay, thank you. I'll Good morning, commissioners, planning commissioners. Two things. First, I want to address presentations in general to uh, the planning commission and ask the commission chair to instruct all participants at all participants at commission meetings, including planning department staff, to speak slowly enough so that their words don't fly over the heads of everyone in attendance at this meeting. I had a lot of difficulty at the uh, August 24th meeting in that regard. Uh, uh, secondly, I'd also like to ask, I'd like the Planning Commission to consider requesting that the county's Fish and Wildlife Commission be given the same opportunity as the Planning Commission to engage publicly at its own meeting with the planning department on the proposed amendments to chapter five of the general plan before the, before the matter goes to the board of supervisors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. Okay, I saw an additional hand raised. So I will call on phone number last four digits 2915. Good morning, please state your name for the record. You have two minutes. Good morning. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, Becky. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I had a bit of difficulty finding the link this morning and tuned in just in time to hear the two previous speakers very uh, addressing the very issue that I, I want to say as well. Uh, public access is very difficult to find and, and they're not on the website not on the agenda. Um, I had to guess uh, how to raise my hand on the telephone for this call this morning. And uh, because I attend a lot of Zoom meetings, I guessed the right number. So um, 
it needs to be on the agenda, each and every agenda. As uh, I, I really was disappointed that the September 1st interim special meeting was canceled due to technical difficulty. I had rearranged my complete schedule for the day. I think others from the public had as well. And it was decided by the commissioners and staff that that would be a workable day. Um, when I was not able to get onto the meeting, it was not starting. I was sending messages to Ms. Hansen, to Mr. Lamb, to uh, other people I thought that might be on the call. And curiously, I received an automatic response message from Ms. Hansen that she was out of the office. And I, um, I understand that things come up. I am hoping that that is not why the September 1st meeting was canceled, but I hope that this commission will schedule another meeting. This is all being very rushed, in my opinion. The EIR um, was not given an extension of time as I requested, and I think others did, the um, the whole process is being rushed. And, and for what reason? That's my big question. Why is this being rushed? I applied uh, Ms. Brocklebank's request for fish and wildlife. I would also like to ask the Water Advisory Commission also weigh in on this, as well as the Housing Advisory Commission. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Um... We'll check in and see if there are any other members of the public who wish to speak at this time to provide comment on a subject not on the agenda. The sustainability update is what is on the agenda today. So if you wish to speak on that item, we will revisit later in the meeting. Okay. Chair, I'm not seeing additional hands raised. I'll turn it back over to you. And you're muted. <clears throat> thank you. Um, great, thank you for that. Thank you for the public comment. We appreciate that. And um, and I would like to remind everyone that this item does go to the board of supervisors. And so while you know we we are all um, you know we all wish we could have met on the first. Unfortunately, it couldn't have it didn't happen. Um, but there will be additional time if. If we, you know, don't get through everything today, we might have another hearing, but we're going to see. However, if that doesn't happen and we do get through everything today, then yeah, just as a reminder, it goes to the board for more um, input. Commissioner, um, uh, Chair? Yes. Gordon, I wonder, could staff just fix the agenda links so they work a little better? I, I think that that's a very frustrating experience for people and it wouldn't take much. I um, I can look into making some changes to the agenda, but actually it's it's challenging to create links on the agenda um, because it would be a URL. It wouldn't be a hot, you know, it wouldn't be an active link. So somebody would be required to cut and paste. I We haven't been able to troubleshoot that. We do have the link that is directly accessible to the meeting posted on the website under planning commission meetings. Why not just add the words cut and paste this link? Oh, uh, we could. That's, uh, that's easy enough to do and then it would be clear. We can do that. Um, instead, we just provide the, the actual email or the web link that actually has the active link. So a decision was made in the past that that would be easier um, for the public to utilize, but we can definitely take a look at that. Um, I. Um, We'll uh, look at making some improvements where we can. I understand the the concerns. Yeah, well, we want as many people to participate as possible, and it's perfectly fine to add a few words to make it it clear. I, I think it would definitely um, be worth doing, uh, so that it's. And what about saying you must have a operating system, whatever, whatever the system is to to use this materials? Because that's a valid point too. Um, that was related to the information on the sustainability page, and I'll have to check in with um, the assistant director for policy, but I definitely will follow up with, with her. Yeah, we want to, uh, more people, the better that are involved in this. And I think if people have old computers 
at least they need to know that they need to go to another computer to access it. It is very frustrating to, I think these address, these concerns can be met. And I think we ought to. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Stephanie Hansen, assistant director, CDI. I, I can help address some of these. We were aware of the issues that um, Ms. Brocklebank was having. Um, we provided one-on-one -on -one service to her to help her uh, access the um, materials. We also have provided um, additional instructions on the project website. If your browser's too old, here's what you do. So um, while I appreciate that it may not be that easy, um, we, we have worked hard to address that, that issue for all of our um, people who wish to participate. Thank you. Um, great, thank you. Um, appreciate that. I know it's a challenging topic and um, you know, maybe if there's a way we could just, the one thing that I've hear people um, have challenges with is re like remembering how to unmute. And I think we see that sometimes in the meeting. Maybe that's an easy win to put on the agenda, just throwing it out there as an option. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, other than that, it seems like we covered that topic pretty well. And we can move on to agenda item number five at this time, which is the consent agenda item. On this, we have the AB 361 resolution, and um, we are going to do roll call votes going forward on all consent and scheduled items. And so, um, and if anyone had any comments, please go ahead. Otherwise, we can do a roll call vote on this item. Well, we need a motion. Excuse me, motion. Yeah. Thank I'll you. Move, we'll move approval. Thank you. I'll second that. Fast. Thank you, Commissioner Dan and Violante. Appreciate that. And um, now we could have a roll call vote, Ms. Drake. Okay. Commissioner Shepard? Yes. Commissioner Dan? Yes. Commissioner Violante? Yes. Commissioner Lazenby? Yes. And Chair Gordon? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Closing that item, moving on to agenda item number six, uh, scheduled item approval of minutes from the August 24th hearing. As we did not have one on September 1st, <laughs> do we have any uh, commissioners that would like to make a motion or discussion on this item? I'll move approval. Thank you, Commissioner Dan. A second from anyone? I'll second that. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, and then we have a motion and a second. Could we please do a vote on this, Ms. Drake? Commissioner Lazenby? Yes. Commissioner Violante? Yes. Commissioner Dan? Yes. Commissioner Shepard? Yes. And Chair Gordon? Yes. Thank you. Okay. That, that motion passes and we can move on to uh, our next scheduled item, which is continued from the September 1st hearing. This is a continued public hearing to consider proposed ordinances and resolutions related to the sustainability policy and regulatory update and to provide a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. Ms. Hansen, um, today we we are discussed, we are not gonna have a presentation as we did that last time. However, maybe there's a little intro we could do and kind of recap and I'll let you take it over. You bet, thank you, Chair Gordon, members of the commission. Um, we're happy to be back today. I, I would just like to say the cancellation of the 9-1 meeting was due to technical difficulties, not to my vacation schedule. I was here like everybody else was. Um, I'd like to just introduce the team that are with me here today, whom you already know, but um, just in case anybody uh, hasn't been at a previous meeting, um, with us today is uh, Daisy Allen. Uh, senior planner, Annie um, Murphy, also senior planner, Natisha Williams, also senior planner, and Anais Shank, our transportation planner. Um, also with us today, I believe, is John Ricker, um, in case there are questions about water resources or water utilities um, in, in regard to work that he has been doing for the county. Um, uh, the staff report uh, is the August 24th staff report. It is available online on the commission's 
uh, web page as well as on the project web page. Um, the, there's a recording on the Planning Commission webpage for that meeting. If anybody missed it, that has the whole staff presentation. And slides are also available on both of those um, sites, um, as well as I mentioned the staff reports. So that would be what we're referring to today. Um, replacement pages have also been provided for the ARC element and sections of the code that were related to those improvements. Um, uh, since we provided that, that last code section, there have been no more uh, replacement pages, so the commission should have, have them all. Um, um, the recommended motion is on page two of the 824 staff report. Um, it is item three of the recommended actions and um, that recommended motion is for approval of the project and recommending it um, to the Board of Supervisors. Um, there were some comments about public input um, but before I say that, I wanted to say we, we understand that there, uh, the Planning Commission will have a discussion and we are anticipating amending motions. Um, as we discussed at the 824 meeting, the chair would be um, leading us through motions in an organized fashion. First, the general plan, chapter by chapter, then the codes, then the design guidelines. Um, that are proposed, and then any comments on the map am amendments. Um, but we'll, when we get to the point where the commission is ready for motions, we'll we'll take a moment to review all that one one more time so that it's clear. Excuse me, Chair. Can I, I just want to? I, I think that's really uh, helpful. But I just want to say, first of all, the um, we depending on the questions we ask and the responses back. Um, we may want to go in a, a different order, and so, but we can discuss that this afternoon. <clears throat> okay. Um, and then let's see, the last um, item I just wanted to bring up was a little bit of a recap on the public um, community meetings and the public input and opportunities for comment on this project. Um, as, as the commission has noted, there have been um, many venues and many opportunities um, and, and staff really tried to take the need for public comment seriously. The amendments have been available since February. Um, so this is not a short timeline. Um, the EIR was released in April um, and met all noticing and public comment requirements. Um, there were uh, 10 commission meetings, including four commission meetings at this body, um, as well as um, six community meetings that were held in the evening during the spring. Um, and the commission already had uh, the first uh, part of the public hearing on, on 824. Um, we do anticipate um, pending the commission's recommendation that this item would be continued um, for approval at the board, um, hopefully starting in November and into December. So there'd be further opportunities as the chair, um, as the chair mentioned. Um, in addition to those opportunities, um, the project website had many um, ways and venues for offering public comment including signing up on the email blast list and um, uh, filling out the survey, contacting the staff. There's, there's been no lack of opportunities and ways to participate in, in this um, project as it's been developed and, and reviewed. So, um, and all of that also went with a social media campaign with ads in the newspaper, um, Facebook, Twitter, email blasts every every week. Uh, so uh, we really have made a, a huge effort at um, involving the um, 
involving the public. So uh, Chair, I think that's just uh, all I wanted to say to get us started today. Um, uh, I kind of came in at the last minute of a discussion, but if, um, if there is a large amount of public here, we may want to hold public comment before so we can capture those, but I'll, I'll leave that up, up to you. And thank you, happy to answer any questions. The team is all here also to answer questions as we um, move through uh, commission comments. Thank you. Uh, Chair, can I make a comment quick? It's almost 10 o'clock. We still haven't gotten to public comment on this. We have, we still need to get to commissioner questions and then hopefully be able to take action in the afternoon. So I hope now we can expeditiously move on to public comments so we can get to the commissioner's role in this. Yeah, absolutely. That's the next part of the hearing here. So we definitely want to do that. I want to have a, or talk about a couple little housekeeping things really quickly. We do have um, some breaks and lunches scheduled today, a 10 minute break at, a, at around 11 um, and then 1230 for a 30 minute lunch break, just so everyone's aware. And we'll try to, you know, I might stop it a little before or after, depending how the conversation is going. Um, but that's that. Um, and with that, I appreciate the introduction, Ms. Hansen, and we will have public comment this morning, and that time would be right now. And then afterwards, we will move on to discussion um, with the commissioners. So with that being said, Ms. Drake, can we please open the public comment part of this hearing? And I would like to um, mention one additional thing as it regards in regards to public comment. If you spoke last hearing on the 24th um, and you have a similar comments, I would just remind you that we were all here and we heard those comments and um, you know, we'd really appreciate any new information today um, and you know, focus on that, we'd appreciate it. And with that, Ms. Drake, do we have any members of the public that like to speak? I'm seeing some hands raised. Chair, would you, uh, how many minutes would you like us to put on the? Yeah, let's see. How many do we have today? I think typically. So far, so far, I'm seeing five hands raised. Okay. Why don't we keep it at our standard three minutes so that we avoid any confusion or challenges? And, okay. And then go from there. Thank you. All right, so I will start with um, David Reed. And um, David, you have three minutes. Please restate your name for the record. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Commission. My name is Dave Reed. I'm the Director of the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience here at the County of Santa Cruz. I wanna acknowledge and commend the hard work that the planning department, now the community development and infrastructure department has taken over the last almost decade uh, in moving this project forward. Um, I was part of the very beginning of these community meetings to discuss this project in 2012 through 2014 and to see it here sitting before, your, before the commission for approval um, is a significant milestone. As part of the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience, I'm tasked with um, managing our emergency response and preparedness efforts at the County of Santa Cruz. And one of the things that I want to highlight about what's before you to hopefully recommend and approve to the board for, for um, adoption is that the more we can do from a land use and regulatory standpoint to build higher density housing in our urban environment reduces the risk of residents current and future from seeking cheaper or slightly more affordable housing in our wildland urban interface. So from a sustainability standpoint, but also from a climate change resilience standpoint, the effort that you have undertaken as, a, as planning staff and as commissioned before you to make determination today will significantly help current and future residents become more resilient to climate change by not forcing those folks who need or want to live in our county to live in the wild and urban interface. So I look forward to your conversation today and hopefully and and, and hopeful recommendation um, by the commission to approve what is before you to go to the board. And I'll stop there. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right, next I will call on phone number 2915. Good morning, please state your name for the record. And um, seeing it's Becky, I just wanted to remind everybody um, because she brought up a good point um, that it, uh, you must press star six on your phone to unmute yourself if I call on you and you called in. So good morning again. Please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you. Um, you should also announce for those of us on telephone, you have to press star nine to raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for repeating the instructions. I, I want to take exception to uh, Mr. Reed's comment that we want to prevent people from feeling like they have to seek what is called cheaper <laughs> land or, or housing in the wildland urban interface. You know, some people just want to live out in the wild. Um, I'm one of them, and it is not cheap. And I will tell the commission that uh, yesterday, the County Board of Supervisors, Mr. Ricker can speak about this perhaps, um, just passed or will pass, uh, have a first amended first reading for the, um, the new septic regulations. 700 of the people who lost their homes in the CZU fire because of this new regulation will now be required to put in very expensive advanced treatment systems. They cost $50,000 to $80,000. That is something that has to be discussed and uh, examined in this, this document before you today. Um, regarding public accessibility, you know, I go to a lot of Board of Supervisors meetings, and when something gets there, it's pretty much a done deal, unless there's something so glaring that someone in the community of um, political or economic importance has brought to the, the supervisor's attention. Nothing changes. It's a done deal when it gets to the Board of Supervisors for the most part. So I want to address that. I attended some of the... Um, uh, as many of the early on community meetings in the spring, they were very poorly attended because nobody knew this was going on. Nobody knew what it was. I would like for the record to have staff read the attendance numbers of each of those uh, public Zoom meetings. There was one in person. It was the first one and it was in Watsonville. And, you know, I couldn't be there myself. Um, so it, it has not been easily um, available for the members of the public who are not clued in and looking on their phones or computer devices all, their t all the time. There is, I had to fight really hard to get a copy of the sustainability plan in the Capitola Library. There's still no, no copy of the draft EIR there. It isn't there. So it is not accessible to the full public, and it is often those members of the public that are not technology savvy that are the ones that are really weighing in with the, the years of wisdom and, and their input that are not being uh, able to get in here. I request that there be an in-person and hybrid meeting, at least one somewhere in the county before this goes to the Board of Supervisors. All Thank of you, the Becky. meetings are in the morning. Yours are in the morning. The commission meetings are all in the day when people are working. So how? All right. Um, I will uh, call on the next hand, which is raised by Chris Berry. Um, good morning, Chris. Please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Thanks for having me. And thanks, commissioners, for um, holding the hearing today on this important stuff. I just wanted to provide a little bit of background and clarification on the Fish and Wildlife and Water Advisory Commission involvement in this. Um, first of all, I do want to acknowledge that there has been a ton of public outreach about this process. It's a massive undertaking, and it's understandably confusing, um, even for practitioners. Um, the process has been a little bit confusing to that point that it's not surprising that the commission roles has been not well understood by the public and frankly, even some of the commissioners. Um, it's sort of unusual in my experience to have ongoing public 
um, interpretive events, for lack of a better term, about the project after the, the final EIR has been um, developed. So uh, some of us are, are a little bit confused about the process, but nonetheless, the commissions over the years have been involved in developing a lot of the technical background um, for the sustainability update. And frankly, I was pleased to see much of what the commissions have worked on over the years does show up in the sustainability update, whether that's the idea of developing mitigation banks for riparian type projects, um, karst protection standards in the county code updates, uh, focus on co-recovery, um, potential for reevaluating protection of significant, significant trees outside of the coastal zone. There is the, uh, I'll just, I'll use the term footprints. The footprints of the commission involvement are in the sustainability plan. And if you follow the, the long history, you can see that a lot of what we've talked about at the commissions over the years has been included. And that's really gratifying. Um, that said, I, uh, I just want to offer that the commissions will be happy to be more involved. Um, as much as I can speak as an individual commissioner, that's obviously not my role to decide that, but I know that um, based at least on the Fish and Wildlife Commission meeting a couple of weeks ago, um, there is interest and enthusiasm to be more involved if need be, but there's also, again, um, a desire to not be involved late in the game and do so in a way that's not helpful to the process. So um, I suspect that if the commissions are going to be further involved, it would be helpful to have planning staff meet with them directly rather than having folks interpreting what's happening with the planning process and help folks understand what the um, just sort of the overall process and how the input could be most valuable and um, be received at the Board of Supervisors in a, in a way that's most constructive. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, uh, next I will call on Kathleen McLaughlin. Good morning, Kathleen, please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. Hi, excuse me. Hi, uh, my name is Kathleen McLaughlin and I am a climate policy associate with um, the Office of Response Recovery and Resilience um, in Santa Cruz County, as well as a GIS and planning intern with the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, or AMBAG, and I'm an environmental science master's student at CSUMB, and as I've been working on the Santa Cruz County um, Climate Action Adaptation Plan, it is important to me that equity not only be incorporated into climate action planning, but placed at the forefront, especially with regards to land use planning and urban development. Um, the future of affordable and sustainable housing is dense infill in our cities, and I believe that equity needs to be prioritized and woven into our local plans in a way that ensures all voices of our community are heard, and um, that decision-making decision power is given to these vulnerable groups. These groups not only bear the brunt of a changing climate, but are also historically and systemically excluded from the benefits of climate action planning. The sustainability update is the beginning of a positive change in this direction. So I just want to say thank you for your time. And that's all. I don't need the whole three minutes. All right. Thank you, Kathleen. All right. I just, um, before I call in the next um, hand raise, I just want to remind folks that to raise your hand if you're calling in, press star nine on your telephone. All right, I will next call on Peter Detlis uh, with the County of Santa Cruz. Good morning, Peter. Please restate your name for the record. Thanks, Jocelyn. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Great. Uh, good morning. My name is Peter Detlef. I'm a principal administrative analyst with the county administrative office. I'm a Santa Cruz native and I've been working in economic and workforce development for the county for nearly a decade. I too want to commend the work of CDI and the com commission on this important issue. Um, after many years of regularly meeting with our small business community and employers, the number one issue, most um, important factor affecting local business is housing. I've heard time and time again about the difficulty of attracting and retaining staff at all levels due to the affordability and availability of housing. This has dramatically impacted several levels in all business sectors, including hospitality, healthcare, government, agriculture, tech, and more. 
The Santa Cruz County 2022 State of the Workforce Report indicates that 4,600 residents moved away between 2019 and 2021, representing a decline in overall population made up mostly of low and middle income workers, representing teachers and other essential pro uh, service providers. This report also presents that there was a 5% decline in total workers in the county over the same two year period, and that our labor force participation rate dec declined roughly 9%. These policy updates are critical to opening the door to housing for people and notably employees at all income levels along the transportation corridors and existing neighborhoods. Um, I urge you to support the sustainability plan as presented. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. All right, going back to our participants here, I see a hand raised by Tatiana Brennan, the County of Santa Cruz. Good morning, please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. Hello, my name is Tatiana Brennan, and I'm a senior administrative analyst in the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience, which is in the County Administrative Office. I am project manager for the County's Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, and I'd like to highlight the connection between the sustainability update and what we're calling the CAP, which is the acronym for the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. I'd like to highlight the connection between these two. Land use patterns are a significant factor in climate change. And as we look to the future, we must design and plan our neighborhoods to mitigate the impacts of climate change and for them to be more resilient so that we can sustain current and future generations. The CAP data is showing that the majority of our greenhouse gas emissions 72.3% are coming from transportation alone. A primary strategy for reducing single occupancy travel distances can be achieved by creating more vibrant neighborhoods that co-locate housing, jobs, and recreational and entertainment opportunities. We are seeing a shift as other regional climate action plans move towards 15 minute neighborhoods and the need to change our communities through dense infill in urban areas. I wanna commend the work of the sustainability, the group that has worked on the sustainability plan, the Community Development Infrastructure Department. And we support this, this sustainability update because it is a tool that will help us achieve the goals outlined in the cap that support decreased greenhouse gas emissions which are the primary contributor to climate change. As guardians of our community's future, we feel the proposals before the planning commission in the sustainability update as written, offer a positive step forward as we begin to meet the challenges that lie ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. All right, I am seeing a hand raised by Michael Lewis and Jean Brocklebank. Good morning again. You have uh, three minutes. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. This is Jean Brocklebank. Four things. I really appreciate the opportunities that were provided by the planning department, as explained by Stephanie. That said, with 1,000 pages to review, finding everything has been impossible for the average resident of Santa Cruz. Even my supervisor was somewhat flummoxed and blown away by it. Second, I have found some good strengthening amendments and seen good ones left alone. So that is uh, good. <laughs> I'm glad for that. Third, I want to draw your attention to the final EIRs, Appendix B, Revised Draft EIR, Appendix E, Biological Resources, Special Status Plant and Wildlife Species List, because there are two plant species missing. These two species, Maja sativa and Deanandra corimbosa, found historically in our marine terrace coastal prairies and continuing today with restoration efforts, are both native to Santa Cruz County, with one of them, Deanandra, being endemic. I ask that the FBIR be, uh, uh, to Appendix E be revised once more to make this correction for the record. 
Last, I draw your attention to County Code Chapter 16.92. It's not part of the sustainability update, but it's titled Environmental Principles and Policies to Guide County Government. It was first codified as the Decade of the Environment in 1999 and again in 2010. Unfortunately, renewable, renewal of Chapter 10.692 was not part of this substantial effort. Maybe someday this will happen because, and listen to this, even though it is never acknowledged, destruction of the natural environment is a major contributor to climate change. Listen to just one of the purposes of chapter 1692, to protect biological diversity and human health through protection and restoration of the environment. I'll repeat that, destruction of the natural environment is a major contributor of climate change. This is a little known fact, little acknowledged, and it's true. Every time we cut a tree, every time we pave over the living soil, every time we reduce vegetation for one reason or another, we are contributing to climate change. Thank you very much. Oh, and I'd like to, um, uh, if I may, I'd like to be able to give my last 15 seconds to Michael Lewis. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is Michael Lewis. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to speak. And I'm going to follow up on uh, Jean's comments about the natural world, because the natural world is not represented in this process. The uh, habitat and the species in our area are not able to appear before you and defend themselves. Uh, there is a considerable amount of change of language in this um, sustainability update that waters down protection for sensitive habitats and for you know, species, the species who live in them, um, changing them from active to passive direction and reducing specificity of habitat protection measures. For example, uh, they the word in the original language is request. It's been changed to maintain and enhance as feasible. Designate has been changed to evaluate. Require has been changed to consider. Prohibit to limit or restrict. Prohibit to maintain regulations. And to prevent as much as possible change to support. This language is not a large amendment to the existing language. It is just a change in one or two words that really changes the thrust and the strength of these measures to protect habitat and our um, endangered species. Uh, there are also a couple of places in the language that make statements that are not supported by fact. In fact, there are opinions that are, have been suggested to add to it, which um, are not supported and therefore inappropriate. Uh, one in particular, the responsible use of herbicides to eradicate invasive non-native plants can be, quote, an appropriate management action in sensitive habitats. This is an opinion that not supported by fact at all. In fact, uh, use of herbicides is not indicated in sensitive habitats, and this should not be included in uh, the, the updated language for the sustainability update. Uh, so I ask you, please, in reviewing this, to pay attention to the language that's been changed on here, not just the entire amendments, and make sure that we don't reduce the effectiveness of our county code and our general plan into the future to protect habitat and the species of our area. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. All right, uh, let's see if we have any additional speakers. I'm not seeing any. I just want to give a final reminder. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand on the Zoom app or press star nine on your telephone. I saw one go up and then go down. Let's see. Um, I'm seeing a hand raised by Alex Barton. Good morning. Please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Alex Vartan. Um, I just want to briefly add to my previous uh, written comments I've sent in. 
Um, I had some original significant concerns about the actual feasibility of um, building projects in mixed use commercial and multifamily zones, given planning's original selection of floor area ratio and, and some other standards. And I just wanna support um, their revised proposed increases. Uh, I think it's a good solution and um, especially wanna support the provision of the special allowances uh, to encourage structured and underground parking. I think it's really important. I would also um, really want to draw the attention of the um, of the uh, commissioners, uh, as well as the the listeners and the listener the um, and the and the public to um, uh, the comments from um, Barry Swenson Construction uh, in the um, uh, staff report. I think it's uh, really important um, that we uh, take into account their comments as um, uh, large uh, local developers who have a lot of experience in um, building these projects. And I will note that um, their uh, suggested standards for density and height uh, are uh, in, to encourage actual feasibility of affordable by design units are really in excess um, and sometimes significantly of what's proposed here. So I know there's been a lot of questions and concerns about the RF density, et cetera. Um, but um, I just wanna uh, not only support the proposed density uh, increases on the rezones um, being proposed, uh, but also really, um, uh, I hope the commissioners will take very seriously um, the, uh, the comments from Barry Swenson. Um, and, uh, and just really wanna add, I think, um, I know that we talk about infrastructure and um, uh, uh, the appropriateness of density in certain neighborhoods, and I, that's a really important consideration. But I think we also need to just take into consideration the the value of the very scarce land that we do have, and really think about um, uh, uh, what we can do to really maximize um, uh, its uh, its its. Uh, its use when it is developed because it is very scarce and it is uh, a lot more scarce than um, you know anywhere else in this state in in uh, in, in many ways. So um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And then finally, I saw a hand raised by um, Jane Barr. Jane, did you wish to provide testimony this morning? If so, please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. This is Jane Barr, can you hear me? Yes, good morning, Jane. I'm Jane Barr, I'm resident of Coralitas and Associate Director of Development, uh, Real Estate Development for Eden Housing, an affordable housing provider. Um, I want to commend the staff. This is a huge undertaking and um, it, it's a lot of work and, and I understand that. And I wanna commend you on um, working on this for a long time, um, accepting public comments and making adjustments and changes. Um, and uh, I appreciate that. I, I would say that um, I would echo the last co speaker's comments in regard to land. There's, there's only so much land we have that can be developed. It's extremely important to develop it um, as densely as we can in, in areas that are serviced and um, realize that um, this plan affects, affects how we can develop going forward for a number of years. Um, I appreciate the changes that have been made so far. Um, I think we can go a little bit further, but um, no, no plan is perfect. I would say that um, in regard to the residential use, use uh, goal BE-2, urban residential designations, it's a little disconcerting to see um, the units per acre uh, building intensity for the different land use designations be a range. Um, that's unusual. Usually if you're looking at urban high and it would be 30, not 11 to 30. So I, I worry about the interpretation of that in the future. Um, and we should be looking at the maximum units per acre density um, on all parcels. Um, and then of course, uh, with bonus um, densities, those will increase and, and that's, that's good for 
housing so many people who want to be housed here, who have left, who wanted to be housing here and, and taking care of our homeless. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. And I did see another hand go up uh, by Patricia Brady. Good morning, Patricia. Please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. Patty Brady. Um, I just like to speak to um, the discussion from the standpoint of Pleasure Point. I've spoken before, but I want to raise the issue that um, the residents of Pleasure Point, over 400 unanimously designed with the county and MIG consultants, the design guidelines for Portola that were to go from 26 to 24, 41st Avenue. This um, plan has been changed while adopted by the supervisors in de uh, December 2018. The residents continue to respect the guidelines that were adopted. We urge you to look at the issues of a beach area, a tourist area in comparison to an urban area. Issues on Soquel are not the same as um, the issues in Portola with the number of tourists and, outs and visitors that come into our community. Portola is often already overloaded. We support 30 units per acre plus density bonuses. Residents are not opposed to density, but they are opposed to 45 per acre. Again, I wanna say that this was a democratic process that should not be overlooked. Thank you very much for your time and your efforts. Thank you, Patty. All right, um, next I will call on Susie Merriman. Um, good morning, Susie, please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Good morning, thank you. My name is Susie Merriam. Uh, I work down here for the city of Watsonville and a lifelong resident of Santa Cruz County. I want to commend staff for your um, work on the sustainability plan and kind of echo a lot of uh, Jane Barr's statement. Um, you know, with the with the recent vote on on the rail uh, corridor, and knowing that at least from a South County perspective, um, not only are we dealing with uh, significant housing issues, but we are dealing with significant traffic, and ensuring that we have. Um, increased density along the corridor and in our uh, urban areas within the county is uh, really vital to getting housing where the jobs are, but also increasing the possibility for future multimodal rider ridership. And that's both you know, buses, um, you know, if we ever do get that train along the rail corridor, that would be great, but also bicycling and, and, and walking. Um, and creating that that last mile if if people do have the option in the future for better uh, uh, multimodal transit um, opportunities. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Um, the density, you know, let's get it as as high as high as uh, what works for each of the county areas um, in the urban areas. And just thank you for um, putting this effort together. Ms. Drake, if you're there, you're muted. Sorry, thank you. My phone is ringing. Um, next, we have Ashley Schweikert. Uh, good morning, Ashley. Will you please state your name for the record? Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Um, yes, my name is Ashley Schweikart. I am a senior project manager for MidPen Housing. Um, we submitted um, a comment letter um, yesterday evening, so it may not have made it into the commissioner's packet. So um, I just wanted to um, echo what was stated in that letter. Um, so uh, MidPen Housing, uh, we develop uh, affordable multifamily rental housing in the county. Um, and we've been collaborating with the county for over 25 years on the housing needs of individuals and families with very low and extremely low incomes. Um, including uh, our most vulnerable residents, uh, those who are experiencing homelessness and special needs populations. Um, Mid-Pen, um, uh, we are uh, 
wanting to express our support for um, the county's uh, sustainability update. Um, we believe that this um, update to land use and transportation policies does encourage the type of development that can accommodate uh, future population growth in the county, um, as well as improving uh, the environment, the economy, and the quality of life for those who live and work in, in the county. Um, in particular, MidPen supports the Complete Neighborhoods Framework and specifically the new Residential Flex Zone District, um, which facilitates compact development along corridors. Um, the availability of land zone for compact residential developments will streamline the land use entitlement and pre-construction process for housing developers. Additionally, we support the new design guidelines that focus on the creation of high quality housing within the context of transportation corridors. Um, the ability to build more densely along key transportation corridors is critical for creating financially feasible affordable housing developments by achieving cost efficiencies. Um, also, it will allow our projects to be better positioned for the award of public financing. Um, uh, so um, basically, we would just like to say thank you so much to the staff um, for all the work you put into uh, the sustainability update. Um, you know, we all know that folks are being priced out of the county and our existing single family housing stock is not suited to meet the needs of a variety of our existing residents, including students, young families, seniors, um, and um, our most vulnerable residents. Um, so you know, these policy and code updates, not only do they meet the new state laws that have come out uh, recently, but they also provide an opportunity to greater diversify the housing stock that we have, and that will in turn allow our residents to both live and work within the county. Um, so I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ashley. All right. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak on this item, the sustainability update? I am not seeing any additional hands raised. Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who showed up to speak. We really appreciate your comments and your input and taking time out of your day to be here with us. So thank you so much. Um, at this time, we'll close the public comment and bring this back to the commission for discussion, long awaited discussion. Um, Sure, can I make a suggestion? Sure, please, Commissioner Dan. So my understanding um, from the August 24th meeting was that, you know, we had a staff presentation that, uh, between the staff presentation and public comment, it was 1.30 and, and commissioners had questions remaining for staff on the project documents that we weren't able to ask. So I would suggest that we go commissioner by commissioner so that commissioners can get all of their questions answered and then um, take the discussion from there, if that works. I just wanna make sure each commissioner has an opportunity to get their questions answered. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a great um, idea and way to go. So I appreciate that. And um, and let's start there. Who would, would you like to start, Commissioner Dan? I can, but I started first last time. So I am open to letting another commissioner go first. Um, I know that Commissioner Shepard had a bunch of questions. So sure. if Commissioner Shepard wants to go first, I think that would be fair. Oh, no, in fact, I would prefer not to. Okay. Um, because I think that you, I would like to hear what um, the others have to say because I have discovered that sometimes you eliminate stuff that was at my concern very handily and with great care, so. Okay, well, I, I don't want, so I'm open sure. to, since I went first last time, I don't, yeah. I don't want to keep going first. But. Yeah, no problem. Um, Commissioner Yelante or Commissioner Lazenby, if you'd like, uh, go ahead. Uh, I can start as well. Well, I, I would appreciate it, Chair, if you would kick this off. Okay, wonderful. I can do that. Okay. Thank you. Um, great. So, you know, there's obviously a lot of ground to cover here. I think that there's, since the last time we had discussion on this topic, which was now maybe a month or so ago, you know, we've had the presentation from the last hearing that really clarified a lot of things and brought in all the adjustments that we had requested along the way. So I just want to say as a general note, I really appreciate 
all the changes and how much you know staff heard what we said along the way and has really tried to incorporate that and know it's challenging and going back through and listening to all of the previous hearings you know keeping track of our ramblings uh, it's not easy so we really appreciate that um so I think there's a lot that I could talk about, but I don't really want to focus on um, if it seemed like something that was maybe we we're all agreed on or appropriate at the time. And, like, you know, it was a change that was made that we don't probably need to discuss. I'll probably just, you know, I have a shorter list today, um, but just um, wanted to recognize that there were a lot of changes that I just wanted to say thank you for. Um, that being said, I have a couple, I do have a couple questions. and. It's hard to keep questions completely separate from comment, but I'll I'll try. Um, one thing I guess I'll just kind of start at the top of my list here: um, the FAR change, um, the adjustment to one and a half, and then also the um, the uh, ability to have if it's the parking, excuse me, the parking underneath the podium style FAR adjustment. I really appreciated that. Um, I did have a question as it relates to commercial requirement. So this is a little bit tricky to talk through, but bear with me. So um, what we had before was, or what we have currently shown is a 25% commercial requirement on mixed use projects, leaving 75% for residential. Um, as we heard and you know from Barry Swenson's um, statement in the report, you know, they would prefer to see closer to 10%, which I, I can understand, especially in today's market. Um, and, and so when we adjusted the FAR, we essentially said that the same size parcel can now have a larger building by square, by, by the way it's counted for square footage, right? So here's an example, say we had a 20,000 square foot lot, at a 1.0 FAR, that means you had, <clears throat> excuse me, 20,000 square foot of a building size. Break that down to commercial, 25% is 5,000 square feet of commercial. Now we've said, okay, that FAR is a little higher because we wanna encourage, um, you know, less parking lot style design, bigger buildings towards the front of the projects, that kind of thing, like we've talked about. And so now we're allowing, you know, that same lot would have say 30,000 square foot of FAR. And which means that now our commercial requirement has gone up to 7,500 square feet. What we didn't really get is like more land space in that, right? So where we had 5,000 before was probably appropriate for a 25,000 or 20,000 square foot lot. Now we've got a larger commercial requirement, meaning that you're probably going to the second story with commercial space. Um, so what this kind of relates to is you know, or so, sorry, let me go in through the next step there. So my suggestion would be that, you know, I appreciated that we upped that FAR, but with the relationship to the commercial size, I would request that we reduce that commercial requirement to 15%. So say that we had the same size lot, the higher FAR, 15% would be really close to what the uh, commercial requirement would have been under the older FAR. So it's a little complicated to, to say all that out loud. Hopefully that people are following. Um, so that would be my question is if that's possible. And um, just a couple of other notes on what that commercial requirement does do in today's market is, you know, it really does make the rents higher because commercial spaces are really hard to fill these days or coming at such a discount. And so when you're going to build, you know, a new building, if you're required to do a higher commercial component you know, what that really translates to um, is higher rents because that commercial space is such a discount uh, in today's market. And so, you know, that being said, I, I think there's a lot of reasons to reduce that um, commercial space down to 15%. Like I mentioned, it still gets us like really close to what we had originally anticipated for new commercial spaces with the zoning that was in place. So yeah, my question is, is that possible? Is that something that we could adjust? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, it is possible. The um, uh, you might I appreciate the thought process there because you might have picked up in kind of an unintended consequence of of making that 
that change. Um, we don't want to get rid of commercial altogether. Obviously, we're trying to have into more integrated neighborhoods so that people have services near them. Um, but how how much commercial to be available in our commercial zones is um, something that could largely be tweaked by the commission. It's not, there's no real magic formula. 75% um, uh, residential to 25% commercials um, is something that we have seen. I think it's um, consistent with some state laws. On the other hand, it's possible you know, the state law may change again to allow fully um, uh, residential projects in our commercial zone. So I, I think um, if the commission's interested in, in tweaking that, that's definitely a possibility. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I appreciate that. Okay. Um, next uh, question that I have is on page 68 of the planning package. Uh, I just want to get a little procedural question, Commissioner. Sure. Yeah. Or, sorry, Chair Gordon. No, so go a lot of, if we're going to go through and we all have suggestions that are ours, and are we going to, are we plan, do you think we are all going to want to vote separately so we get the drift of the whole commission? Because like, you may really like what you're suggesting, or I may really like the direction I think it's appropriate, but I have no idea if the other members do too. So I'm not so sure that anything we suggest is the will of the commission or is it, but I don't think so. So that's different than making most, where, where are we and how we go forward with our suggestions? I, yeah. I, I don't feel like if I say something to Stephanie, she says, well, we could consider that, that that's the will of the planning commission anymore than if you or Stephanie or Rachel does yeah. it. Yeah, to, right. to, to, to Shepherd, go ahead, Commissioner Veal. Yeah, I just I agree with Commissioner Shepard that I I had I, I appreciate um, Chair Gordon's sharing his thoughts. I think it's valuable, but I I had thought that this time was for us to get our clarifying questions answered. Pardon me, um, and that later this afternoon we were going to do more of what kind of what you, what Chair Gordon did now, which is kind of make a recommendation almost. So if there are clarifying questions that you need answered in order to perhaps formulate a, a, a recommendation, then that's what I had thought this time was for. So I, like I know I have some questions that depending on how staff answer my question, I may or may not be making a recommendation. Um, but I, I agree with Commissioner Shepard that I thought this time was more, um, question based versus the things I would like to see and sharing those. Um, Cause I think if we get if that, that way, if cause that way our the, the answers from staff are gonna be more like uh, short, um, either short explanations of why a code is, wasn't recommended or if it's a kind of even yes or no um, will allow us to later then kind of have more discussion about whether or not we support a recommendation. That was my understanding. Um, well, that, so I, that's, that no, I understand what you're saying, but what I was suggesting is if one of us wants a change, whether it's now or later, that doesn't represent the force of the commission. And if we're going to make proposals for changes, I think we all, there ought to be votes on them. That's all. They don't have to be consensus, but I think right. Stephanie will want to know how many of us supported a change or not. That's all. Yeah. So just to be really clear. This is, yes, let's do it that way. We're going through questions right now. Sometimes a question just needs a little explanation. It's hard to sometimes without the background information have a really good response in my opinion. So that's where I was providing that. However, uh, it is, you know, kind of blends into discussion and opinion and we can try and limit that at this point. The, the changes aren't gonna happen until we all vote, right? And so, that is something that I would suggest later when we get to the time to discuss to discuss motions. And so we would make an emotion with an amendment, let's say, like for example, you know, to reduce that to a 15% commercial requirement. And that's how we would make changes from here on. Um, the planning department is not going to take our discussion today and bring it back with adjustments. We're gonna make adjustments with motions. Is that all clear, Commissioner Shepard? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, okay, great. Wonderful. 
Okay, right, so continuing on with my questions here. Um, page 68 from the, from the uh, planning packet that we have shows notes from a board hearing that happened in 2015. And this was the, what I could see as the last um, hearing on the, on the um, sustainability update from long ago. And there were on this page recommendations for higher FARs, um, higher um, building heights and stories for multifamily in particular, which some of them changed and some didn't. Um, so anyway, my question was, what what's the were these recommendations from the board that we are that the planning department went back to study, or how does this relate to what we have seen today? Because they are a little bit different. Um, Thank you. Um, exhibit E of the staff report on page sixty eight is where the chair is referring, and um, this uh, when the sustainability update first was getting started after adoption of the sustainable San or after acceptance, excuse me, of the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan, um, staff did go to the board to kind of get direction. Um, and this was a summary, an early summary provided to the board. We wanted to, you know, we want the public and the commission to be aware of what the board saw. Um, but a, a lot of staff work went into refining um, uh, the FAR uh, standards, floor area ratio standards, and others and other standards such as density, to to create kind of a cal calibrated um, formula where the higher density you go, um, the standards are reflecting um, uh, changes that can get to those higher densities. And so um, for floor area ratio, um, that became more of a variated um, approach depending going from low density to, to high density. So um, there were adjustments made. Um, and you know the other big one there um, is a Oh, I thought it actually it's not here, but in the original sustainability um, plan, sustainable Santa Cruz County plan, um, the densities discussed for RF were 60 units per acre. Um, adjustments were made there as well because we want to continue to really encourage the density bonus programs so that we're providing affordable units in our projects. So adjustments were made um, in consideration of um, meeting policy goals. Okay, understood. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, that answered one other question that I had about the density, and and uh, just another, you know, was it, again why are why forty five and not sixty, and that I understand that. So now with the density bonus, you're encouraging more affordable housing. Um, I appreciate that. And did you feel like at any point, you know, you know, 60 was there before, I'm not sure what the lower end would be, but you know, was there, you know, 50 units an acre, like why not, why 45, is there a magic number there? There is not necessarily a magic number. Um, for this community, uh, it's striking a balance in between kind of lower density and higher density and um, what the community can um, can accommodate. So it's a balancing act. Gotcha, okay. Um, thank you. Uh, a couple questions here on just some specific code stuff. Um, there, the code section is 1310-334-1D4A, um, but I'll kind of highlight what it states. It says minimum street facing setbacks must allow 10 foot sidewalk along commercial corridor and six foot along streets. And then the key thing here is taken from private property area if necessary. And I just wanted to, this is probably a dumb question, but is that, can we do that? Is that legal? You can you can 
force essentially force people to make a public right of way on their on their space um yes it's uh the commission is probably well aware our rights of way are pretty constrained in this county um and if we want to accommodate all modes of transportation there may be areas where we need to accept a dedication from a private developer in order to make those facilities happen as well as um you know required open space which could be in the front um and public space and interact with public spaces and there there are times when even just to um, uh, accommodate vehicles, we, we have to have a dedication. So yes, it's legal. Great, okay, perfect. Thank you for clearing that up for me. Um, okay. In the built environment, um, most of this relates to the built environment, I suppose, but I'd, I'd wonder if there's an opportunity to encourage developments to be built at the upper end of the density range, as opposed to within the density range. This is something that a um, member of the public also brought up, that the large range can cause confusion. And if we really want people building at that upper end, what I've seen and what's true in the city of Santa Cruz um, is that you know, the requirement is that uh, you build towards the upper end. And if you don't, then they'll likely be denied. Um, so my question is, is that something that we could add or has been considered for the county? You know, I, I'd like to call on Daisy Allen to help with this question if she's available. Sure, no problem. Hi, commissioners. Um, I was just taking a look at the uh, draft general plan built environment element uh, policy BE 2.1.9, which is development below the minimum density. Um, so we do have a policy that development cannot be approved on sites within the USL RSL below the designated density range. Um, um, so that is that is in there um i was just seeing i just wanted to take a look at the notes of how that was modified um yeah so that's similar um but stronger language uh than one was in the 1994 uh current general plan um and then there's also an existing housing element uh policy so the housing element is chapter four of the general plan which is not being amended as part of this project uh policy 2.2 .2 in the housing element um notes that at times you cannot meet the minimum density in the rural areas um but i believe the housing element also includes a policy i'll take a look at it and get back to you but i believe the housing element also includes a policy regarding uh uh building close to the maximum density um so let me take a look at that okay. that'll just, just take me a couple of minutes sure, um, no but certainly additional language along those lines could be added in the uh, general planner code. Thank you, Daisy, appreciate that. Okay. Um, going through a lot of the uh, documents, I probably wrote this down somewhere, might have misplaced it, and just looking for a little clarification. Are we, are duplexes in townhomes, will they be allowed in the R districts? And I apologize, I know I've asked this before, but I just couldn't place it again. Uh, yes, it's in, it's in the code. Okay, that one is going to happen. Okay. And is that in all like R1 zones or residential zones, I guess, as they are now? Daisy, can you remind us? Um, sure. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, duplexes and townhomes are not precluded in um, the rural residential districts. Um, uh, we actually uh, for the planning commission hearing we did make a slight update to the draft uh built environment chapter to clarify that it's not only single family homes um, that are allowed in the rural residential designations um and that the the housing allowed in those designations is really it's based on the you know the density uh, uh requirements gotcha. okay so this they would also apply to an r1 zone as well as the rural residential Correct. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, 
minutes. I think this is my last question here. Oh no, excuse me, I have one of the other sections, but last one for this section. Code 1310510D3. This is a code that discusses the max heights, of what's allowed above a building height, um, like mechanical equipment, um, towers, things like that. Um, there is sometimes this limiting for larger um, developments, and I see it in many jurisdictions, but in, in the case of trying to provide open space on a rooftop. And so, you know, I was wondering if there was any thought or if this is kind of a new question um, to allowing an exception for code height, for height limit for roof access only. So like an elevator or stair core or tower to be within that top or above the height limit so that you could have a roof deck um, for open space, you know, otherwise the challenge is like you have to reduce a story so that you can get that roof access. Does that make sense? This might be a new one. So um, I'm not sure if it's, you know, was ever thought about or not. And if not, it, you know, we can bring it back later for discussion topic. But. Yeah, I mean, it's not, there, there are exceptions for roof equipment, certainly um, within the existing code, um, but using rooftops for, an, and requiring additional, or needing extra height for decks was not something really considered, but um, for a lot of these types of questions, if you are seeking a density bonus, you can have concessions and waivers from the code that would would allow for that kind of a thing. Daisy or Annie has anything to add to that, please feel free. Um, Annie Murphy here. I, I just wanted to add that I know sometimes rooftop decks can be controversial in neighborhoods. so. We might want to look at that more closely too before we if we made any modifications but okay yeah that makes sense um thank you i appreciate that uh and chair gordon i did just look at the housing element and actually i was citing the correct policy policy 2.2 in the housing element the first portion of that policy states continue to discourage development below the minimum density that is specified for each of the general plan land use designations um, and then the second portion of the policy is recognizing that in the rural areas, some cases it may be undesirable or infeasible to meet the minimum density. Um, so that's where that policy language currently exists in the general plan. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that follow-up. I appreciate it. Um, okay. Um, as it relates to access and mobility, a uh, question that's come up is, you know, we have this future potential rail, you know, is there any thought about density along that or what might happen? I don't believe that it would, you know, make any adjustments for today, but I was just interested. Um, the general plan um, between the built environment element and the access and mobility element definitely en encourages are residential densities along corridors, um, and that would include the rail corridor. Um, and so one thing that will happen is, as, as the commission should be aware now is that next year, we're going to have to look at ways to accommodate our new arena numbers um, and rezoning in the rail corridor area is certainly something that we'll, that we'll look more strongly at as a part of that project. Um, but but I would say that is included. And I see Anais's face with us today. I don't know if you wanted to add any anything to that. No, I think that's a really good summary. Um, we did consider when we were doing the modeling, um, you know, more uh, growth around those areas, but you know that's really a rough consideration because it's it's done at the, a larger scale than parcels or even um, sometimes census blocks. So, um, but as Stephanie said, in, until there's an actual rezoning, um, 
you know, we're not considering exact locations for growth. Understood. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, last question I have, and right in time for a break here. Uh, do you, one thing that was mentioned in chapter seven, parks and rec section was uh, there's work with Caltrans to plant more trees along um, highway one. So my question was, are we, would it be considered a scenic highway again, or is that still going away? Because like, you know, a lot of Mission Street is not, you know, like we talked about. Different. Right, That that's a, an addition based on the commission's discussion that, um, uh, you know, we're, we're changing the locally, uh, the local designation for part of uh, Highway 1 that has been highly urbanized and tree cover has been lost. Um, so the commission thought that it was appropriate to yeah. recognize that we don't have to just accept that, that restoration would be um, appropriate. And so that policy is added to the drafts in order to address that, that comment. Okay. And so if, but sorry, so maybe I misunderstood this, but so then it's, we're still losing that scenic highway status for now. And maybe yeah, yeah, you know, um, part of what goes on with that scenic highway, it's, you know, you're really trying to cut down on visibility of new development, and it's hard to meet those policies if you're trying to um, create an urbanized area that might have greater heights. Mm -hmm. um, and so those that that kind of um, change in that designation. And again, it's not a state scenic highway. Right. Um, it's just a local designation in our general plan um, that supports uh, the development in our urban areas around our, our corridors as well. Got it. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Um, that was all of my questions for now. So I appreciate it. Um, we did have kind of a scheduled break right now, 10 minutes, and I want to respect that. And then re reminder, we have a 1230 lunch. So why don't we take that um, quick recess, be back at you know, right about 11, 11. Try to keep it quick. Move right okay. along. Okay, we'll see you at 11, 11. Thank you. Thank you. It's 11, 11. Welcome everybody back. I'd like to make sure that Ms. Drake is here. Chair, I know um, Ms. Drake uh, was having some computer issues and is switching over her computer. So it might be just another second. Okay, sure, no problem. There she is. Okay. Just thank you. Thank you. Let's see if I can get this to work. Hello. Okay, let's. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Can you hear us? Can I? Yeah. Um. Yes. My connection is a little slow, so I think I might reconnect, but I will get us going here and I'll do that and I'll come back in. Um, 
Should we take a quick roll call? Please. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Shepard, are you back with us? Commissioner Shepard, are you there? You can hear you, Commissioner Shepard, if you're there. Whoops. Yes, I am. There we go. Okay. All right. Commissioner Dan? Here. Commissioner Violante? Here. Commissioner Lazenby? Here. Okay. And Chair Gordon? Here. Thank you. Great, now we could, let's continue with uh, questions from the presentation. And um, who would like to go next? I'm sure Britain, I'd be happy to, to go next. Wonderful, thank you, Commissioner Violante. Um, for staff, um, my questions, I think I'll take them in order, um, going through the general plan and then moving on to the, the code just so you can follow um, kind of the direction I'm, I'm going through them. I was deciding where to start, which ones are helpful in trying to reduce my questions. Um, and so I think the first thing I'll ask is that in, in, in I'm in the built environment. So um, BE 2.1.19 uh, for, for my commissioners, it's page 2-36. Um, and it's the one that Chair Gordon actually asked about, which was the um, development below the minimum density. Um, and it talks about the fact that a development cannot be approved below the minimum density. And I just had a question in there. It talked about um, a government code that allowed, it said accept for, and it mentioned a government code. And I was just wondering if this, how this would deal with uh, rebuilds. So if there was um, fire, uh, like a home fire, or if there was earthquake and these kind of catastrophes or something like that, how would it deal with rebuilds? Did that fall under that? Um, government code because I'm just curious about those types of situations. Um, yes, I, be I believe that it that it would. Okay, if we can get clarity for me, that would, that's just an important component. Um, I want to make sure. sure we're not precluding people from rebuilding. Um, we've seen trees falls on homes. We obviously with CZB, we now know a very specific cause, and they just would. Um, I want to make sure that we. Don't preclude people from rebuilding if they suffer from things we none of us want to experience. We we appreciate that there shouldn't be anything in these policies that preclude re, rebuilding. Um, the challenges are otherwise, as you know, septic, fire, et cetera. Exactly. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the other one is that just it was a small change, and I just it's a clarity because I want to make sure that I'm understanding the codes appropriately. Um, on page two dash um, nine zero. Um, you, the, the, the language has been changed, and I believe, I just want to get there myself. Um, <coughs> um, I apologize to navigating it with you. Um, I believe that the code now, it, it talks about um, when we're redoing or visitor serving accommodations, and I believe that the language is no longer necessary that has been added in, so it talks about when market analysis of land um, demonstrates that the existing priority use or use designation is no longer feasible. And I, I think now that we've said that this can only happen on visitor serving accommodation, um, that, that, that the language of existing use or priority use designation is no longer necessary. But I wanna make sure that I'm understanding this piece of, of the code correctly, because I think it's just, we're saying only on visitor serving accommodation. I want to wanna make sure that I'm right. That I'm reading it correctly, that it is only on visitor serving accommodation where we're saying this. this can you, um... Can you tell us what, are you in the policy or the code? I'm in, I'm only doing the general plan for now. Right. Okay. And can so, you tell me which policy? So it's, it's I'm on page 290, 2-9. And let me just get there myself. Thank you. Um, so I can read what I'm doing. So I don't think I'm in. The, so it's it's um, BE 5.1.3. Okay, um, thank you. And then it gets to the bottom of, so it's, it's part of the whole thing though. So it's talking about, Consider allowing the conversion of visitor serving commercial land uses to a lower priority land use when, and then it gets into 
um, these, these possibilities. Um, and then it says when the proposed conversion is not, um, and then the very last one, um, I think is, I think let me make sure I have the right one, right place. So it's the first bullet point. I think, let me make sure I'm right at the first bullet point. <laughs> I have like notes of piece of the language that I'm confused about. Um, I'll say while we're trying to figure it out, this this language um, has been amended based on... Oh, you know what? On... It looks like maybe you guys fixed my confusion, actually, even in the most recent version. Oh, great. Nope. <laughs> nope. Nope. Okay. No, okay. Um, yeah, so it says the proposed conversion will not adversely affect the ability of the county to provide appropriate locations for adequate amounts and or types of visitor serving land uses, which is right, and it says as demonstrated by remaining... So maybe you guys did get fix it. So that's just it's a, that was the one. I think maybe you did fix it. So okay, um, okay. So that's great. We've been discussing this with the coastal commission staff a little bit. It's a little odd to have conversion policies in there. So that language has been adjusted to try to make sure conversions don't take place inappropriately. And that was my concern. Um, and so I was just I was trying to make sure I understood the language. Um, Okay, so going to the next chapter, which is um, access and mobility, um, the, the, it's AM 2.3.6. Um, I need to get there myself. So it talks about delivery of services, and it talks about the support delivery services by creating curb loading and short-term parking zones as they have increased access to goods and services for the mobility impaired. And I just, I was hoping maybe you could tell me the, the goal of this one, because I have some reservations about us using the words mobility impaired. And so I wasn't sure if maybe you could talk about, is this a standard um, terminology? Because there are people who suffer from other disabilities that aren't necessarily mobility impaired, like chronic fatigue syndrome, oxygen shortages that still need these type of service, like they still need access. And so I just wasn't sure if maybe you could explain to me the goal of this particular one. I, I, I like the concept, but the language choice, if you could explain to me that this is like a standard phrase that you use in transportation. Um, yes, and it could de definitely be changed uh, to be more inclusive. The comment came from um, a commission that is a little bit more focused on um, people with hearing and vision disabilities, but the comment came with regard to people who um, uh, have mobility issues. So certainly can look at making that language more inclusive. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and then I think that's the last question on that particular chapter from the um, the general plan. Um, the next chapter, I sorry, apologize, I have a lot of questions, so I'm trying to go through them quickly um, for my colleagues and you as well. Um, the next chapter is chapter five, the agricultural natural resources um, uh, chapter. Um, I had questions having to do with the, the A zone a lot. Um, and I just want to get there so I can see what I'm talking about. So on page 5-35, um, it looks like it's ARC 1.4.1. Um, so it's talking about the 200 foot setbacks unless an exception is approved. Um, but the, if the change has, the, what I've noted here is that we're only allowing exception um, we're changing the way we're doing buffers and setbacks um, for, for ag things. And it says, my notes say that we're saying, only allowing setbacks from residential uses. Um, and I just, I wanted to talk, if you could explain to me why the changes were made in this particular section, that would be helpful for me. Um, yes, um, thank you, Commissioner Violante. Um, the um, it's not actually a change. It was just intended to clarify our current ag buffer setback requirements. So, um, so there's not 
um, any changes, um, they're still required to provide the 200 foot um, buffer setback for any habitable uses that are um, adjacent to a CA parcel or ag preserve parcel. Thank you, I appreciate that, Annie. Um, and then my next question, so I have, oh, Annie, I may have more questions, those questions for, for you than anybody. <laughs> Forgive my district, so I apologize. <laughs> my next one is on page 5-44. Um, um, and I don't have a section, I don't have a, a policy right in which we may, we may be interested in general questions. Let me find out why I did my turn. Um, I think I just, my general, I think I just had general concern about this one, which was, it was ARC 1.6.1. I, I just, I had concerns about the fact that we were kind of expanding um, commercial activity on, on A zoned parcels. I think I was just kind of wondering the logic behind this, because I have felt historically that there's been a distinction between CA zoned parcels, which are commercially designated, and A zoned parcels, parcels which have uh, a place, but that we've kind of distinguished that they weren't commercially, um, that wasn't their primary thing. And so could you maybe explain to me some of the, what happened, how we ended up with like, this particular piece? Um, um, is, is this about changing what for a specific cause could be on a parcel? So yes, that's exactly right. They, the, the, there's been an expansion of, of, of allowing commercial activity on a zone parcels. Um, um, yes, so um, so partly what this policy does is um, align it better with what's already in the code. Like when you when you look at the use chart, general uses that are allowed in CA are also allowed on A. So part of it is is being more reflective of what's in the code. Um, but the change is also, um, as we discussed at previous meetings. Um, we are um, expanding sort of ag support uses that would be allowed, um, such as agricultural service establishments. Um, um, so those those same type of agricultural support uses that are proposed for CA would also be allowed on A. Um, so so that does reflect that change as well. And um, you know the intention there is also to provide the the areas for agricultural support that are needed by the, um, you know, commercial agriculture. Just to add a lot of the ag changes, um, there were a lot of community meetings back in 2015 and um, a lot of changes that are proposed are meant to provide more modernization and support for our existing agricultural uses so that they can be economically feasible um, and and accommodate you know uses that are a little bit more flexible but appropriate um, yeah and then adding to what Stephanie says these also would be discretionary uses so they'd require discretionary review and um, opportunities for public input and that sort of thing as well for the ag support uses mm -hmm. Just sorry, I was looking by next one. Um, I'm just going to the next page so I can know what I'm talking about in advance of opening my mouth. <laughs> um, oh, on page five dash. Um, Five three. Um, my memory of the hearing is that we wanted to deny it once and for all. Commissioner Shepard, you are not muted. Oh, sorry. Thank you. And five dash five on page five dash five three on C it's C three. Um, it talks about areas adjacent to essential habitats of rare endangered threatened species as defined in, and then it says, I, I'm confused about what it's referencing. I think it's probably just an error of all the revisions, but as a result, I wasn't sure what it was trying to reference, and that made it hard for me to know whether or not I agreed. Um, so I think if you don't mind taking a peek at that and then me coming back to us by the, in the afternoon session, 
it would just be helpful for me because it says as defined in I don't know if it's going through E through F below, or it's trying to say four through F below. Um, but we we struck F. Um, so if you don't mind taking a peek at that little section, um, that would be helpful for me. Thank you. Yes, it looks like there may, now that I'm looking at it, it looks like there may have been a numbering error that happened at some point. So I will I will look at that and um, I can get back to you in the afternoon. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, um, and then, and then I have a question that I think is probably not agriculturally related. It's 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 about the when to to, to, to commit director uh, chair Gordon's question when he, we talk about replanting of trees. It actually references Ocean um, Avenue. I I'm not sure if they meant Ocean Street because um, I want to make sure that we are speaking about the right location. Just so I know where we're referencing. Again, I don't it's on the ag question, but that's in the section. It's on page one dash. Oh, I wrote it's ARC 5.2B. Um, I just want to make sure that, that gets fixed because I think it's important to know where we're talking about replanting trees. Um, Thank you. Um, okay, so chapter seven, um, parks and open space. Um, ah, yes. Okay, so parks and open space, page seven. Point one oh three. Let me get there. I apologize, like a hundred different documents trying to know what I'm talking about. Um. Didn't didn't reference what I was referencing here, so I apologize. It's talking about runoff. Yeah, so the reason I didn't write it, so it's in PF 4.4.1. Um, and it says require runoff levels to be maintained at pre development rates for minimum design storm. Um, and I, I didn't know for a minimum design storm. And I, I don't know, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I think perhaps either there's some words missing. Um, yeah, um, maybe I can help a little <laughs> bit with this. Or Anais, did you want? Or did you want to? Um, I'm still trying to get there myself on okay. a slow computer. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's page one. It's seven dash one oh three. And again, I apologize. But I didn't. I didn't mark for myself the actual yeah. um, policy number. It's um, PPF four dot four dot one. Um, Generally, the you know the county design criteria are the public works standards for um, roads and stormwater and the driveways. They cover kind of you know variety of um, uh, situations that would affect the right of way or or stormwater in this case. Um, and you you know you you, cal you do calculations on how the storm water is um flowing and um there are different levels that you can uh that you would consider it at um one is how much water is flowing at in the 100 year storm let's say or the 10 year storm and now i see matt machado probably has a much better answer than i yeah, do no, so just, i'll hand fact, it over it's just the fact that it says for a minimum design storm and I don't, I usually have heard like 100 year storms or a minimum designed storm. I don't know, minimum design storm, Matt. Yeah, so, so our standard is a 25 year storm event. So that's, that's, our, that's our design standard is 25 year. I do see Rachel Fatui on the, on the attendee list here if she wants to elaborate, but 25 year storm is our standard to answer your question. Is that what we just consider a minimum, just the language minimum design storm? Is that what we call it? Yeah, I believe it is. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's that's the. Thank you. 
Yeah. The language seemed awkward just, despite all my years dealing with run, <laughs> with water runoff. So <laughs> thank you. Okay. That's just what we call it. That's that's the clarifying piece. I thank you. Um, that's my last one for that. Um, I, Anais, you might want to stay. My next question is also for you. Um, in Appendix I, 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 in the TDM, one of the recommended mitigation pieces, am I understanding correctly that staff are saying that a way to meet TDM is to reduce the number of parking spots offered? Am I understanding that correctly? Am I reading Appendix I correctly? Yes, so this would have to be, all of these measures would have to be compliant with our current code, um, which is stated at the beginning of the appendix. Um, there are some ways to reduce parking uh, in within the code, such as you can provide more bicycle parking spaces um, up to a maximum. You can't do that for all parking space, all vehicle parking spaces. Um, there's also a reduction that I believe we spoke about uh, the last meeting um, based on comments from the Board of Supervisors allowing for parking reductions if other criteria are met, uh, such as providing bus passes. Um, so yes, it is a TDM measure and it would have to comply with allowances in the code. And more broadly to answer the question, yes, controlling the amount of parking is a considerable TDM measure for starting to control how many cars are on the roadway and um, how much uh, VMT we're producing and thereby how much greenhouse gases we're producing. So yes, it's a, <clears throat> a recognized control measure for that. Okay. okay. And then I guess I have a question kind of on the equity component. I, I understand it's still on TDM, I mean, it's still on Appendix I, or, and Stephanie is, I struggle a bit with unbundled parking from an equity component. I, I understand that there is argument on it reflecting the true cost of parking by unbundling it, but I'm wondering if one of you can speak to the equity component that it presents. Um, you know, there's a, there's a parking spot, for example, in San Francisco right now, that's for sale for $90,000. Um, and the truth is when we unbundle parking, we are essentially making parking something available only for those who can afford it. And it kind of becomes an elitist and a privileged component of life. And we, and I and I and I just I if you could because I, I read I went and I did some research I read about unbundled parking and and how it does um, disassociate the cost but I still struggle a bit on the on the equity component so if you and none of the research I read really addressed that component and since we're we're trying to have a lens of equity can, can, is this something we also contemplated and could you speak to that on how we don't end up creating cars as something only the privileged have access to, or is it just we're saying that in order to achieve a reduction in VMT, it's... Yeah, so um, I can under I understand that perspective. Um, typically, what people don't realize is that the cost of providing parking is actually pretty high. So the idea is, is when a, a developer project development unbundles it, they can actually reduce the cost of the housing. Um, we we are a very different place in San Francisco um, where the cost of parking is valued at a much higher rate um, because of the density levels that are there. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I hope that we won't see, see that kind of um, parking cost. Um, I can say that in other metropolitan areas, the cost when it's unbundled doesn't prohibit a person from affording the, at least in my own anecdotal personal experience, um, affording the parking. Um, 
The other thing is that this is tied to, again, that piece of code that was requested by the Board of Supervisors where we do unbundle parking uh, for certain projects that provide bus passes um, as well as other incentives. So um, it's it's something that's going to be tapped in, well, could theoretically be tapped into in the code and therefore we'd like to offer it as a TDM measure as well, since it does encourage people to do things like scooter, bike, or walk. Um, and Commissioner, I would, I would just offer up the kind of the opposite perspective of keeping it bundled may force um, folks to essentially pay for parking because it gets roped into rent, right, um, when they don't need it. So I think that there's two perspectives, two two sides of the coin there. Um, I don't know what you mean by bundled. I oh, bundled parking is when you get your parking spot as part of your housing, and unbundled is when you pay for the parking spot separately from your housing. Um, so you're paying um, fifteen hundred, two thousand, three thousand dollars for your rental, and you're paying a hundred, two hundred dollars for your parking spot independently. And so. just if I can just ask one other quick clarification about what you are talking about, Allison. Um, I think in one of our hearings, you explained that this depended on having the transit system operate at a certain defined level, which ours doesn't. I reminded of this because in San Francisco, the muni's really good and stops everywhere. That, that's far from the case. And you mentioned in one of our hearings that our transit system right now, the bus, doesn't really qualify for that kind of comprehensive transit system because it doesn't. No, so actually they, we, we could choose to implement this without having a high level of, of transit, which is one of my concerns is that in places where unbundled parking is often popular, like San Francisco and Seattle, it's, because they, it's places where they do have transit systems that can support not having a vehicle. And while we're heading in that direction, it is one of my concerns, um, but um, I, sh I share your concern. I think it's a serious concern. But I appreciate um, Ms. Hansen and, and Ms. Sheck um, sharing with me some of the reasons that unbundled parking is beneficial and um, and, and the, the equity argument for unbundling. So I, I appreciate you answering my question. Um, uh, so I think that I, I have just, I apologize. I have <laughs> I told you I have lots of questions that are helping me decide about some of my um, directions this afternoon. Um, uh, one of my, I, all the rest of my questions are all in the actual code itself. Um, so they're kind of everybody all over the place, depending on where we are in the code. Um, uh, so I'll just go through them. If I start in the ag use chart, and let me just get there, it's 1310, 312-1, um, it's the ag use chart. And I need to. My note says that we're allowing the process. We're allowing ag processing of sixty thousand square feet on A zone parcels, but we're not on CA zone parcels. Um, Annie, am I right on that? According to the use chart. Um, let me just get there for a moment. Yeah. No, no, trust <laughs> me, I've been doing that. I think my questions are taking <laughs> twice as long because I have to do the same when I'm looking. <laughs> okay, so I'm sorry, you're asking about ag processing facilities, is that yes. correct? Yes, okay. yeah, so when I'm, when I'm looking at the code, it looks like we are, it, with the CUP, mind you, but still, we're saying ag processing facilities, we're saying we are allowing them on A zone parcels, but not on CA zone parcels. Am I understanding that correctly according to the... Um, so the ag use chart, and that's 1310.312-1, if any of my fellow commissioners would like to know what I'm looking at. Okay, um, yeah, I see that. I see the confusion because it looks like in the draft, the strike-through language did not appear correctly. So um, what it's actually saying is on, um, on oh. CA, so we have the you know the development area cap with the intention to protect the um, agricultural resource soil. So on CA, the ag processing facility is allowed up to sixty thousand square feet, and that's the maximum size on CA. Right. Um, on A, 
um, there could be an application for larger than 60,000 square feet. So that's where the NA would be if it's larger than 60,000 square feet. And that, Correct. that again, would be subject to discretionary review and, and findings and that sort so, of thing. But So yes. I am understanding it correctly. We, we're yeah, allowing that, that, so that's that size level, yes. So I guess my question is, Annie, why are we allowing such a large kind of, why are we allowing such a large processing facility on an A zone parcel that we wouldn't allow on a CA zone parcel when A is supposed to have these, what I consider less intense uses on an A zone parcel? Why are we even contemplating them on an A zone parcel when we, I mean, I understand we're protecting people and we're trying to protect type one, type three, you know, these primary ag uses on the CA zone parcel. But I have to admit, I was surprised to see that we're allowing these, even, even with the greater um, scrutiny of the CUP, why are we even contemplating these greater intensification of uses on an A zone parcel when we're not contemplating it even on an a, a CA zone parcel? Um, well, the intention is to be able to um, provide um, necessary ag support um, while still protecting ag resource land. So there aren't there aren't many opportunities for our land available for those types of uses. So so A zone parcels see, would be seems the most appropriate again considering all the findings that need to be made and um, public input. So um, um, and with with the ag resource soils the the criteria come into play regarding conversion of ag land and loss of ag land. So um, so there are more limitations in some cases for CA. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Okay. 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 Um, my next question is in 1310-323-B. Get there. Um, I told you, Annie, I told you all my questions fall in your camp. <laughs> I warned you in advance. Um, Three, two, three, B. It has to do with greenhouses. Um, three, two, three. Okay, on B. Oh no, it has to do with greenhouses. No, it's in the. It's. I'm still in the use chart. I apologize. I'm still in the use chart. It references thirteen ten point three two three B. And I didn't understand what 1310, that's what it was. Okay. The use chart under greenhouses references 1310-323B. And I don't understand what 1310-323B, I don't understand how they're connected. Um, and because they're dependent on each other, I'm 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 confused. And you could you could clarify because 1310-323B has to do with the cre the, the, the the title is literally site area for the creation of new sites um and then when you get down so i'm i i didn't understand the connection and because greenhouses are obviously a very big deal um and we're talking about greenhouses both 1000 square feet or less and larger if the reference is in both sections um under greenhouses um in the ag use chart sorry my, i I have to remember what I was referencing in my notes. Um, the, yeah, so in greenhouses, um, in that same 1310, um, 323, in that in that in that use chart. Oh, maybe I'm in residential. Can I switch? Maybe I'm in the res chart. Hold on. Might be in the residential chart. I lied. I'm in Annie. I'm not in your section anymore. I'm, I'm in the residential use chart now. Okay. It's not your problem. <laughs> not your, it's not your problem. It's not your problem, Annie. Okay. 1310-322-1, the residential use chart, um, references this section. And I don't understand um, how they're connected. So I don't know who wrote the residential use chart, um, but I'm confused. And I don't know what to do with this section because it has to do with greenhouses that are 1,000 square feet or less and 1,000 square feet or larger. It references this thing and I don't, because they're principally permitted. Um, and then and then they also require MUPs, which doesn't require notification um, of their neighbors. And I want to understand, it's, it's clearly dependent on this section and I don't understand how they're connected. And so I can't make a determination whether or not I'm okay with it until I understand it. So I don't know if somebody could look at that and they get back to me. Um, I just think it's important when we have these references that they make sense. 
Sorry, Annie. Sorry. Yes, we, we, we want them to be helpful. And um, I don't know if Daisy's on and has a ready answer, but we might, if not, then we'll return this afternoon. Um, yeah, I, I can take a look um, and give you a more complete answer, but just looking in the sort of text box explanation um, that comes before the, the residential use chart, um, what we state there is the, the reasoning for adding that reference um, was to clarify that greenhouses are not subject to the accessory structures uh, standards, um, but uh, which are in 131611. Um, but I will go ahead and check the reference to 131032.3b and see whether that's a typo or not. Okay. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, the next one I have questions on is 1310-323. Oh, I'm still in, okay. I think it might be in that same section. 1310-323-B5. So that's still, it's, it sounds like that's still Daisy. Um, uh, it references uh, in the zone districts listed in subsections A, and then it says A, through D of this section, and then, but I don't, I don't know if they're talking. I don't know what they're talking about, Annie. I don't, I don't, or not Annie. Sorry, and this is Daisy. Daisy, I don't know what you're trying to tell me is happening here. Um, so I'm in thirteen ten three two three, the development standards standards for residential districts, the last one. So, yep. I, I got it. Um, okay. So Commissioner Violante, it looks like that's a typo. And what it should say is in the zone districts listed in subsections 1A through D. So, so the capital A should be changed to a 1. So 1, and then it should be lowercase a through D. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah, I will need to go take a peek at that now that I know that. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, we'll make a note of that as, as well. 1A. Sorry, I'm just making notes to myself so I can go back and look. Um, okay, this one is really important, important to me. 1310332B2. Um, it has to do with, want me to read it again? It's 131332. And then B2. The commercial and, standards. Yeah, so what has to do is a change of use. So it's when you have to, and I have to find it, but I know what I, I know what it, it, it refers to. It's when you do or do not essentially have to seek approval for change of use. So if you are, um, if you are not go, doing an intensification of use, you don't necessarily have to go back out for an MUP or an AUP. That's what this piece of the code references, but the language is important to have in front of me because um, it's II that's really important to me. And I can, I should just pull up the. The new use will not result in an intensification of use. Mm -hmm, that seems so. Okay. Yeah. Make sure I have it in front of me. Because it, it lists some circumstances that must be met in order for this to be true. Um, so I'm looking at B2. The change of use of an existing legal structure in a commercial zone district. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it says the change of use in existing legal structure may be approved with a zoning clearance, which is why remember I said that you don't have to go back out. If the following criteria are met, and it says the new use is allowed in the zone district. The new use will not result in an intensification of use. And, and this is the one I'm hoping Daisy maybe can speak to, which is there's a use permit or master use permit for the existing use and or the new use is specified in the new in the parcel in a town or village specific plan. And I'm wondering if you can speak to how often you think this happens, because in some ways this feels very much like a loophole. 
Um, it feels like you can just switch from having an admin, you know, you can have an admin use like a, you know, you can have some something smaller like a instruction studio, and then you can go for something that requires a bigger, um, would normally require a, a, a higher level of noticing. Um, and so I'm hoping you can explain to me kind of how often you think this is met. Um, so you can explain to me how the, this circumstance. The circumstance where you would not need a use permit or a where you would, change of use? Correct. Um, yeah, so some feedback that um, staff has gotten uh, over the years and also from the uh, economic uh, vitality study process has been that one kind of barrier um, in the community uh, for businesses is this use permit requirement um, being rather onerous, the current uh, commercial use permit requirement. Um, so the change that um, we're making here is to um, still require uh, use permits, but only um, in situations where um, uh, there's no intensification of use and the use is allowed, and also there's already an existing use permit. Um, uh, so I, I don't know if I would classify it as a, a loophole necessarily. Um, it's uh, providing clarification on uh, uh, situations where it would be uh, appropriate to, to get a use permit with, with um, parameters on what could be allowed on the property. Um, and the, the, um, the uh, term intensification of use, just uh, to provide that information, that is defined um, in the code. That's in 1310-700. So it's not, a, it's not squishy. It is, it is defined. For commercial, it's um, no, it's 10% or 100. Yeah, 10%, 10 so, right, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm familiar. I guess my concern is that, so if you had someone who, like, let's say they have a use permit for something that on the front end only required an AUP, they could change their use to something that would normally require a CUP as long as there was an intensification of use. And so in some, that's what I mean by a loophole. And so that, that's because the neighbors would not be given the right of being notified mm. that something was changing. And so this is where, to me, I assumed, and this is where I'm hoping you can talk to me, is that perhaps, and maybe I'm wrong, and it sounds like perhaps it was, I was hoping that maybe you were going to explain to me that I, the I, I, I was written in a way to limit how often this would happen. Because when I read it, I said, okay, well, there's a use permit or master use permit and or there's this new use permit and specified in these town and ask and site specific plans that you were going to tell me that no, this will happen not very frequently unless they were part of a village plan. You know, they were part of the C the Seacliff Village Master Plan unless they're part of, but it sounds like what you're telling me is no, it's just strictly designed to streamline it. Am I understanding that correctly? Um well, it's yeah, so it's designed to yes, streamline the process in terms of reducing the number of commercial use permit applications that, that are required, um, but while still keeping in some parameters here. But um, you are correct that there could be a situation where uh, uh, there's a use that in the use chart requires a higher use permit level. And I don't see where in subsection three, that would necessarily require review um, for a new use permit um, as long as there wasn't an intensification of use. So that is something that, you know, the commission may want to consider uh, making adjustments. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Just this, this mm -hmm. one, I mean, I, I think of like the conflict areas of someone being like, oh, well, we thought it was just gonna be a small something and then it changed. So I appreciate that clarity. The next one um, is in the commercial use chart. Um, and this one is just, I, I, there are three categories, um, bars and nightclubs, tasting rooms, and liquor stores. They were all allowed in the PA zone district as long as they were ancillary. And I, for the life of me, could not think of when any of those uses would be ancillary to professional and admin. 
can you give me an example of when that would be appropriate, like an ancillary? Because if it can't, I kind of, yeah. Could you just give me an example of wh where we, we staff envisions that being possible? Sure. Um, so the, so, so what you're referring to is the use has a little like superscript of A next to the permit. Um, <laughs> And the way we define that at the top of the uses chart is the use must be ancillary or complementary to another allowed use. A primary allowed use must first be in place or must be proposed concurrently on a site to allow an ancillary or complementary use. Um, so the idea with the PA district, which is the office, professional and administrative district, is that the primary you know, appropriate uses in that district are office uses. Um, however, uh, one thing that we're trying to achieve with the sustainability update is to allow for more walkability. Um, and part of that is allowing for workers to be able to walk to access um, restaurants, for instance, um, during the workday and those kinds of uses. So um, entertainment and sort of dining uses um, uh, may be appropriate um, in the PA district, but um, certainly the primary use on those on those uh, parcels should still be um, the office uses. And I should say, is this a recognition of how stressful it is to work inside the office now? Yeah, I, I have to admit, I, 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 Daisy, I 100% support the direction that the staff is going in creating these integrated workplaces, but I do struggle to see how bars and nightclubs are needed in a walkable community when we're talking PA. Um, so I, 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 we might discuss that this afternoon. Sure. <laughs> um, but I appreciate you being candid about how we got there because I completely understand how you got there. I just, I was like, nightclubs, bars, interesting. Um, the way to get people to come into the office <laughs> <laughs> makes happy hour very easy on Friday afternoons. Um, okay. Um, my next question, question had to do with table 1310331333-1, which was commercial um, site and structural dimensions chart. Staff put a minimum height of 15 feet. And I was just wondering about how we ended up with that because I I think of like the Rittenhouse building downtown, some of the um, commercial structures on like say Scotts Valley Drive that are empty and how expensive the TIs are on these buildings. And I support 15 feet being an option, but I just wondered on the, the logic of minimum versus maximum um, and why we're searching for such conformity of a minimum. Um, sure, I can I can sort of kick us off in answering that. Um, so the the fifteen foot minimum height is for the first story floor to ceiling height in the C three workplace flex zone district, um, which is a new zone district. Um, and the kind of core purpose of that district is to provide for flexible space um, that can be easily converted between light industrial and um, other types of commercial uses. And so for that district in particular, um, uh, the ceiling height of at least 15 feet um, uh, is useful to make sure that, that um, those buildings are uh, able to be converted in that way um, in the future. Um, and I believe that the, the, the research that was done related to that building height um, actually went into the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan. Um, that uh, uh, was completed in 2014. I guess I'm still struggling, Daisy, to understand. I, I totally, it sounds like that research went to, just a, to, to justify allowing 15 feet, but I'm still struggling to understand why it's a minimum. Well, it's allowed currently. There's no, there's no minimum or maximum on ground, to, you know, ground to ceiling height for any of our commercial districts currently um, and setting a, a minimum um, requires that you have a taller first first floor um, on these buildings that can accommodate um, light industrial uses more easily. 
So, so the research so that by allowing 15 feet, you accommodate greater uses. Did it did it did it speak at all about displacing any of these smaller uses? Because I because I think of I think of some of our our current kind of small and mom, mom and pop shops that we we don't want to displace by allowing some of these. And I just I that, that's my like that's when I speak about the TI costs and when we do mm. lose businesses and people want to move into these spaces, I want to make sure that we're not um, creating an economic obstacle of allowing small retail to go into these spaces. And so I just wasn't sure about that. So I'm, it's good to hear that we already allow 15 feet, but I'm just, um, the idea of creating a minimum, I, I like the idea. It's good to hear that it creates opportunity. I just, it's, I, I um, okay. Yeah, and I, I would just add that the um, the maximum building height in that district is 50 feet as well, which sort of accommodates that first floor height as, as well. Okay. Um, next question I had was in 13, 10, 3, 4, 3, which I think is ag again. My question has A and RA listed. Let me see what I'm talking about. Thank you to the commission and staff for bearing with me on my 300 questions. <laughs> These are really helpful for me knowing what I want to um, clarifying for myself. So my direct my ideas this afternoon. Uh, 1310343 three is industrial. Yeah, but I, I, my question says, what is the maximum building height if not within 200 feet of R or, or A districts? As oh. it read, as it read, none, none appears is what I wrote as my question. Um, so um, it, although it's it, the commercial use, my question has to do with. Um, mm, I see, with, yeah. With, with referencing to, to these, um, these R or A district. Um, so is there a height limit? Right. So, well, the provision is meant to kind of control the massing if you're near residential areas, um, you know, the R or A district that might also, you know, that accommodate residential uses. So it's meant to kind of control the Im impacts when you have zoning districts that have very different functions and are immediately adjacent to one another. So but I guess my question though, Stephanie, is that in, in the M2 district, mm -hmm. it, 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 it just says, it says three stories, 40 feet, if within 200 feet of R, of R or A district. So do we not have a maximum height? Oh, M2? I see what so, you're saying. So in M2, do we not, do we not have a maximum height? If it's not within the 200 feet of R or A district of R districts, am I making sense? So in the middle yeah. of the chart, on there's a, there's on well, on my I'm different and I go to the it's it's page 19. It is page 19 even on the online version. In the middle of the chart. Yes, I see. Not, I see not, where you're at. Yeah. And so there's just there's no. It says three stories, 40 feet, if within two, like so. If you're not within 200 feet of a residential or an A zone parcel, and maybe there are no M2 parcels that aren't within that, but I assume there are because otherwise, why would we reference this? Like we list zero maximum height, and I feel like we do. We need to give direction to provide a maximum height if you are in all of those situations. Let let us look at that a little bit more closely and get back to you this afternoon. Okay. Um, I am, if you can't tell, I'm one of those people who read all of the code. Um, <laughs> I'm <laughs> glad it's good. And, and see 100 questions. Um, um, okay. Uh, next one says 13, 10, 6, 1, 6. See 
D1B. Oh no, I think I might have fixed that. Okay, I think I might have fixed that already. Okay. Um, fix that. I have a question about, it's about the definitions, but it's also about, um, um, I'll ask it now, but it's really in the definition. So there's inconsistency. So produce stands, there's inconsistency in the definition in 131700 and what is defined in 131640 on whether or not processed goods are allowed. Um, if you read one, it says that no processed goods are allowed, and one and the other one, it says like 15%. And because of that inconsistency, I'm not sure which direction staff had actually intended. Um, and therefore, I don't cl clearly a correction needs to happen, and I don't know which I don't know which you intended, so I don't know which way to go in terms of my recommendation. Um, do we need to say that again? Um, thank you. I I heard the question. Um, let me, can I look at that and get, get back to you after the lunch break? Absolutely, yeah, I know. Okay. So, because because okay. I'm a little unclear because there's the temporary and then there's the produce stands and there's the produce markets um, and they they don't dive. Um, and therefore, I would like to make some comments and recommendations on that section this afternoon. And so it'd be helpful to me to know what staff had wanted so I can know how to respond. Okay. Um, 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 yeah, okay, I think this is my last comment. I think <laughs> um, uh, 1310689-2, commercial VA maximum densities outside the USL. Um, um, It's talking about the fact that you can, oh, no, I need to try the other thing. Oh, no, that's a good one. Can you go over the numbers in this chart for me? It's the chart. So it's table 1310-689-2, the visitor serving accommodation maximum densities outside the USL. Um, I was just hoping you could go over the numbers in the chart um, because I I read it and I kind of get to like 200 overnight guests when I look at this. And then I I, I would just, if someone could go over the numbers and that would be helpful to me. Um, Daisy and Natisha. Yeah, I can I can get us started. Maybe Natisha can help me. <laughs> um, uh, I know we both worked on this section. Um, so I'm looking at the table 1310-689-2. Um, the density, so there's no maximum density on hotels and motels, um, except in the TP or parks districts. Um, where we allow 10 overnight guests per rural matrix unit. Um, and the rural matrix unit, um, you know, that's that's calculated based on uh, doing the rural the rural uh, density matrix. Um, and then for bed and breakfast and inns, we allow ten overnight guests per rural matrix unit, up to twenty VA units total. But Daisy, can I can I ask a question? Just interrupting you. So mm -hmm. it says twenty night overnight guests per. And this is when I, I get to the 200 because it's 20 guests per unit up to 20 units. And so that's 200 guests, correct? Well, so is rural that matrix... that, that's, that's what I wanted you to go over with me. Sure. The, the whole, am I understanding this correctly that you can get two get 10 guests per unit up to 20 units? Is that what I'm understanding for the bed and breakfasts? And then for the rural matrix, obviously there's a different calculation. Sure. Um, so, so. 
<laughs> believe it or not, we're working on making this section simpler than it currently is. I do. With I these believe it. <laughs> um, but the uh, uh, the rural matrix units and the and the VA units are two different things. Um, so the rural rural matrix units are calculated using the rural density matrix, and for most properties, it's just you know one or two or three. Um, uh, uh, unless you have a really large property, um, and then you may you may uh, have more, um, and then uh, a total of twenty units would twenty visitor accommodation units would be allowed, um, and visitor accommodation units are defined within this code section and in thirteen ten seven hundred, which means a room cabin or suite, um, and so I'm not sure. So that would be 20 would be the maximum, not 200. But it's it's more the number of guests because I mean that's where the I'm, number of I'm, guests. I so see. That's, okay. what, that's what I'm trying to understand. So it's it, it's like it's 10 overnight guests per rural matrix unit, and that's the part where I'm trying to understand the language. So it, it, is it mm -hmm. is it 10 guests per unit, and then and that and that's where I'm trying to understand this chart to so that I can understand what's being recommended here. Mm -hmm. Because because the way I read it, and this is it, and this is where I really want you to tell me whether or not I'm understanding it correctly, is it's ten guests per unit, whether or not that's a VA unit or if it's a rural matrix unit. I want to under understand because we're talking mm -hmm. about allowing B, B and Bs in a variety of increased spaces. We're starting to talking about allowing these um, uh, ag spaces. We're and we're and we're talking about expanding. Um, this and that we're talking about these allowing this an RR and R1 and RM and I really want to make sure I understand how many people are we talking about allowing on these parcels and so I, that's where I apologize I'm struggling to understand the numbers. Sure yeah so so it'd be 10 overnight guests per rural matrix unit and that would it would really depend on the size of the property um, how many matrix units you know you would you would have on that property um, and uh, that would, you know, that would determine your number of guests. Um, and then those guests could fit into a maximum of 20 visitor accommodation units. So it's sort of two different controls on, on um, uh, maximum density uh, for bed and breakfast inns outside the USL RSL. And that one, you know, it's a little bit more, it, it's a little bit of a hybrid for that particular one um, because Within the USL RSL, there's a max of 20 VA units um, for bed and breakfast inns um, uh, in most zone districts. And then outside the USL RSL, the maximum density is for the most part driven by the rural, rural density matrix. Um, so that density calculation for bed and breakfast inns um, outside the USL RSL um, takes into account both of those uh, controls on density. Left off understanding your response. Could you, you simplify what you're saying a little bit? So if you, so I understand what you both are discussing. You could have a bread and breakfast in. You could have 20 cabins, and each cabin could be big enough to hold 10 people. But it would be subject to the rural matrix code, which has to do with uh, the ability to land to support it in terms of services and capacity. Am I understanding you right? Well, um, I, so if I yeah. understand Daisy correctly, and Daisy, tell me if I get this correctly, that it's more that you can have 10 overnight guests per time multiplied by each by the rural matrix for a total of up to 10 units. Is that correct? Um, so it's 10 overnight guests per rural matrix unit. So let's say a typical, you know, rural property might have two or three matrix units. Um, so let's say it has three, three matrix units. You go through the whole rural density matrix calculation process that's in section 13, 14 of the code. Um, and you are allowed to have um, 30 guests based on that. Those 30 guests um, can be accommodated with a maximum of 20 cabins or rooms or whatever kind of accommodations you're providing. Um, where the 20 maximum cabins or rooms really comes into play is if you have a very large rural parcel um, that has 
a large number of rural density units um, than the, the 20 maximum cabins or, or rooms would be the control that on density um, that would be more uh, important than the total number of guests. What's a rural density unit? Um, you know, uh, section 1314 of our code is called the rural density matrix, and that is how density is calculated in the rural area. No changes are proposed to that calculation method as part of this project. Okay. Okay, I think I better understand that easy. It's worded just oddly. I mean, it's basically you get up to 20 VA units total. and you, total, period. Mm -hmm. And right. within those 20 units, you can put 10 overnight guests per the rural. Exactly. The, exactly. Way it's worded, the way it's worded, it was, it was a bit confusing. Um, mm -hmm. um, so, okay, I better understand now. Um, I, I, yeah, I better understand this map. I, I still have. I, I still have some concerns, um, which I'll get into with the rest of the commissioners this afternoon a bit about the commercialization of some of our rural parcels, um, which doesn't really just have to do with this. It has to do with some of the other, other code. Um, but I appreciate you kind of walking me through that. That was, a, like I said, it was worded, it was worded in a way that it was a bit confusing. Um, Understood. Um, I almost feel like it to start with the up to 20 units and then explain how many people fit within them. Um, because, okay, I appreciate that. I think, I think that's all my questions. I apologize. I appreciate everyone's patience walking me through all of my questions. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Violani, I thought I could respond now to your question about produce stands before oh, waiting to the afternoon. Um, so yes, I did look at it and um, it should be, um, the intention was to, um, as it's worded in 16, uh, 13, 10, 640, um, okay. up to 15% may be used for the sales of process produced by the stand operator. So the intent really is to support, you know, especially like small farms and support agritourism where they may need a sort of diversity of farm products to be able to maintain viability. So that was kind of the intention of it. So we are allowing processed goods on both types of both produce stands and produce markets. It's right, only, but it's only on temporary produce stands that we're limiting it to non-processed goods. And like, this is strictly out of memory, but is that correct? Yes, right. Yeah. And then for the for the produce stands, there is that caveat that it's um, produced on site, produced by the stand operator, right? So it's in other words, it's not like selling corn chips or something. It's like jams or you know fruit juice or that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that clarity. Mm -hmm. Chair Gordon, I am finally done. <laughs> okay. well, yeah, this is what we had this meeting for. Right? So um, thank you. A lot of good questions and clarifications there. So we do have a scheduled lunch right around 1230. It's about 10 minutes from now. So I don't know if there's another commissioner that has about 10 minutes for the questions or wants to start, and then we can come back to them after. Um, commissioner, <laughs> do you want your hand? I think I only have about 10 minutes worth of questions, but I want to really thank uh, Commissioner Violanti um, for her detailed questions and actually um, got rid of a couple of my questions. So, <laughs> um, so I'll try to go quick. Um, the first question I have is in the zoning code, chapter 1310311, um, agricultural districts. And on page six, um, and I'm going off of the online um, version. Um, is there a definition, this is talking about agritourism, um, is there a definition for agritourism, like what all of the uses that we're lumping into that term? Um, let's see, I, I don't, um, let me look at the definitions quickly. Yeah. I don't. I don't recall off the top of my head if that's there. Important. There is in seven hundred agritourism and education, visitor-oriented mm -hmm. services, events. Can you just give me the page number. And yes, where I can mm -hmm. find it, so I can look at it at the break. You bet. Uh, so it's thirteen ten seven hundred on page five. <clears throat> okay, I'm sorry. I just looked for it again. I couldn't find it. Okay. Well, I will um, take a look at that myself then. 
Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and then the next question I have also um, has, so now I'm in uh, residential districts. Um, page eight of 1310, 321, and I apologize if my page numbers are off, but this is about bed and breakfasts, and it looks like the proposal is to allow um, a B and B with 12 or fewer rooms with an AUP. And then my question is, um, so vacation rentals, for a new vacation rental, we're requiring a public hearing still, which I think is a good idea, going, having gone through that process. Um, but so you, this would be like having a vacation rental with up to 24 people with no public hearing, but vacation rentals of, you know, maybe just a three bedroom vacation rental needs a public hearing. Was this purposeful to like let b and -Bs go without a public hearing or was this something that maybe we should take a second look at? Uh, I, I would say it was, it's purposeful. b and -Bs are um, allowed in the code now. Um, and we, I think the big change was that we went up to 12 rooms instead of, I believe the current code is five. Yeah. Um, uh, and so it was recognition that bed, bed and breakfasts, you know, exist in our community and have a place in our community. And we want to, you know, be able to support, support those, those, those are separate from vacation rentals. Obviously it's a more of a facility than renting out your house or a hosted rental. Right, so I guess I would think like, I guess, so but vacation rentals are getting a public hearing, a B&B &B that could have up to 24 guests, no public hearing. I guess I'm just trying to square that. Like why would one need a public hearing and the other one doesn't? I, I, see, I see your point, I don't, I, I, I don't think there was an intentional um, discrepancy, obviously, there, but okay. um, if you do think that a higher level of review is necessary, that, that might be a tweak. Okay. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't something, <laughs> something I'm missing here. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next set of questions um, are all having to do with Chapter 18. Um, so the first one <clears throat> is the definition of variance on page 10. Um, I didn't see, was the old, was there an old definition of variance that this is replacing? That I just missed seeing the cross out of? I'm not sure. Well, maybe we can look at these during the break and kind of get back to you. Yeah, just my, um, yeah, it, that would be good because I just kind of, um, the way that the variance <clears throat> definition reads now, um, it seems to be a little bit different than what we've used in the past, which was, you know, variances would, uh, would not, you know, confirm a benefit on a property owner not provided to neighboring property, properties, which I also thought was maybe in state law. So. Um, I just wanted to see how it was changed from the way we previously looked at a variance. Okay. And then um, on page 31, um, C, discretionary permit approvals with public hearings. Um, this just read to me a little confusing. Um, and I think that it didn't acknowledge that from my understanding, if a project is in the coastal zone, it can be appealed directly to the Coastal Commission. Um, so I think that it might be worth noting that in the, it just read a little confusing to me so that I, I wouldn't necessarily know that that would be the case if that wasn't, um, wasn't in there. I'm sorry, I'm going really fast because I want to finish before, oh, I got three minutes. Um, the next question I had is on page 38, 
It's 1810-140 and has to do with general plan, plan conformity. So in this section, consistent was replaced with insubstantial conformance. But then at the end of this section, consistent with is defined. And I'm just wondering why not just keep, what was the thinking behind um, replacing consistent with substantial conformance? They, they have a different meaning and it seems like, um, anyway, yeah, if you could explain that, the thinking behind replacing that consistent with substantial conformance. I think it's probably just meant to, um, Consistent is a pretty broad term and can be really uh, subjective. And so I think this is this change in wording is meant to uh, provide a little bit more detail as to kind of what we're talking about and, and drive that point a little bit better than just to say consistent. So if you're gen, you know, if you're if you're mostly meeting the general plan requirements, then that's what we're saying. Okay, that's interesting because the way I read it, I thought that consistent means you have to be consistent with the general plan, but in substantial conformance means you have to be just like you said, in general conforming. So, um, okay, I kind of read it the opposite way that you just explained, which shows how difficult it is when you read all these things. <laughs> it <laughs> right. is. Yeah. I'll I'll ask Annie. Do you have an, Do you this section? I'll be super honest with you. Is written a very long time ago. We obviously, I've looked it over for consistency with the other things that, or conformance with the other things that we've done. Um, but it wasn't around for the initial thinking it through. And so I'll just ask Annie if if she might have any better idea than me. This is eighteen ten one forty. Um. Yeah, I, I know that the previous planning director was in favor of this language as opposed to consistent with. Um, and I mean, I, I I think that her understanding of the term sort of agrees with Commissioner Dan's understanding of sort of, sort of more generally conforms rather than absolutely consistent with. So um, that's that's that, that that's good enough. I mean, um, mm -hmm. but I'll sit on that one. Um, and then I am completely sympathetic to the we did this a long time ago, and I've forgotten because I feel that way about so many sections of this. I'm like Commissioner Violanti, what was it? What did I meet here? Um, okay, um, actually that was it. That was it for questions. So I made it. Um, if I could just note, um, John Rickard um, just wanted to let the commission know that he's available for any questions regarding water and sewer service or other related questions. He'll be available until 2.30 today for questions and then he'll need to leave. So just wanted Can to I ask my one question then that I realized I didn't ask? I'm so sorry to the commission. Can I ask one real quick question yeah, for John? So in in the in the um, Parks and Rec open space, there's a there's a PPF 4.1K. It says continue monitoring seawater intrusion in the Pajaro Valley, SoCal area, and along the north coast. I was just a little confused because the Pajaro Valley is not one of our planning areas, and the seawater intrusion is observed in the Mid County Basin area, which is like by the San Andreas and La Selva planning area. And I just wasn't sure what area was meant there, and I wasn't sure. If someone could, if maybe John could mention what was meant by that particular part of the general plan, because I, I didn't, that's not the area I would have described it as. And maybe it's just, I don't know what the SoCal area means. Um, well, I, I, I don't think that policy changed. I'm not aware of writing any new policies about that, Annie? Is that the same as it's been in the general plan? Um, I would need to look. Um, I'm not sure if that's, um, unless any of my other, uh, our other team members have insights on the particular policy, but I would need to check and see if that was a change or not. Okay, that's fine. It's it seems like it's referring to the groundwater areas as opposed to the planning areas. Um, you know, 
Tahoe Valley, Mid County, and then also North Coast, all all places where we have seen some evidence of seawater intrusion. Yeah, but it, okay, it describes it as the Soquel area. And I just, I think, that, okay, maybe we could look at the wording. Yeah, I mean, I we could change that to mid-county, then it would be consistent with the mid-county groundwater basin. Okay. And can you read me the name, the number of that policy again? Yeah, PPF 4.1K. Okay. And it has an LCP next to it, yeah. Okay. Dang. Um, I um, wanted to mention that Rachel Fatui has also been promoted, and there was a question earlier um, that Matt Machado thought Rachel might want to weigh in on. I don't know if the commission still wanted to hear from Rachel, but um, she's with us as well. Was there a question specific that someone had that we missed or were coming back to? Sorry, I think it was. I think it was uh, Rachel. We were uh, talking about the minimum uh, design storm, or the I think it was minimum. Use the word, and I responded that we use the twenty-five year storm event, and there needed to be clarification of that when we reference minimum design storm standards. Is it the twenty-five year? Was I correct, or am I wrong? It is twenty-five, and that twenty-five can be conveyed both. For within the storm drain pipe as well as if it's safely conveyed in the street. So the minimum required for a pipe is always, well, typically 10 year storm. Oh. There are times when it's more restricted than we require five year storm. But typically most, most locations we require 10 year storm within the pipe. And we allow, the county design criteria allows some flow to go in the street if it doesn't do, I mean, if it's contained within the gutter and doesn't cause impact, like say to the bike lane or the traffic uh, lane. So we, we allow safe conveyance within the, uh, the road or other adjacent to the road conveyances up to 25 years storm. This is countywide. And then we have larger watershed, it can go to 100 years storm. But the minimum, yes, as Matt said, is 25 years strong, and that 25 years strong can be conveyed in the pipe as well as safely yeah. above ground. Okay. And that's for flood control. When we talk about minimum storm, then there are issues. If it's mitigations, then we go for smaller storms. That's different than conveyance. Thank you, Rachel. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question when Alice and I was away from my desk and I came back and Matt was talking, he said, okay. <laughs> so I didn't hear your question, Allison, but I, I'm just following up on what, what Matt said. No, I appreciate it. It just, it was um, broadly worded, so I appreciate you clarifying. Okay. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, we'll go ahead and take a 30-minute lunch break at this time and come back at 1.05 and keep going with our questions. So thank you so much, and we'll see you all in a little bit. Thanks. Great, thank you. See Commissioner Violante. She gave a wave. All right, uh, Commissioner Lazenby. Yes, I'm here. here. All right, yeah, in. Here we go. Oh, I didn't. Yes. Okay. I saw I the wave. <laughs> I know. I just was worried you didn't hear me when I said here. Also, <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Shepard. I'm here. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, and Chair Gordon. Here. All Great. right. Thank you. Okay, now we can continue on, uh, re-adjourn for, um, for the um, question and answer period. There we go. So, Commissioners Lazenby and Shepard, I believe you're the last two, and did either one of you want to start with some questions for um, 
staff. Well, I just have one question. I sure. think because everybody's covered everything else, but this has to do with Pleasure Point. And um, I was I was listening to Patricia Brady, who gave testimony this morning about the Pleasure Points guidelines that they developed in 2018. These were guidelines for building development, which limited it to 30 units per acre plus a density bonus. Now, am I correct that our current requirement for uh, density is 45 to 60 units per acre? Uh, the proposed density for residential flex is 22 to 45 units per acre. Uh, and I see Annie on, maybe she could address the 30 unit max. I, I'm not sure I'm aware of that. Um, yes, there was um, no density maximum provided yeah. in, in the um, pleasure point guiding design principles. Um, the, the vision called for, um, you know, supporting workforce housing within the corridor, which is the 26th Avenue to 41st Avenue um, area along Portola. But um, so, you know, it is, to our mind, it's consistent with the vision of providing workforce housing, but there was no, there's no maximum density specified in that, in that study. Okay, so if I were a developer, and I wanted to build a multifamily building. I, <clears throat> I wouldn't be approved if I said I just wanted to build 30 units per acre, right? Uh, you would be within the range allowed in the new residential flex if that was your zoning. Okay, but if I was commercial, is it 45 to 60? I'm sorry, say that again. In commercial, is it 45 to 60? Uh, commercial yes. commercial allows up to 75% of the floor area to be residential as currently drafted. And, um, and that's allowed at the residential flex zoning. Okay, but the, the density range. 22 to 45. And that's just... Well, I, I thought I put that down for residential, sorry. But I could get approval to build a, a development in Pleasure Point, is that correct? You Well, you, you would need to be consistent with the zoning on the property and then yes, you could get a permit. Right, okay. Well, thank you, that answers that. I have one comment. Going back to Highway 1 and the, and the absence of trees along Highway 1 there, in Watsonville, we have a Watsonville Wetlands Watch, and they have a whole forest of trees, and they're giving them away, and they're coming out and planting them. And they're going to plant them in my front yard, well, one in my front yard. and. I, I could check with them and see if they were help out in reforesting Highway 1 in that section. That's just that, a comment. <laughs> that would be that would be that would be lovely. It would certainly take some coordinate coordination with Caltrans. Largely we're talking about their right of way. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And that's that's it for me. Okay, well, um, I'm ready to go. Yes, please, Commissioner Shepard, go ahead. Thank you. So first of all, let me ask a follow-up question about the, um, the Safe Pleasure Point design guidelines. I thought that had been adopted to by the supervisor, so wouldn't that govern the density to some extent in the Pleasure Point design district? Because we've always deferred to it in other rule changes. The Pleasure Point corridor vision and guiding principles were accepted by the board in 20, um, 2018 as a, a study. Mm -hmm. And um, 
the direction was to analyze to to analyze um, analyze impacts within the EIR um, and to include provisions in the um, sustainability update. Um, which largely is what has is happening here. There are a um, couple policies and couple implementation strategies that refer to the, the vision um, and to the Portola Drive streetscape concepts, and then um, pieces of the design guidelines that are relevant for the commercial corridor are actually included as an appendix B in the proposed county design guidelines. So they didn't adopt that plan, um, but it got, it, you know, pieces of it got roped into the sustainability update for implementation. Okay. Well, my um, questions, um, basically, could you go over briefly where we have ended up on the conversion of ag land? I know you removed a good deal of the language about pro specific, about projects in general, but where exactly are we ending up? Annie, maybe you could help with this one. Yeah, maybe you can just read the final paragraph because I had the original and I had what you said you were going to do, but I just want it. And you said that you were still working on it. So where where we ended up? Um, certainly. Let me. Um, I know we've had several replacement pages, so I believe that is um, in um, one of our replacement page uh, documents. And the other thing, um, while she's looking for that, just to keep things moving along, my other question is, there was a question that referred to a table of specific measures um, for the VMT mitigation measures on a table, but I know, in other words, what you were going to suggest um, in terms of um, policy, but I never did find them on the table. There wasn't anything there. Do you know what I'm talking about? Am I being too vague? Um, the mitigation measures for traffic per VMT. Yeah. You, you referred to a table. I went to the table, but I didn't see anything. But one thing at a time. Sorry, Annie, I didn't mean to. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I somehow had that up on my screen and it disappeared. So I need to <laughs> pull it back up again. So um, just bear with me. Um, Okay, so um, this was provided um, in the um, replacement pages, the general plan replacement pages that were um, provided for the August 24th hearing. And um, this is um, on page uh, 5-34 of the general plan. And this is um, policy, um, Let's see. Well, tell you one, what, can you uh, send that page to me? Um, sure, but I, probably the rest of the commission would like to hear it too. So I'll, I'll read it and then I can certainly um, forward okay. it. Um, so let's see, this is policy AR, ARC 1.3.1. And there was um, language previously regarding um, um, conversion of agricultural land. And there was a provision um, that allowed for conversion of, of um, CA land to accommodate a public quasi-public use. Um, and that was deleted um, from the general plan so that, um, and this was in response to concerns from your commission as well as the Coastal Commission. Um, so that was um, deleted from the general plan that was a provision that had been added that was new language. So that's no longer um, included in the general plan language. 
So are we back to what it said originally? Yes. So basically there is an existing provision that allows um, conversion of ag land only when it's been determined that the ag agricultural land is no longer viable. So that that is still um, a policy in the code in the general plan um, that provides a process for converting ag land. Um, so, so there's no change. Right. Regarding right. So that that sort of new language that have been added about allowing conversion of ag land for a public facility use is no longer in the general plan as it's proposed. Okay. And then my next question is why is why was the thinking to enfold all trail planning into the parks program? All the other counties that I'm familiar with involve conceive of trails, in other words, the way people can get around by bike, by foot, by horse, by bicycle, whatever, as an important part of circulation and accessibility and mobility. And we have a lot of, we still have a lot of like quarries that are now being mitigated um, and restored. In my district, there's currently two vacant quarries with future land uses. And the plan has always been that at that time, whether they end up being residential or parks or public or whatever, that there would be trail plans for them. And there's also long been the idea that people should be able to get around um, by using trail access. And so I have always thought that when there's a big development plan, um, people, there is a trail access plan. Sorry, I need to turn that off. And it was in it was in the circulation. It was moved from circulation to parks. That's a fairly big step. It just goes to show that we don't have a trails plan. Most other counties in the Bay Area have extensive ones. Can you just tell me your thinking? Yeah, so I believe we talked about this at a couple of meetings ago, um, and this was done in coordination with the Parks Department, who actually manages the trails planning process. Um, they felt it would be better to have policies related to trails specifically within uh, the parks section of the parks and public facilities element. Um, there are still some references in the general plan in Chapter 5 to trails. Um, and it doesn't preclude us planning for asking for trail development in the uh, process of approving a discretionary approval of a, um, or as a mitigation for a development. Well, that's really what I want to know. For example, the quarries are hundred, several hundred and three or 400 acres. In 20 years, that'll be available for development. The plan is already always to have trail easements. And as you know, the county holds trail easements for the public. And as you know, the public is very interested in circulating around on, on trails. So what you're saying is the Parks Department will continue to deal with park trail development in the parks, but outside the parks to connect communities, that would be an issue, that would be something in the planning department still? Trail uh, dedications, for example? It would be a combination of parks, public works, and planning. Uh, working on facilitating a new trail development. Well, let me be more specific. There's two quarries. That's my example. They're not going to be parks. So why would park would if parks wasn't involved because it wasn't going to be a park? If they were on, if the trail ends up being through or on a public right of way or um, something that would be considered like a protected bike lane and protected paths, and that would be under the supervision of uh, public works and planning. Yes, and that's specifically, these are blank canvases. We have four empty quarries, all of which are under getting, you know, getting revegetated and so on. They're, they're not parks, and at some point we'll be developing them, and I wanted to make sure as a lot of people in their communities do, that people can still cross that part of the planning would involve public access in the form of trails. So trails don't necessarily mean park trails. That's my point. Right. In the in the access and circulation or access mobility element, we refer to those as often as class four facilities or um, uh, protected facilities where people can walk and bike off of the street. Um, so they're not sidewalks. We don't use the term trails as much, um, but that kind of facility would be in line with the ATP, the Active Transportation Plan, as well as uh, VMT mitigation for development. 
Okay. Then my other question specifically is we talked we talked about let's see um, strategies in ARC 3.3 and 3.3K were added um, about um, establishing a mitigation bank uh, to offset riparian corridors. Yes. Is that enough of a reference. Um, I thought that mitigation banks were being looked at a little more carefully because they have so far been created by private trusts or tr nonprofits that are set up and there's some question about how effective they are in being administered. Um, um, you know, the, this policy was actually requested or implementation strategy was suggested um, by uh, the watershed folks at the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and because we didn't have any reference to mitigation banks in the general plan at all, really, um, we thought it was a good a good suggestion to allow for that possibility um, if if it comes up. However, it's not it is you know not the only way to mitigate, and every development will have to mitigate their impacts um, to wetlands and other riparian areas. Okay, because there's been a lot of concern on the on the, you know, in the special district of which is part of the fifth district with the Sand Park when we have mitigation banks, there's a question of, are they being kept up? Yeah, um, there, there are challenges. Hand, so there's no monitoring of what's going on there and stuff. So, you know, are, are they, is it really, it's a great concept. Does it really work? And I just wanted to say, don't, I hate to see the county saying, oh, not a problem, we'll have a mitigation bank and get set up and no one ever really sees what's going on there. Yeah, I agree. There's been issues with some mitigation banks. They need to be set up correctly. They need to have an agency that um, monitors them. And, um, you know, I think that those concerns, it's still a very valid measure because it's often... Not disagreeing with that, but just clearly yeah, you are aware that it would have to be more elaborately set up. Your correctly plan. set up. Thank you. And the other big one is, I am still quite a little not quite getting what what changes, the changes proposed, what the Planning Commission hears and doesn't hear. I think the Planning Commission is a really vital thing for the community because it's the only place that we have people who don't work for the Planning Department, are not part of the infrastructure, um, kind of looking at what's going on. And it's a great place for the public to have an opportunity to weigh in. Um, and sometimes, as we all know, the public doesn't get involved until there is a planning commission hearing. So I am not quite clear when it sounds like, aside from senior housing, um, you know, non-housing projects won't be heard anymore by the planning commission. So my question is, we have heard pros um, proposals for libraries, auditoriums, an animal shelters, parks. I do not... Uh, are, I want to be clear if I'm really understanding what are you limit what are the significant changes to what you are proposing for planning commission overview it seems like it's a lot and I would like to hear your rationale cuz I don't see any reason to cut down the role of the planning commission frankly and if you leave everything much more to the it you could say well it's okay because anybody can um appeal the zoning administrator, but that's a tremendous burden of cost and organization for the average citizen. And I don't see why, I, I would like to understand better why you're proposing to reduce the role of the planning commission significantly. Well, I, I'll just start off by saying that- Unless I'm not understanding it right. Which there's is no fair. intent, there's no intent to reduce the role of the planning commission significantly. Um, there, uh, there was a, in the code modernization project, there's really a, um, there's a, a lot of smaller types of uses that don't have impacts that require public hearings. And so a review of all of the kind of level of use permits was done across, across the board um, to help to streamline 
development where, where that's appropriate and to keep higher level uh, poly, you know, projects that kind of challenge our policies and keep that kind of thing at, at the planning commission um, as well as legislative matters. Um, so, so, so it's about right sizing the process for the type of development. Um, and I see Daisy, so I know she's got a lot of good things to say on this and I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to her. Sure, yeah, thanks Stephanie. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, one um, issue that we've noticed um, uh, in relation to what the Planning Commission currently reviews is that it's it's pretty different from other jurisdictions of this size. Um, so actually, we did take a look at Monterey County as well as Marin County and Sonoma County, which are all um, you know, similar to Santa Cruz County in certain ways. Um, and for all of those counties, um, the Planning Commission only reviews um, policy matters, um, appeals, and projects that have um, significant impacts of some kind or um, uh, or set some kind of new precedent uh, for like a new type of project or a new um, issue that is being dealt with. Um, uh, uh, and that's different from the plan from um, Santa Cruz County where currently the Planning Commission is the standard um, you know re reviewer for many types of projects, including um, you know projects that, meet um, all of the county's objective standards, um, aren't different from other, you know, uh, projects that, we've, that you've seen before. Um, so the, uh, one of the ideas here is to make sure that your commission is really um, getting the chance to focus on policy matters um, and more big picture um, decision making. Um, and that uh, smaller projects or projects that don't have um, impacts or aren't setting new precedents are, you know, heard at the zoning administrator level and may be elevated up to the planning commission level if, if appropriate. Um, um, and there's certain types of projects that will, or certain types of reviews that will still be at the planning commission. You know, for instance, you'll still be looking at rezones, um, general plan amendments, um, subdivisions of more than five sites, um, and then certain types of projects. So, um, for instance, certain types of commercial uses, um, certain types of agricultural uses, um, uh, and uh, uh, certain types of uh, and, and and certain types of uses in residential zones, and all of the uses that are for uh, planning commission review as proposed um, in the sustainability update are those uses that may have some special impacts that need to be you know looked at more carefully. But it does say. Um, on specifically that all non-residential projects would be reviewed at the zoning administrator or lower. Now, all non-residential projects is a huge category, usually with very significant impacts on their communities. I, well, this isn't a part to rate recommendations, but that's just a blanket change that I don't think is merited. We, we at this, first of all, a lot of people don't even find out anything till after the zoning ministry level, and it'll be all in, all done by that point. There's often EIRs on many of these projects that people don't even know about till it gets to the planning commission level. I do not think this is a, real, a particularly um, public serving change to the zoning administrator or lower. Also, it's subject to interpretation. I, I just don't agree with it, but. I'll say that later. I just wanted okay. to hear your logic, and I understand that you were looking at a very high level. And I just don't happen to think it's right okay. And, and let me just um, say one thing um, regarding. I think you were maybe looking at the staff report um, regarding yeah. the yeah regarding that statement about the non-residential uses. So during the staff presentation on the twenty fourth, I did note that there is an error in that portion of the staff report. So. Um, there are there are some uses, um, non commercial or non residential uses that will still be seen at the planning commission level, and that's borne out in all of the the detail in the use charts. Um, and so, some examples are uh, medical clinics, um, auto sales, um, transit stations, um, various types of agricultural uses. 
um, airstrips. Um, so those are sort of examples of the kind of types of, of projects that that um, are still uh, proposed to be reviewed at the planning commission level. Just to just to give you some um, oh, um, more nuance there. Once again, can you give me any more detail then about what is included? What about auditoriums, animal parks, recreational vehicle parks? We had something that didn't come to fruition, but we were looking at a huge, enormous um, mountain bike park. It didn't actually come to that, but it, if it, it under in my understanding, that was of huge community concern here, both pro and con. Would that have been heard by the Planning Commission? Um, you know, it's going to depend on the zone district, and you need to look at the use chart for the zone district to determine what level of review would be required. Um, but I don't believe that RV parks are generally not, not proposed not for RV. the planning commission level review. No, I'm sorry. That wasn't an RV park. It was proposed a very large mountain biking park in a, um, it was actually in Mount Hermon. It didn't go anywhere, so it's a few years ago. I might as well mention names. They wanted to take most of their, a good deal of their open space and convert it to a mountain bike park. Now, what so so if that, that have been heard? Yeah. Well, if it wasn't something that would have been heard at the planning commission level to begin with, mm -hmm. um, if it's a controversial project, but there's a lot of public input um, on it, then uh, what, what might happen is it might be heard at the zoning administrator level and be appealed, or um, the the um, CDI director or assistant director might make a call to elevate it to the planning commission level to begin with, just due to the controversial nature of the project. Yeah, okay. The only problem I still see with that is, you all know what's going on at the zoning commission, but at the zoning administrator, 99.8% of the citizens in the county pay no attention to it, hardly know it exists till they come up against it, but certainly don't follow its agenda. So something could pass that way and they wouldn't know about it. In fact, that's more normal. Well, yeah. So the actually the um, outreach that occurs for the zoning administrator is uh, very similar to the outreach that occurs for the planning commission. There's a, a postcard notice that goes out to all residents within at least 300 feet of affected properties um, in, either, in either case. Um, so there is a uh, notification to neighbors uh, for zoning administrator here. Well, I, I understand and, and you know, I, I get that. Unfortunately, in the rural areas, there could be three neighbors within 300 feet, but thousands of people is very much affected. So anyway, I just wanted to know, I, I know I just don't agree with that, but that's, that's okay. Let's see. What other questions do I have? Uh, no, those were my questions. Thank you very much. Okay. I mean, that, that's what I wanted clarification on, which I think is the is the idea here. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Appreciate that, um, all the commissioners. I had two questions that I missed. <clears throat> Maybe it's one, uh, but it's a clarifying one. In the Pleasure Point Community Design Guidelines, page B five, um, it states that there's first. Oh, well, now I put it away, but it's um, along the lines of like this, there's a certain high limit, no exceptions, not allowed. And I wanted to understand the intent of that. Um, I assume it means like through a variance or something, but um, I just want to be clear that I don't think we can limit like density bonus and things like that, that are state law. Um, and just wanted to clarify the intent of that. And if we understand if that language will hold up or if it should be changed in order to accommodate what the intent was. Could you um, direct us to the yeah. language you're talking about? Yep. Sorry, let me. It's okay. In the Pleasure Point Community Design Guidelines. So in the general plan or design guidelines and it's Appendix B. Thank you. And then page B5. And it's item F, and it states, require buildings in the corridor to respect the existing height limit with no exceptions and minimize the appearance of height through setbacks, upper story, step backs, and articulated frontages. And um, yeah, so my question there, limit with, uh, respect existing height limit with no exceptions, and I didn't understand if that was... 
um, go ahead, Annie. <clears throat> oh, okay. um, so um, that was part of the, um, when we went through the process, the community was, you know, felt very strongly about sort of limiting the height. So, so we retained that language, um, but it, it does not change the fact that under state law density bonus, you can request a, um, you know, a variation to the development standards or where it would, you know, limit the density proposed. So, um, so that, that, you know, that does not, a density bonus, you know, if they would qualify for height limit, they could still get one under, under state law and our density bonus provisions. Okay, thank you. That's what I had figured. And, and my assumption was that, you know, this is, we're not gonna maybe allow fair, like um, arbitrary variances, but the density bonus, you know, the benefit is you're you're getting the public benefit of affordable housing and that's why you get the bonus height. Um, so, okay, that makes sense. And I appreciate that. No, I, uh, Commissioner or Chair Corbin, I did yeah. have one more question. Sure, please go. Um, about changing the parking regulations to eliminate parking spaces to encourage less parking, um, less spaces for cars and therefore try and have less cars based on the idea that people would bike or take the bus. You have to help me out here because you know we haven't had one for a few years, but given climate change, we'll probably have some severe winters too. And I just don't see how people are gonna walk or bicycle in the middle of winter in the same way they're gonna want to use a a car or the bus. Unfortunately, the bus system has still a lot of ways to go. For example, they continued, they just discontinued some of their service to La Selva Beach. So stuff like that happens all the time. So um, do you really see that as a viable alternative? Uh, honestly, I just don't understand. You know, I always try to come back to the concept here that the general plan is a 20 year plan. It's meant to lay out a, a vision. Um, uh, we, we, we understand that there's going to be aspects of these policies that are appropriate when certain conditions are in place. And so we, we hear what the commission is saying regarding that, but without that, 20 year vision um, and laying the policy foundation for um, taking those steps to make our communities more walkable and to support transit, um, then we're, we're kind of nowhere in addressing community needs in the future and greenhouse gases in the future and the climate change that the OR3 folks were talking about this morning. So the policy basis here is really, really important. Um, and I see Annie East, so I'll ask her if she has follow-up comments. Yeah, I mean, I, I really appreciate that perspective on the long view here, being that it is a 20-year plan. Um, and that in 20 years, there's a lot of things that can change it in technology. Um, for example, more and more people are using electric bicycles. Uh, which makes it much easier to to ride and get somewhere very quickly. I, I'm um, sorry, I, I dropped off for some reason. Did anybody else drop off or just me? Just me. We're we're all here. Okay, I, I didn't hear what you just said. <laughs> okay, did you ask, or can I ask you, did you hear what Stephanie had said or was? I, I didn't, I apologize. It, but my connection dropped and then it said connecting and connected back up. Okay. Well, I uh, my my biggest uh, statement here is that the general plan is a, a long term document. It's a twenty year plan, um, uh, and it presents a vision for our communities. Um, does not mean that every aspect and every policy is implementable um, all at the same time. We do recognize that. Um, we need improvements in, in transit and that all these different components work together to really um, uh, create those more walkable communities that we need in the future in order to kind of accommodate the housing that we need to accommodate, address climate change, 
um, help people get around without being clogged up on Highway 1. Um, so it's important to keep, keep your eye on what the general plan does, which sets a policy basis, and then I'll let Anais follow up. Well, I'm, can I just comment? I, I do think that's useful and very thoughtful, but can you put some language in this document that says what you just said? Because when I have read bits of it to my neighbors and friends, that's a, they, they don't certainly don't get that, and obviously I didn't, because they think this is what's going to happen in the next five years. Because it reads that way. Okay, maybe is perhaps there's a motion the commissioner would like to make to that end, but I think that it's the document's pretty clear that it's a 20 year plan and vision. Okay. Commissioner Gordon, I think, pardon me, Chair Gordon, I have a question I realized I forgot as well. Do you mind if I ask or did you have a second? You said I wasn't sure if you just had the one. Yeah, uh, thank you. I did only have one after all. So please, I think it'd be a great time to ask any follow up questions that we missed. So go for it. Thank you. I'll be really brief. I just want to know if the section of the code is new or not. I was a little unclear from the text box. Um, it's um, it's in that same section that I, I last, last talked about, which is the 1310-689. It's talking about um, visitors and it's talking about a calculation uh, that they're talking about. It's page four. Um, it's talking about day use guests, guests and it's talking about the ability to consolidate them into a particular part of the year if they're not if they're not open year round. And I just was unclear from the the narrative whether or not this was already in our code or if this was a change from our previous code. Um, I'm sorry. Tell me the subsection again, please. Yeah, I apologize. Let me just pull up. Um, so it's 1310-689-C6. C6, okay. So it's it's right after that use chart that I was talking about, the table with the visitor serving accommodations. Um, it has to do with day use guests and limited visitor accommodation. And it's talking about the fact that if a site isn't open year round, they have the right to kind of compress, they're allowed to take their entire year's allocation and kind of compress them into the duration that they're open. And I just was unclear from the narrative that's in the box if this was mm -hmm. a new, new code or if it was like just being, because the, the narrative makes it just a little unclear. So if I don't mind, if, if someone could just clarify for me, was this new or is this just? Um, uh, I'll look at the code just to um, just to make sure that that we get you the right answer. Or it looks like Natisha's here and can provide the answer. Yeah. So I believe this section of the code. We can double check on this, but I believe the section of the code was taken from the existing calculation from the uh, the Parks and Recreation District uh, visitor uses accommod uh, visitor <laughs> accommodations calculation. And so what this does is just kind of move it to this section. And we did also simplify it because there were some internal calculations that staff were using to sort of um, make these determinations as well. So this is um, kind of moved from the PF district calculations and also somewhat updated to kind of make it a little bit uh, simpler. But this concept is something already in our code, which is if you have a year long allocation, you can compress it into the time that Correct. opens. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that clarity. And I had just one more question, which is, how does this go to the board? Um, just the way it came to us in pieces and when? Um, so based on the commission's recommended recommendation and any um, motions to change, um, we would provide new versions of the code. Um, the general plan will um, largely be available the, the way it is with, of course, any changes. The code sections are being turned into ordinances because the um, supervisors will ad adopt an ordinance. So um, we'll have track changes versions for them to, to show them and the community a little bit more clearly. Um, and then there'll be clean copies of ordinances um, largely organized by the chapter or title um, that is being amended. And um, that way they can adopt ordinances that then go into effect. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions, last minute questions, Commissioner Dan or Lisa Lee? Okay. Okay, so now we get to the tricky part. We gotta figure out how to discuss in an organized fashion <clears throat> and go through some, hopefully some motions today. Uh, one other housekeeping thing, I think I missed a break mention around 2.30 today, um, 10 minutes, and then um, hopefully we can get through a lot today. And if we don't, we'll at the end discuss potentially a continuance if needed. Um, I don't know if we have a hard stop time. None of us have discussed that, but I would say let's keep going along and figure that out later. Um, any thoughts on <clears throat> discussion? I can tell you what I had planned. However, you know, I would love input since it's a little bit complicated. Um, and I go, Commissioner Dan, you, you've got the plan. What do you think? Um, so what I <clears throat> do is turn off my phone so I'm not distracted. Um, so what I am actually ready to um, go through and start making motions. And what I can do is um, put up um, some amendments that Commissioner Violante and I worked on and go by each chapter. And then uh, we can go from there. So, um, so I can do one of two things. I can share my screen or I can send our first document to Jocelyn who can then put it up on the screen. We've written everything out um, to make it easy for our fellow commissioners to digest. So let me know. I've never shared my screen in a public meeting like this, but I'm, I'm happy to give it a try. Is there a, I don't know if there's a problem with that, with CTV or what? Oh, Jocelyn, I can't see you. Um, I am not sure if you can. Um, I think you could shoot them over to- um, Should I send one it to of you? You could. I think it might be better to send it over to one of Stephanie's staff just so that I can be on here and also not be sharing the screen at the same time. What do you think, Stephanie? Because I think you guys can share your screen since you are panelists right now. Oh, I see. And Rachel doesn't have the little green share screen no, thing did. at the bottom. I do have that. Okay. Then I would think she could try. Okay, I'll try. So just to be really clear, I think we're going to make some, we're going to have discussion on some, some topics. Um, hopefully, you know. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to, so does everybody see my screen here? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah. Um, make a motion. So the motion okay. is to move for the built environment general plan to move the staff recommendation with the following changes. Are you making a motion right now? Or are I'm you making a motion right now. For, okay. And then if it gets a second, we can discuss. Uh, Rachel, what are we looking at? Are We're looking at um, some suggested amendments to the staff recommendation that if I get a second to the motion, we can discuss. I so second. are the underlines what you're suggesting? I'll explain everything once I get a second. <laughs> oh, I'll second it. Okay. So um, what what we've done here is we've just taken the built environment chapter and then we are accepting all the staff recommendations with the following amendments and the following pages <clears throat> um, go over those amendments and what they are. So what I can do is go through them one by one and explain and then if other commissioners would like to um, add to this, um, myself in the second can accept or not accept. Okay. Who seconded? I didn't hear that. Me, Renee. Okay, thank you. And then, you know, we can't, yeah, okay. Rachel, good. do you, so you want to do them? So that, yeah, so yeah, they can so the Yes, yeah, yeah. so absolutely, I have to scroll through it. Um, and so this first paragraph is just saying that if uh, these are passed by the Planning Commission for a recommendation to the board that any changes should be incorporated directly into the general plan or zoning code or other draft documents prior to the issuance of the board agenda, just so that they're incorporated actually into the plan. Um, and that's for every motion I'll make. 
So the first one <clears throat> is, um, well, I don't know if you guys just want to read. I don't, I don't like reading things when people can just read them themselves. And if you just have questions, we can ask, um, we can answer any question. But this one. I think uh, it's a little tricky when we have people that maybe don't have video. Just my only comment, you know, maybe public that doesn't have video. Um, you can't really see what we're doing. So someone might have to read it at some point. Well, I don't know that we need she I, I would argue I would suggest if the chair is open to it that perhaps Ms. Dan could give a Commissioner Dan could give a summary of what it's about if you want her to give a verbal presentation. I agree that I think reading it could be confusing in general since there's strike out and underline. Um, but if but if but if Chair Gordon would like there to be some sort of verbal explanation, I would argue that it I would suggest that um, that a summary might be better than, than reading. Yeah, I'd appreciate it. However, you know, because I'm not sure if these things you've already talked about in your questions or what they are. So, I, you know, and some I have talked about, about and some okay. some I haven't. This one's just real general. Um, as you can see, it's just um, adding some specific language about water supply during drought years. Um, some added detail about what road capacity means. Um, the next one um, is uh, striking the word prime so that agricultural land stands on its own. And then the third part of that policy is um, just adding, adding some specific language. So the <clears throat> adding, adding specificity here. Um, the next policy is about um, growth rate, and this just instead of using the word encourage, replaces encourage with require, since it's it's in my view, our view, it's more objective um, that way. And this just specifies that we're talking about urban development to be located within the USL and RSL so that it just doesn't say development in general. <clears throat> the next policy, again, replaces encourage with require and specifies we're talking about urban, residential, commercial, industrial development. The next policy is just specifying that with regard to annexation, we're talking about non-agriculturally designated land. So it's just adding some greater specificity to protect ag land. The next policy, <clears throat> I apologize. I have to think a little bit because um, I have to remember what I was talking about here. So this one, we right. were saying that you have to have the infrastructure um, at, uh, for, for developments, for transportation, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Allison. Yeah, I, these I are really all appreciate all the greater specificity. I think that's what was needed. So go on. Thank you. Yeah, and I want to be, these. this was a, both Commissioner Violante and I worked on these together. So, um, Okay, and so again, it's um, instead of evaluate the adequacy, we're saying require adequate infrastructure and adding in some language um, about protecting adjacent neighborhoods. The next section is just adding, instead of replacing the word consider with facilitate. So we facilitate pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure. And then this policy, as you can see, is adding in specificity for the uses as far as um, urban ag. The next policy is about Cabrillo College and UCSC long range plannings. Uh, planning efforts and um, so we added a sentence about uh, the community protecting the community's housing stock there. So now moving on to residential land use. 
Okay, this is about making sure that we um, include and are cognizant of including um, density bonuses, since that's such a big part of our development these days. Can I ask um, a question on this one? Sure. Provide urban and residential land use designations designation at a range of building intensities inclusive of any density bonus increases. So is this suggesting a, a change to the densities that are proposed? No, I think that it's just suggesting that we um, take into account um, the density bonus when we're looking at uh, the um, how many units are allowed, that we make sure we also say, okay, and that's also inclusive of what's allowed with a density bonus. So that is transparent to folks that we know um, actually how many units are actually going to go into an area. In my so, view, it just creates transparency. Okay. So I guess my, just to really drill down, because you've made a motion on these and I want to make sure I understand them really well. Um, Chair, just to, sorry yeah, to go ahead. add one thing that we might have a concern with this density bonus is state law. Um, and so if you, if we try to limit it to any density range, um, we could, we could come up against state law and state law would override. So I but think I don't we think want to discuss this right. more. That's not what this is doing though, <clears throat> in my opinion. Um, so I do understand that. And I know that density bonuses are allowed by state law, but I, that's, I don't think that we're trying to um, limit that or try to get around that. It's more about um making sure that we are inclusive of the density bonuses um when we're contemplating development on a parcel that's going to use a density bonus Does that make so sense? let me give a quick example of why i feel like this is going to cause confusion <laughs> we use a density bonus to get <clears throat> three stories extra in height and 80% moderate, in, or excuse me, low income and 20% moderate income, and it creates a form-based density. That is one option with a state density bonus, which is exclusive of any density. So my question is, how does this relate when state bills actually can, and in fact, eliminate density? Are we, are we kind of muddying the water there? I just want to be really clear. I'm not really sure I understand stand the intent of what you're going for. So it's hard to. Well, I guess you could look at it the other way too. If you're saying <clears throat> that we have the RF district that is 40 units an acre, it's actually more than 40 units an acre if you use a density bonus, right? So it's actually not transparent to say that RF is 40 units an acre because is in fact, with a density bonus, it's gonna be a lot more dense. And so what I'm saying here is that, or we're saying is that, um, is that uh, we should just be transparent about what the actual density is. I'm not opposed to the RF district. You'll see when we get to the zoning code, I'm not making any, I'm very supportive of the RF district. But, but I think that we have to be transparent about when we say the RF district is 40 units an acre, it's actually not 40 units an acre. It's actually more dense than that. Could you simply leave it at as is and add language? or another category with density bonus and show that additionally. Yes, so yes. you've got both things available and people can see what it is. And if they take a density bonus, what they'll get. I think that's what you want to show. We may be able to specify that density bonuses may in increase so the, the range from, from what's given in the range because of the density bonus program. Yeah, Stephanie, I guess I, my question to you, I mean, he, listening to Chair Gordon and, and, and Commissioner Dan and obviously ha having worked on these, is, I guess I'm struggling and perhaps you could explain to me how using the word inclusive would be seen as bumping up against state regulations. And if there is a recommended language change, I'd be curious to hear it because um, 
I don't see this being as exclusive to something. And I, I agree with Commissioner Shepard that um, by including more information seems better. I mean, that seems that seems obviously you've heard that that was the objective of this language um, is to be more transparent. And if you have a thought on how now that you know the objective is obviously to be more transparent, not to be exclusive. If you have a, a small language change, obviously yeah, we're just, gonna. I, I'd like to let Commissioner Gang continue through these so we can hear all of them. Um, maybe you could think on if there's a small language change that you would recommend, but because I I see this as the objective, obviously being transparency to the public. It's not meant to limit the densities in any way, shape, or form. Um, so maybe you could think on that, and if you have known the objective, because I I don't see this as precluding anything, but if you feel it precludes something, I'd be curious to hear from you working in council on why, we, it, why it does that so we can move on in the meantime, and maybe you can come back to us before we actually vote. I think we should address Ms. Chair Cork Warden's concern if we show both what it is and what it will be with density that meets his, uh, you know, what he brought up. I agree, and I don't think this precludes that from happening, but I want to be cognizant of the fact that staff is here because they're experts. And uh, I want to let them think on it before we vote in case, like I said, if council or staff has a recommendation, I'd like to let Commissioner Dan continue. Um, yes. We can keep going, but if by the time we vote, um, Ms. Hansen or council has recommended language changes, I'd, 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 I'd like to hear them. So I'd like to let Commissioner Dan continue. Yeah, we're open to that. And, um, you know, I can change the language directly into the document too, so it's clear. Um, and yeah, we're open to that. Um, so moving on. So re residential and public land uses on commercial property. Um, Can you go up one? I think we skipped Oh, that. did I skip this one? I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, this also um, is about infrastructure requirements, which um, we've had issues with um, in various districts. Um, so this is just adding and available at the time of occupancy. Um, which is just adding specificity. Um, so this next one, Commissioner Violante, do you want to talk about this one? Sure. So this has to do, I think it speaks to what Commissioner Gordon was speaking about earlier, but also preserving, and, and Ms. Hansen spoke to afterwards, was we want to preserve commercial um, space in, in the county. And so we don't, we want to ensure that we're not ending up with single story residential developments. Um, for 75% of the structure. I know that it requires them to either put the parking underground, but we would like to see this be only in multi-story development so that we still preserve commercial um, to be forward facing to the public. And so we'd like to see it where we only have this available when we have multi-story developments where you're having um, residential above commercial so that we're still preserving a front facing commercial um, area. And then the next one is um, about permanent room housing. And so it's just adding some specific language about making sure that the inclusionary housing requirements apply to those when, when applicable. Um, and the next one is about drive-throughs. And so this is actually a substantial change from what was, which didn't allow drive-throughs. And so what we're doing is just uh, um, adding in limited to kind of um, pay respects to the fact that this is a, a major change. And actually, I think it was a very, very good policy not to just allow um, a gazillion drive-throughs. Um, so, but still allowing them now. <laughs> so. Can you go up to the one right above? I apologize. The Sure. You add, you add, add inclusion, or excuse me, at the end, with an approved use permit and inclusionary housing requirements. So what is that? What that is just that means there? like if, if the permanent room housing um, project is large enough to require um, inclusionary housing requirements, then they should have to do that. Okay. And they're gonna be affordable by design anyway, but <laughs> I don't know how many projects we're gonna get. <laughs> For okay. PRH, but thank you. Okay, the next one 
The next one is just adding language to take into account uh, scale and size of a dis uh, the distinct um, neighborhood for a new development, and then added some language about shading adjacent properties um, when setbacks and landscaping. Um, the next one is replacing possible with required with regard to um, using using objective standards. Sorry, you gotta go back one more. Going pretty quick and it's hard to read through all this while you're um, talking. So I, I but, yeah, um, yeah. I'm just one behind you here. So you've added development towards the end of this. This is neighborhood scale, size, and context. Mm -hmm. Essentially new development skipping down should provide appropriate building massing so as not to overwhelm or primarily shade adjacent properties, including appropriate setbacks and adequate and maintained landscape buffering to reduce perception of bulk and height. So you've added the underlying part there, right? Yeah. On your own. yeah. The so underlying is what we've added, yes. So, uh, so as not to overwhelm or primarily, what is primarily shade adjacent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. I struggled with which word to use there. Um, the, the thought process there was to try to use a word to indicate that the, the, the objective here is to um, new development. Obviously, is going to have an impact on our neighbors, but we don't want the new development to completely shade adjacent properties or over or um, you know shade a, a neighbor so much that you know it's causing a an impact that could otherwise be avoided with a different design okay and then uh, including appropriate setbacks and adequate maintained uh, landscape you're just saying meet the setbacks and the landscape requirements essentially Essentially, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. And so the last two are about disadvantaged communities. And the addition here is including um, a sentence or a phrase <clears throat> to include the loss of open space or access to parkland or community gardens to make sure that those communities are protected with their open space. All right, leave it up there for a second. And then the next one is also about disadvantaged communities and is similar and includes um, development. And I add, and we added, including the addition of parks and open space in these disadvantaged communities. And then um, in addition to the other things listed. And then, the last two items um, is about um, services for fringe and island communities. And so yes, instead of support, um, we are suggesting that the wording be evaluate where appropriate. Um, and then we specify non-agricultural land with regard to annexations. So I think it's just, um, emphasizing what the intent already is with this policy and being more specific. And then the last item is that when the sustainability plan comes before the board, that we would suggest adding a policy to encourage that surface parking lots and commercial developments be covered with solar. And so that's that. And then, so the way we're kind of thinking is if, um, there's other commissioners that have other items that fall under the general plan built environment that they could offer them, or we could just take this separately, take a vote on it, and then other commissioners could make their own motions on the built environment. Uh, I think, well, it's a good question. Um, I'd be for voting other, on it. We have a motion in a second. How many other, do any other commissioners wanna make any adjustments or additions to the built environment. I have two things, but. Okay, um, why don't you go ahead and then we'll see if the, um, yeah. 
Mm, so myself and the seconder agrees with them. Great. So the commercial mixed use requirement, which I mentioned or had a question about at the start, reducing to 15% instead of 25, um, because our buildings got bigger, essentially we've, we have, a, we have created more commercial space than what we originally anticipated and recognizing that commercial space adds cost to rents the same way that parking does reducing commercial space only reduces cost of rents and you know to that effect i tried to see if we could reduce it to 15 percent um and like i said based on the current fars that is equivalent to or really closely equivalent to what was in the original plan before the fars were changed so it's no loss of commercial space it's just a reorganization of the percentages Um, it's the same amount of so like what's the so if you're making an amendment to this, what would the language be? No, uh, okay, yeah, residential square footage, right? It's starting in the middle. Residential square footage, including common areas within residential portions of a structure, <clears throat> excuse me, may account for up to 85% of building square footage instead of 70. Well, and like that's can the you same. explain uh, once again? Yeah. Chair Gordon, I didn't really understand you because I'm not in the business and you are. Why does this really result in no change? Uh, okay, great question. So building square footages in our code that we have here are based on land area and then an FAR application. FAR is floor area ratio. That FAR was at 1.0. So essentially it said that if you had a 20,000 square foot lot, for example, you could have 20,000 square feet of building floor area. Follow me there so far? Yep. Okay, so we've changed that to say in mixed use projects that now we're allowing a 1.5 FAR. That means that where you used to have 20,000 square foot building, now you're allowed 30,000 square feet on that same lot. So the square footage got a little bit bigger. The density didn't get bigger, just the square footage. And that was in an effort to allow more underground parking and things like that that we discussed and to remove maybe FAR as a boundary and make it more of a help to a project. So in that same scenario, you would take that maximum uh, FAR. Let's say you're building out the max that you could on a building. So now instead of my building being 20,000 square feet, it's 30,000 square feet. But because the commercial square footage is a percentage of the total building, that 25% uh, commercial requirement on the 20,000, now I have a 25% commercial requirement on 30,000. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so when you run those numbers side by side, essentially we've got the FAR to make the residential <laughs> spaces a little bit better and easier to build and that kind of stuff. But we've, in, and, um, you know, maybe accidentally now up to the commercial requirement as well without Miss Hansen put it much better than I just did. Not it wasn't an accident. It's, you know, we've now we've had 25% of the 30,000 instead of 25% of the 20,000. And so what I'm saying is that if you reduced that number to a 15% commercial requirement, it gets you the same square footage or really close in as far as round numbers go um, <clears throat> to what the original 20,000 square foot building would have had. Yeah, but if, if when a building though. is built and you're looking at it, whether it's 20 or 30,000 square feet, this just means that it'll be mostly largely residential and just a few little stores in the first story, right? Well, it's still a, no, it would still be a... a like a pretty high, like a 30,000 square foot building would have, would have re minimum requirement of 4,500 square feet before it would have been about 5,000. So, you know, if you wanted to get to exact numbers, it'd be something like, you know, 16.5, but that just doesn't really roll off the tongue. So, you know, if we wanted to say 16.5%, that would be exactly the same. <clears throat> But it's also worth noting that of a 30,000 square foot building, you're only ending up with 4,500 square feet of commercial. 
I yeah, mean, that's not very much. I, I don't know if I can support that. You want to cut the well, baby in think half? About, I, I hear you, but let's think about what that is per floor, right? So let's see. I'm not going to do simple math very well right now. What's 30,000 divided by four? 7,500 square feet per floor. So that means 5,000 of your ground floor is commercial, 2,500, and believe me, we did like, you know, designing commercial spaces and multi-story buildings. There's other things that you need on ground floor, which are circulation, trash enclosures, electric rooms, parking spaces, you know, there's all kinds of things. So leaving 2,500 square foot on the ground floor and the rest commercial is really the same ratio as what it was before. Does that make sense? It's actually more. It's actually, it allows, yeah, it used to be where you'd have the entire first floor as commercial. And if you couldn't fit all the commercial, you'd have to go second floor commercial. So in most of the designs right now, what we have is first and some of second floor as commercial space is what we're going to require. That's what it comes down to. Okay, I have a question. Wouldn't we have to add in here somewhere that this applies only to the 1.5 RAF? Uh, this RAF. is in the mixed use, right? Residential uses and commercial designation. So this is really talking about the mixed use uh, spaces that are already 1.5. So there's no other already built. No, no, no. That are already planned to be 1.5. The code we've adjusted okay. today is 1.5, and that all of the projects or parcels in this paragraph are at a 1.5 FAR. Okay. Yeah. So and the short answer is it's already uh, it, it does refer to that already. <clears throat> Rachel, as the maker of the motion, this is. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, Allison, I'm curious what you think about this one. I mean, I, I, I hear what Tim's saying, and he obviously has a lot of experience in the building world. I'm, I, it makes me a bit nervous, given, given the lack of commercial space in the unincorporated area. Of Santa Cruz County, um, and um, the direction we're going, and trying to uh, encourage these mixed use developments so that people can live and shop where they are, um, because we're trying to build these types of places where people can experience commercial in a variety of ways where they are. So it's so I, it, it does make me a bit nervous. Um, what about twenty percent? Yeah, I'd say anything's better. And like we heard from Barry Swenson, who is also, you know, this is what they do. Um, they said 10. So, you know, I, I hear that and I'd be happy to at least get 20. But if we wanted to make it the same as what it was originally planned, 16 and a half is where it is. You know, which is like, that's not a commercial reduction by any means to what was already anticipated. So it's not reducing commercial square footage. We also, I don't know. The 16 and a half percent. Well, it's up to the motion maker. I, I could maybe support 20%, but I don't think I would support less. Well, increasing this to 80% of residential, they, wouldn't that increase the cost of the building and, and increase rates, rents? You said commercial is doesn't draw as much in rental as residential. Correct. So if we had 80% of the building, or I'm sorry, 85% of the building in residential, wouldn't that increase the cost and therefore the rents? That's a good question. It's possible, but the reality is, um, see, I ran some numbers on, on this and did a few specific um, uh, test cases. and. The way it was before, the average unit size would be somewhere around 500. And so 
you know, while that's good, that's also really small. So we're not allowing, which we do need two bedrooms, one bedrooms, you know, that's more of a studio. So, you know, the, what the FAR changed was the ability to have units that average closer to 700 square feet, which is more typical to allow for more size units. Does that make sense? So even though the building might be bigger, it just means that you can actually have like two bedroom units now where before it would be challenging. Let me just kind of bring us back. So the 75% is what staff is, rec the language that staff is recommending. And then this, the language that staff is recommending represents a huge departure from where the code currently is, which I think is like 40%, something crazy. Um, so, so letting 75% of a building in a commercially zoned area already is a huge change from where we are. Um, so I just wanted to contextualize this a little bit. Right now, residential is the name of the game um, right now in, 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 the, in the world, in the development world. So yes, like there is a, a need, a, a desire to have the, as large a percentage as possible residential. Um, but we should just, I just have to keep bringing us back to these are commercial zones. And so uh, we do need to retain some commercial use so that we actually have a neighborhood when we're creating 15 minute neighborhoods, we actually want a neighborhood for people to walk in, whether it's 75 or 80, I'm fine. I think once you start getting up to 85, then you kind of, it's like, well, what, why is this even zoned commercial anymore? If it's like, you know, over, you know, 85% residential, are we really in a commercial zone anymore? We might, let's just rezone it to <laughs> residential at that point. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm squishy enough to go up to like 80, I guess, but I also, you know, would want to hear from Commissioner Violanti. Yeah, I, I agree with Commissioner Dan that it makes me nervous because we have we, we we do have to recognize that these are commercially zoned properties, um, and that while I am very in favor of us building housing, and um, I, I, if we do not have places for people to work, if we do not have places for people to shop, we end up with a community that commutes. Um, whether or not that's to drive 10 minutes to work or if that's driving 15 minutes to the nearest grocery store, which happens even in my district, um, that's not what we want to see happen on a regular basis. And so I have to admit that it, it does make me nervous to go. I agree with Commissioner Dan, I would not be comfortable going below 80, 80 um, but based on staff's recommendation, I, I, I almost have, has, I have to admit I'm hesitant to even move, move from the 75. I know this is a 20 year, 20 year plan, um, but um, I, I, these are commercially zoned properties, um, and uh, I, I think I think I, I, I absolutely, Commissioner Chair Gordon, I absolutely respect what you do and the work you do, but I, um, I, I almost feel comfortable just keeping the number because, um, and if the board decides to to change it, then they can, and maybe we could, um, you know, the staff generally is honest about when we we have a different, you know. Opinion, but I, yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't go below 80, and I almost feel comfortable keeping where we're at. We're at. These are commercially zoned properties. Well, I would support whatever Commissioner Dan and Violente want to do with this. So that logic that you have just explained, Allison, is quite convincing to me. Well, I appreciate the the listening and understanding. You know, I think 20% would be, <clears throat> or 80% residential. If we put it that way, would be probably the the highest that would make sense for any building. Just if you think through the numbers, just really basically a quarter of the building as residential means that the, or as commercial means the entire first floor is commercial. And just think about only these two things, circulation and elevator course. Those in your description are residential. And so if you don't even have space for those, then it doesn't make sense. So I appreciate the 20% uh, or 80%. And I feel like that would be like the minimum uh, to actually make a building even buildable. Otherwise, you're going to see people use the density bonus waiver on this every single time. And you'll get very little commercial. And so I think going to 20, I appreciate that. And I think that would be a good minimum. 
I guess my expectation, Chair Gordon, is that the first floor should be commercial. Like, I, but to me, I don't want to see residential on the first floor. I want to see. Well, no, I'm not saying floor. residential <laughs> on the first floor. I'm saying you do have residential uses that must be on the first floor. Trash yes. rooms, access to the stories above, elevators, all of those kind of things that are not the commercial use. And so, just if you do the basic math, that is not going to fit on any building with a 25 percent requirement in a mixed use zone. So well, I appreciate uh, the point. Unless, I think 20 solves that. Unless so. the front for unless the front, the the story the the primary build the building that is street facing is commercial and there's a a building in the back that is multi-story and that's residential, which is also possible here. Um, it doesn't have to be one single structure. In the staff report, they showed us examples where there are two buildings that meet this example and not just one. And they can still meet this. And that could meet the definition of multi-story developments that where the back building is two, three stories high, only residential, and the front building is um, commercial. Um, so not all of these buildings will be, not all these parcels, pardon me, will be um, stacked in order to meet this 75%. Um, but I hear what you're saying. If they are a single building meeting this definition, then then you have first floor needs that are residential, but that, that's not the only time where this could be possible. Right. You got it. Thank you. I appreciate that. So yeah, 80% would would make it possible. And I feel like if that's you know works for everyone, that's that that helps a lot. So well I'm okay with that. I don't know though where Renee and Allison um where you two are. I got this far as that's as far as I could go in a commercial zone, I think. Renee, you're the seconder. <laughs> uh, I said that I would go with whatever the two of you think. Uh, <laughs> and or we could let the board decide and, and register the fact that we had a lot of debate about it. Okay, why don't we do this? So let's leave it as is, but let's make a notation. Staff could, could make a notation to put into the staff report that there was a lot of discussion about what percentage of residential square footage should be allowed in the C zoned neighborhoods. Well, can we ask Ms. Hansen, what do you think? <laughs> Actually, Rachel gets to decide if she accepts the, um, if he has a friendly amendment as the maker of the motion, Rachel has the right to not accept your friendly amendment. I yeah, we don't have to all agree. Thank you. No, I, I understand that, but I would like to hear um, Ms. Hansen if you had any thoughts. Yeah, yeah this is staff, 75% is what staff put forward, so maybe it is helpful okay. to hear. That's fair. Yeah, you, yep, I appreciate that. We we think that raising is really appropriate to raise a percentage allowed in residential in this um, climate that we're in. We desperately need housing. Um, mixed use developments that have to have too much commercial aren't penciling. Um, we're seeing density bonuses that are constantly asking for a reduction because they can't get tenants in. Um, the, the world has just changed considerably. So I, I think 75 is okay. I think raising it would, would be helpful in, in that manner. Um, I'd also just like to register that it's a little unclear what happens when you have a horizontal development, if we add in this multifamily development language. So um, what if you had you know, commercial along the frontage and then residential in back with this no longer apply, just unclear to us. You mean the extent of multi-story development? Yeah. Um, well, the purpose of that was to make sure that there was some commercial retained, I believe. Right, and so the way it's crafted now that commercial would it would apply whether it's multi-story or a horizontal development. Of course, we we prefer to have multi-story, uh, but we certainly could see redevelopment of a site, let's say an old mall or something, in which it it made sense to be more of a horizontal division. So we wouldn't want to lose that cap um, in those types of developments as well. So, how would you suggest? How would you suggest changing the language to meet that concern? 
um, removing the underscored language. The language we, we added, which the purpose was so that if we did have a one story building, there would still be some, some commercial. Well, it doesn't mandate multi-story story, um, Stephanie, does it? It just says in multi-story one. It just leaves it unclear what happens if you don't have a multi-story development. Well, could you add some language that would satisfy you for clarity? Maybe a few more words? Wouldn't removing what was written there already? That, that would make it clearer, yes. Yeah. Okay, let's move along. Somebody, so what do you want to do? Okay, um, so if there aren't any more questions. Um, well, I have one other addition uh, or a suggestion and to finalize the thought. So are you saying you will not accept the amendment to make that 80%? Well, I think where we landed was um, Um, where we landed was instead we would indicate, asking staff to indicate in the staff report that there was a lot of discussion on this. I mean, this was, that's not, the, so the interesting thing about that section was the debate is not about any language we changed. This was about language that is staff's. So um, I guess I would leave it up to staff to defend their own language there. I'm not, I'm not going to change the 75%, but if staff wants to, when this goes in front of the board, if staff is convinced by your um, arguments, Tim, and they want to, to recommend a change to that percentage, they should do that. Because I just feel like that's not my language. That was staff's language. Um, so... Yeah, you're asking me to approve a bunch of language that you've added without having it I haven't even had a chance to review it or read through it. So, I mean, it's, we're all doing that, right? I mean, that's the whole purpose. And I do appreciate that we should, you know, ask staff to double check and see if 80% makes sense. But it sounded like for Ms. Hansen, like that's totally doable. She understands the challenge. So, you well, know, then I would ask why it. they put 75% if, if now staff is saying actually they, they think it should be 80. <laughs> so, um, good question. I mean, the, the, floor area, or excuse me, the uh, recommendation from the board when this went back in 2015 was to remove the limit, the maximum li limit. That's what it says on page 68. Because I think at that time it was 40. I mean, now it's no 50. It says remove the maximum limit of 50%. So I guess my point is like, everyone's trying to do their best here. That doesn't mean that without a lot of input and, and thinking through it, and which is why we are here, help them and which is why you wrote this entire document is to help provide the feedback that you felt was important and that's the one of two things that I feel like is important in this section okay you're wearing me down I'm fine with 80 percent if Commissioner Shepard is <laughs> um Renee uh yes I will uh, support that and let's move on and get through the rest okay of let me make this change here to say 80 Thank you. But I, I think I do yeah. think we should also make a good argument, Tim. <laughs> but I would like what you suggested before. I'd like to suggest that we, that staff, put in the report to the board that there was quite a bit of discussion around this, and further a careful look at it would be something the board ought to do, or, or at least that, that we had considerable discussion over this percentage. Agreed. And and um, if staff has new information that would change their recommendation further, then they should put yeah, that so, forth to the board. So. Yeah, if staff thinks it's good or bad, this is where we're ending up, then please express yourself. And then I also just want to say, like, doing this remotely is not ideal. Like, if we were in the board chambers where we used to have our meetings, I would pass out a hard copy to everybody so everybody could have it themselves. And, and so I just want to acknowledge that this is very difficult the way we're doing this now. And, and so, and I apologize for that. So, um, okay. Getting through it. Um, the, the last question, I appreciate that. I appreciate you listening and, and, and that amendment. Um, Ms. Hansen mentioned, and I tend to agree that adding the in-store, in multi-story developments, it creates 
some gray area or non multi story developments. And so I feel like if you want to add that, you should also clarify what happens on non multi story. Because if it was me coming to you as a developer saying I'm stuck to only these objective standards, it says if I don't do, if I do a one story building, I have no requirement. So you want to just add in multi story and horizontal developments? Well, that would, I would say if you, I, and I don't quite understand the intent. And so I'm just offering my opinion based on what I'm reading here as black and white. Um, and, I, and I hope you understand that. But if I, it would, seem to make more sense that if you deleted what you added, that it was still accomplished what you want, but I'm not sure because I'm not quite getting what you're trying to accomplish with that addition. I think what we were trying to accomplish since I was part of this conversation, I know not the maker of the motion, was essentially that we're trying to maintain ground floor and accessible commercial. And so we only wanted to provide the option of doing this type of now 85% residential when they're doing 80. is that what did I say? Sorry. 80% um residential when they're creating a density. Um even if it meant like I said, if you had a single story in the front and then multi-story in the back, it would still be a multi-story development. So that's why we didn't say multi-story structure. So I said development. I see Ms. Hansen's point if you were redeveloping, say something like a mall. Um, but it's that we didn't want people to create essentially sprawl of single story properties. Um, so, so that's where the language kind of was coming from. Can you clarify um, it slightly? So I, I don't know if we would want to say in multi-story developments or redevelopment projects, um, but that was the intent was that we didn't want people to create these um, these properties where they were kind of creating um, single story covering uh, a lot in a way that we didn't, we want to have commercial fronting and not, and we'd rather have people create higher density. Um, what, what about projects. just saying up to 80% of building square footage in both multi story or horizontal developments? Because that doesn't preclude what I was talking about, which is someone coming in and building a single story development. We're, we're okay with redevelopment of a single story property, but we wouldn't want someone to develop a single story property when they could go higher density and build if you're going to go for this 80 percent housing it should be um they have the capability of building more housing should they go vertical um and, and instead of doing this kind of covering the lot i would also just note that there are policies that um specify that ground floor you know commercial should be on the ground floor so it's accessible to the to the public. So there are other policies that cover that concept and the code as well. Well, at 80%, we have 24,000 square feet for residential and 6,000 for commercial. Can we do that in a multi-story building? Yes. Okay. You could, you could not with the current, well, I mean, I think what you're trying to do, just so I, I'm repeating this so I make sure I understand it. You're trying to prevent someone from building a one-story commercial space where there's an opportunity for a three or four-story density bonus mixed-use project. Okay. Is that what you're getting at? Right. But if you limited the ground floor to 6,000 square feet, it's going to be difficult to put those other stories on that's, it would have to have residential in the ground floor as well. Oh, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. That's a, 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 res to, yeah. a, a residential use could be yes. allowed, but not probably not a residence. Like, you know, it's like mail room, package delivery, okay. room, like those kind of things take a lot of a lobby. And they have to be on the ground floor. Yeah, lobby. Perfect example. Okay. And so that's oh, this is getting a little contorted. Yeah, yeah. Can we so Allison, I think you had some language maybe to specify to kind of what the thinking was here. And I think that was that in multi-story development or redevelopment. Yeah, that might Ms. Hansen, I, would that fix what you're talking about, which is if we just said or redevelopment projects, that might fix what you're talking about. I I it it will help, yes, but you could still have um, developments that prefer to 
have their commercial in the front and residential in the back. It's it's not unusual at all to have some sort of division between your commercial and residential uses because they want to protect the uh, impacts to residential. So there's, you know, encouraging mixed use and uh, allowing them to figure out what works well for that particular site and that particular neighborhood, you know, makes some sense from a policy perspective. So Stephanie, can you come up with a little language here? You're the expert. I, I think I did, I, uh, which was to remove the underlined language. I mean, if, that, if that's the only solution Ms. Hansen can come up with, it, it, it seems unnecessarily, if, if that's fine, if that's the only way she can come up with, I, I think that that's, I totally understand that people can do that with the commercial in the front and the housing in the back. I just believe that if they're going to do that, that we might as well encourage them to do multi-story development in the back is my point, um, which is what this language is designed to do um, in order to, if we're going to give them this 80% residential, then, then we should, I, I, they have to be one heck of a large parcel where you can meet 80% of your residential if they're putting the residential in the back without going up to multi-story development. Um, the the yeah. sentence, in my last, opinion, which is why the language seems fine to me, but if Ms. Hansen we, truly believes it's not possible, then we can strike the language. I'd like to ask a clarifying question that might answer the problem. If you go for a mixed use development, which is not required, but possible. Are you not required to meet the densities of the general plan? You are, correct? You would develop at the residential flex um, range. Right, so just thinking through that, you know, you have to add 30 to 45 units per acre. And it doesn't really, in my opinion, from what I've seen, and this is up for debate, obviously, it doesn't matter if you have a small parcel or a large parcel. It's going to be really hard to fit those number of units and 20% commercial without having a multi-story somewhere. It, does that make sense? So, Tim, you're saying that the practical reality is favors what Allison is concerned about. That's what you're saying. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. I think that adding this language can is a little redundant. However, it doesn't preclude the fact that someone could, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Ms. Hanson, someone could buy a commercial property, build a new one-story strip mall. Is that possible? Yes. But that's within our code. So it doesn't really matter, you know. Let's just strike the language and move yeah. on, you guys. I mean, I, 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 I think that my language is fine. Like, to chair Gordon's point, I think you won't find many where this language isn't just come, isn't just true, which is why I think the language is fine. Um, but if their solution is that they just don't want the language there, I think it's fine to just strike it. So I struck what was an addition and underlined what is the new addition based on the um, discussion here. And and I agree as a second, as long as we have want to once again mention that staff should let the board know that we had a lot of discussion over the building square footage. We will do that. All right. Any other questions? I have I have one question. That's the last sentence that says a higher percentage of residential square footage is allowed only via a waiver or concession associated with a density bonus. Now, if it was 75%, this applied to that. But we've changed it to 80%. So how, how do we square it with the last sentence? Well, they, they're going for a density bonus. They could ask for a concession. Correct. Yeah, but it was it was 75, right? But That's we've right. increased it. Commissioner Violanti brought that up. <laughs> but well, so the, now they could, yeah. Yeah, that's that's right. That's a fair point. The okay. reality is with the density bonus, you could eliminate 99% of it, you know, but we don't want that okay. to happen, right? We want people to make commercial. So if we give okay. them a percentage that works for them, we have a much higher chance of people actually building the commercial space and not just saying, you know what, this rule doesn't work. See ya. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Good point. Okay. 
Is your point, Ms. Lazenby, that you don't want that sentence to exist, or are you just asking how it works? I think she's satisfied now. Perfect. Yeah, I'm 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 okay with it. Okay. Um, any other questions on on this or yeah, I had one on the on section. I'm not sure if you've highlighted or made adjustments to this section, but it's um, BE 2.1.8. Um, that in Can we just continue on with this document? Well, it's in this. Well, that's what I'm asking. I'm asking. Um, we yeah, this so now. I don't. So I didn't. We didn't make any modifications to that policy. Tim, did you say 2.1.8? Correct. So I have to bring up my, oh no, well, I can't because I'm sharing my screen, so I can't bring up. So can you read what that policy is? Because I actually, like, I only have one screen, so I can't bring up another screen. And I am only have one screen too. Couldn't we just go through this document? We aren't through with it yet and then go on from there. Actually, just because we are remote, that might be an easier way to do it. So can we vote on this? And then, Tim, if you have a modification, um, let's take a look at that separately. And then you can share your screen and and make a suggestion. Just or I, I don't know. It's, it's I've never done. I've yeah, never well, I hear issue. that it might. Let me just ask the sure. question to see what yeah. you guys think about this because this is the section that's about our requirement for people meeting the general plan densities okay. and the request was that we and you know try to get people to be towards the upper end um and that's what's true in the city of santa cruz and i feel like it's beneficial to be there for us as a community to provide more density of housing and and to uh, you know align with the city where possible, which you know it, it makes sense. So, in any case, What's my question policy? is if people would support adjusting it to say something along the lines of ensure developments are in the upper end of the density range as provided by the general plan. Stephanie, Stephanie, can you clarify because when I read two point one point eight, it has to do with adequacy of infrastructure, and I want to make sure that we're all talking about the same. I, I I need to see it in front of me. You guys are saying let's do this and this and this, and I don't even see the language. So I apologize. I wrote the wrong one down. The wrong. Yeah. One. I think maybe it's a different policy number. Okay. Okay. Great. Because I, I, I like I when I'm reading two point one point eight, and it has to do with adequacy of roads, sewers, water service, drainage, and stormwater. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm like I'm lost. I, I would not <laughs> want to change needing to have stated as we stated earlier in this document that adequacy of uh, infrastructure services need to be there. So no, I wouldn't, I would no, not I, off the cuff say I support saying that. No, Commissioner Shepard, that's a different topic. I apologize that I wrote down the wrong reference and I need the to call find the, the What about if I call the question on where we are now and get it voted on? What's that? Yeah. And I call the question on the sections we've gone over and let's get a vote on what we've done so far. It just seems like we're going to make another vote on the exact same topic. Why don't we just finish the topic and be done with the topic? Uh, is that topic already been covered in the few pages we've gone over? It's not something that Commissioner Dan and Violante have brought up, but it is something in this, in which we had discussed previously doing this section by section. And we are in the general plan built environment chapter two right now. So if we want to have multiple motions on built environment or one additional item, we can. However, I feel like that is a bigger misuse of time. Does that make sense? Uh, I understand everything that we've discussed and I'd like to vote on it. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So why don't we'll just take your item separately. So sure. um, so there's a motion and a second. Yeah. Okay, let's, so to be really clear, just for the record, we are voting on the amendments to chapter two built environment uh, as proposed and motion created by Commissioner Dan and seconded by Commissioner Shepard based on the PDF shown here. Um, which I will send to staff. 
after a vote is taken. You can have a roll call vote on this, please. I'd appreciate that. Okay. Um, Commissioner Lazenby. Yes. Commissioner Violante. Yes. Commissioner Dan. Yes. Commissioner Shepard. Yes. Uh, Chair Gordon. Apologetically, no. <laughs> I really want to say yes, but honestly, I need the time to review. I, you know, I have a hard time making general plan amendments without fully understanding exactly what it was. And without people having the time to go through this, challenging to accept off the cuff, much as Commissioner Lazenby just said. So I do appreciate the effort. However, I am no. So you had something that you wanted us to consider. Do you want to bring up the policy and share your screen so we can all take a look at the policy that you wanted to suggest a modification to? Yes. Thank you. Give me one second here to find that. I believe it's policy 2.1.9, development below the minimum density. Thank you. I was one off. Okay. <laughs> Let me share that really quick. Hey, can you see my screen here? Oops. I can't. Not oh. yet. Oops. Sorry. Yeah. How's it going? No? Yes. Okay. Yes. This is the section right here that we're talking about. 2.1.9, development below the minimum density. A de development cannot be approved on sites within the OSL RSL, a density below the designated density range, except for written findings required by California government code section 655.89 have been made, which we talked about earlier. The adjustment that I would like to see here and I just want to get feedback to see if I would even get a second on this before I make a motion, um, is that this says that I would like this to say that we, you know, encourage or require, if possible, densities to be in the upper range of the general plan density. What I don't understand is if you want to require them to be up in the range, then why would we have a lower range? Sometimes you can't, that's a good question. Um, and let me caveat with, you know, there's still the except where written findings and, you know, at a dense, you know, certain densities can't fit on certain sites. Say you have a site that's, I don't know, got a lot of trees or on a slope or something like that, you know, you're not gonna, you, there's a chance you might not fit all of those units. Um, so there's still opportunities where it may not work, but encourage at least would be something that would help people know that we're serious about making sure they're going towards the upper end of the density, not creating wow. a bare minimum. Bare encourage, minimum. encourage is a much different concept than mandate. I Yes, absolutely. That makes sense. I, so yeah. you want it to be mandated. I, I wouldn't support that. Encourage is, that's a recommendation, but it's not a, it's not the rule. So I, I, I could not support mandate. There's too many exceptions. This county is just not like flat. And, you know, we're not in Ohio where you could mandate anything. But here, everything is so determined by a patchwork of septic system, water systems, terrain, any number of factors. I don't see mandating it. <clears throat> I understand that. Um, how about an encourage? Can people go for an encourage. Can I, can I just I make personally a... support what it says? I'm not. In, <laughs> I don't want to really modify it. I understand your your concerns and your interests, but I think that's. I think the whole way we're planning, we're changing all these codes and the language in the general plan makes it pretty clear what we're encouraging. I see no. There's no two ways about that. So well, I'm, I'm satisfied with what it is. So Ms. Murphy, it. did you have something to add to that? Um, yes, I did just want to point out in 2.1.8, it does say where adequate public services exist, development at the highest high end of the density range allowed by the land use designation is preferred and encouraged in order to maximize the utility of scarce land resources served by public infrastructure. That's well, in that, the that's clear. policy. I mean, I think that's a clear directive. Don't you agree? 
Sure. Or Tim, Tim, does that meet your? What's that, Commissioner Bielan? I said, Tim, does that meet your language if it's in 2.18, even if it's not in 2.19? I'm just reading it. I apologize. Stephanie, did you have a chance to look at my question about 2.19? Yeah, we did look at the that section of the government code hang on one second and it's findings for approval development um under the housing accountability act um and it basically has the findings that you make if it development is consistent with the the general plan um, and uh, and it kind of stops us from, from disapproving developments that kind of meet our standards and general plan um, uh, or, but you could do that if there was an adverse impact on the environment. It's that kind of language. It wouldn't, it, it wouldn't have a bearing in rebuilding in the fire zone. Well, I question wasn't just about the fire zone. The fire zone is just, we've come face to face with the reality of disaster with the CZU fire. I, my question had to do with any sort of catastrophe. I mean, we, we, we unfortunately live right in an area right with disaster. So floods, slides, right. earthquakes. And I just wanted to ensure that if someone lived, I mean, we're obviously changing our densities to be much more intense. And, and I, I don't, want to see someone whose home gets destroyed from a fallen tree, from a, a cracked foundation, from an earthquake, who suddenly finds themselves living on a, perhaps in a single home on an RM zone parcel who's told that they have to build four units. Um, and, and that's why, because our, our, our general plan says you, you shall not <laughs> um, build below the density. Um, it says, except where written findings of that code have been made. And so I want to ensure that that's, do we need to be more explicit about the fact that, I mean, does that fit within that California government code or do we need to be more explicit about the fact that we allow for rebuilding to be built below that density? Um, if that's, uh, I don't think the government code limits it one way or the other. Um, but I think the intent, you know, if if you have a development in the urban area that has services, the, the intent so far has been, you're, you know, you're meeting that those density requirements, even if you're rebuilding after, say, I don't know, a tree. Oh, okay. I I be I don't want to interrupt Tim. I was just hoping to get an answer. I'll let Tim talk about whether or not the language in 2.18 met his desires for 2.19, but I, right. I would actually like to hear from the rest of the commission about their thoughts, given what you just said, because I, I would be surprised to hear if the commission agreed with staffs not, not being willing to let people rebuild them after something, unless it met the current densities. But anyway, I'll let, I don't want to deter Tim. I was just letting he was reading, so I figured I might as well ask my question. So. I, I don't mind at all. And I, that's that's good use of time there. So sitting here watching me read very slowly is not a great use of time. <laughs> um, I, that did answer my question. I think I'm fine with that. And I appreciate that getting pointed out. I must have missed it. So I, it does say what I was hoping it would say, at least encourage higher uh, density where uh, upper end where possible. So I appreciate that. And I would just thank you, Tim. I'm, I'm glad. And, and thank you for Annie for finding that for Tim so that it's already in there. Um, I'm, I'm curious to hear from my fellow commissioners. I, I hope we were done with built environment. Um, but I, for me, this idea that the general plan says it cannot be approved on sites within the USL and RSL identities below the designated density range is a, is a bit of a concern for me, um, that there isn't an exception for people who experience um, unexpected disasters. Uh, we unfortunately know we live in an area that is prone to these. Um, and I, the USL incorporates areas like La Salva Beach, uh, pardon me, the RSL incorporates areas like La Salva Beach and parts of 
um, areas that consider themselves towns. And I think people would be surprised, obviously, people, a lot of people live within the USL, um, including people, places near, say, the harbor, which is prone to even tsunami damage. Um, and I just, I wouldn't want people to suddenly find themselves when they're willingly and choosing to build at our higher density. I, 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 like I said earlier, I'm very in favor of more housing and that's built into these higher densities. But when people are experiencing the trauma of disaster, it's hard enough to build often the single family dwelling that they lost. Uh, and I wouldn't want them to unexpectedly find themselves with the expectation that they're building four or more units, which is the low end to Tim's point of these densities. Um, and I, I think I would be supportive of us putting some sort of language in there that said something along the lines with the exception of rebuild after, you know, either some, something like disaster or unexpected loss of property or something like that. I don't know exactly what the language would be, but perhaps we could even give a general direction about specific language to staff. I don't know how the rest of the commission feels. Yeah, Paul. Um, I agree with that. How about I'll move that in this section, is it 1.1.9? 1. 1. 2.1.9. 2.1.9 that um, when this item comes before the Board of Supervisors that staff add language to this section to provide an exemption for people re rebuilding after a natural disaster. So that's a motion. I would strongly that. agree on that. Do we have a second before we? I'll second, second that. Sounds like we have two. We'll take uh, Commissioner Violantes this time. Sorry, Commissioner Shepard. You got the last one. Um, okay, we have a motion and a second. Can we please have a roll call vote on this, Ms. Drake? Uh, yes. Commissioner Dan? Yes. Commissioner Violante? Yes. Commissioner Lazenby? Yes. Commissioner Shepard? Yes. And Chair Gordon? Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Okay. I'm going to pause us for now. We're at a good stopping point. We have a break due about 30 minutes ago. So we're going to take a quick, let's make it 12 minute break and be back at 3 15. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. See you in a minute. Hey, Tim.
Um, sorry about that. Um, let's try to catch up with the breaks. Um, let's continue and um, go with the roll call uh, again to make sure we're all here, please, Ms. Drake. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Shepard? I am here. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Dan? Here. Commissioner Violante? Here. Commissioner Lazenby? Here. And Chair Gordon? Here. All right. Um, I'd like to talk about a quick housekeeping thing just to make sure we're all on the same page. I do have a hard stop today at five. And so I'm not sure how everyone else's schedules are looking, but um, based on the rate and who not knowing what everyone else is going to have, there's a chance we might not get all the way done. So I just want people to be thinking about that. And if we want to either stop 15 minutes, maybe a little bit more than 15 minutes beforehand to chat about next meetings um, and get through the rest of the agenda, I'd appreciate that. So we got maybe an hour 20 left to talk about items. Well, I'll, I'll try to go quickly. So um, let me share my screen again. I want to move on to access and mobility. And there are fewer recommended changes here. So again, um, I'll make the motion, ask for a second, and then we can discuss. Um, okay, thanks, Allison. Um, so the motion is to move the staff recommended changes with the following, uh, I'm sorry, move, to move the staff recommendation <laughs> with the following changes um, that are in this Google Doc here. I'll second that. And then um, I, you know, I was thinking on the break um, about Chair Gordon's comments about not being able to see this. And I was wondering if the, Commission would like us to also, and and Ms. Drake tell us if we're allowed to do this. I believe we are, to email the, the when we make the motion, not in advance, obviously, to email them out to the commission so they at least have them in front of them. It was the closest thing I could think to replicating being able to hand out our motion. I, yes. Um, I don't know if 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 council needs to weigh in on our ability to do that, but now that it's been motioned and seconded, I believe we can then email this out to the commission so they have it in front of them so they can read along without having to look at this. Are screen. you talking about as we consider mm -hmm. it? Because we've all got it up on our screens. I'm not quite understand. Yes, you, you do. But I know Chair Gordon was saying that he wasn't able to read it at the pace he wanted. And so during the break, I was considering a, a, a way to address that. Um, you'd have it in front of you as we considered it. You'd have it in front of you. And so I was just asking the if that was allowed. and. I'm trying to replicate as best as possible everybody's the ability to hand out a motion physically mm -hmm. so we are remote and accommodate different people's needs. And so I just wanted to ask. That seems reasonable to me since like uh, was mentioned earlier, if we were in the chamber as we'd be handing this out. Um, Justin is in the background here. I don't know if he has <laughs> any comments on that. Um, but yeah, I think that that makes sense to me. Okay, I, I will. Good idea. I, as long as Justin is not objecting, I will only oh. do it after there's a motion in a second so that we're not violating any Brown Act. I'm sorry, um, what was the question exactly? So Justin, we, Rachel and I, obviously we've spent some time, we're Brown Act buddies, prepping, prepping these motions. So after there's a motion in a second, I was asking if I could send out this document that Rachel's sharing on the screen to the commission so that they could consider it as we go through it. If there was any problem with that, because normally if we were in the chambers, we'd be handing out a physical copy to, to our colleagues. I assume there's uh, not a problem, but I wanted to double check. It doesn't sound like there's a problem to me, considering that it's something that's being discussed and it's just essentially a, a parallel of what would happen were we meeting in person. Perfect. I just wanted to double check. I apologize for the delay of the discussion. I just wanted to um, thank you. Allison, do you want to email it to uh, Jocelyn and then she can send it to the commissioners and, and to whoever else, staff and all that? Perfect. Jocelyn, is that okay with you, Ms. Drake? Yes. Perfect. I'll send it you. I'll send it your way. And then knowing that, as, is, as was with the other document, there may be modifications. So the final draft 
I'll, if there's changes, obviously I'll send a final copy what the planning commission passed to Jocelyn. Just in okay. case, it's just, just so like, obviously what we're sending might change depending mm -hmm. on the discussion. Okay. Right. I have a question just about process here. We had talked about doing this in more of a fashion of questions than discussions and then motions. And what we've done is skip the discussion part. And so now we have to do it in a way where there's a motion that's been made as opposed to having the time to understand what you're even talking about. And so I know everyone's trying to push this along and move quicker, but you know, the fact that it's like 330 right now, 320, we you know, I have my doubts that we'll get through this anyway today. So anyway, my question is, would it be a better process to do the discussion about these topics as opposed to a motion? Well, I think that sometimes a motion can actually generate the discussion. And what I found with items that are really complicated like this is that if you just talk in generalities, you don't actually get to a motion. That's why and somebody, Somebody's unmuted and it's distracting. So that's why, you know, I spent considerable time going through the documents and analyzing them and picking out just a few things, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's very a small number of changes. So I, the way I thought about it is if we just talk, we're just going to talk and talk and talk and we'll never get through anything. And so the, um, Putting forward a motion isn't trying to stifle discussion. Um, on, it's actually trying to provide a, an actionable venue in order to have discussion that results in action. So um, I would support that. Let's just move through this for the rest of the afternoon. We're making some progress here. Let's keep going. I don't want to have a long talk about what we could talk about. You know, let's just go. Yeah, I mean, I figured we've had six months of study sessions and talking, so now is, I'm just ripe to make to take action. So, okay, so this is um, on access and mobility. Um, so the first substantive item is about open streets, slow streets, and this is just language to indicate that um, this, like as has been done in the city of Santa Cruz, would be on a temporary basis. <laughs> Um, the next item is um, just adding, uh, changing some language to highlight. Um, it's to say prioritizing safety instead of saying prioritizing just bike. So we're prioritizing all pedestrian access is what we were going for for this one. Sorry, Rachel. Just no, no, please. If I, I appreciate that. I just couldn't find my toolbar here. Wait, I had a question on that. Why would a plan, what does it mean? This is just probably for staff. Why does that plan have to be coordinated with parks to incorporate greenways? I don't understand. So you mean you, so you have bike paths through parks connect up with safe streets? I don't quite understand that. Um, yeah, we didn't mess around with that language. So um, that's what staff is recommending that the um, active transportation plan coordinate with parks. And I think that since we actually approved the ATP, that, that that's kind of just standard. Uh, okay. But that's something that staff can address at the end of the discussion if that's something you want to know more about. Okay. Um, the next item is changing out one word stripe to prioritize and taking out strictly since that's um, subjective. The next section is eliminating the word encourage and instead putting in the word require as a condition of approval, improvements at access points. This often is an issue. Um, the next item is just putting in uh, as required by law with regard to applying the objective criteria since there are state laws that speak to this. And then uh, 
Um, yes, this the next section is um, about um, um, protecting biological and physical and environmental resources and just strengthening the language a little bit there. And then the next one is putting in some specific language here that indicates what we're talking about is achieving a minimum level of service. And so adding the word minimum there. And then the last item is a, a direction to staff that when this plan comes back before the board that staff add a policy stating the requirement that the integration of a micro of micro mobility will not obstruct pedestrian access. And I think that that's it for this one. Yeah. Can you go up to the top one again? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, open streets, slow streets, consider limiting through vehicle traffic on select local roadways on a temporary basis and opening up streets to bicycle and pedestrian traffic. Doesn't this change the complete intent of this section? Well, I'm actually not sure because my thinking was it could not have been the intent of staff to completely close off the street. Um, I don't know that that's happened anywhere else in the county. And certainly um, it was quite disastrous when the city did it, even on a temporary basis. And they completely taken that off the table now. So. Honestly, with this one, I, I think that I was, we were just kind of specifying what we thought was the intent of staff, but it's also what we think is um, reasonable. Because even in San Francisco, when they do close some streets, it's usually on weekends or a designated time and everybody looks forward to it. I, I right. wouldn't, I, that's maybe, I, and the staff can respond, but I think that's yeah, makes sense on a temporary close. basis. Sorry. I would say I'm saying closed too. streets, though, saying limiting through traffic. It's essentially creating, it's the idea that we would want to create roadways for more bicycle and pedestrian traffic. And it's just saying, like, this is the direction that we as a community want to go. Limiting through tra vehicle traffic on select roadways. And right. And I'll just say that when this happened in the city of Santa Cruz, it was disastrous. And they actually rejected grant funding to continue the program because it was so unpopular. And um, it, it just, I mean, so I actually don't support the policy unless there's this added language that indicates that it's temporary. And I, this isn't to say that we don't want bicycle and pedestrian traffic. It's just that um, I think we have to be practical um, about where and where I am very familiar where this program was implemented, it didn't work. I don't know the program that you're referring to, so I can't comment, but I know in other cities, it's common practice to temporarily close on maybe twice a month some streets, and people like it a lot on that basis. But I don't think you mean that. I mean, I think on a temporary basis, it is a good uh, agreed, you know, because if there's through traffic, if there's traffic, there's traffic. Uh, I thought the idea was to close some particularly the scenic streets, like, a, you know, and, and let people have bicycling or walking on them, you know, once or twice a month in the summer or something like that. Or could staff comment on what they had in mind? Um, thank you. I, you know, there are there are certainly cases where um, I can think in kind of downtowns where you want to promote um, closed streets for on a more permanent basis um, for kind of open space and greenways or or um, farmers markets. So I, I I think staff's intent was to be a little bit more open, but. You know, I, I don't think we're running into any kind of uh, co conflict or legal issue if you make this change. Yeah, I, I personally, like just so I can weigh in if that's okay, I, I actually found this one without the inclusion of temporary basis to almost be in conflict with one of the other um, pieces of the general plan where it actually said in AM 1.1D, where it actually said um, it referenced discouraging cul-de-sacs 
which essentially was was suggesting that we want to encourage kind of through traffic um, in our street designs. So I thought the I, I agreed with Commissioner Dan that this idea of it of allowing it on a temporary basis, um, because in other places of of the plan we actually do talk about um, making an effort to um, you know striping for pedestrian access and, and bicycle access and encouraging this kind of more pedestrian and bike friendly, but the idea of not having through vehicular traffic is actually something that we explicitly call out in the general plan of wanting to prevent um, versus, but on a temporary basis, like Ms. Jensen said, for, for farmers markets, um, for events, obviously we, we do want to have that, but not, not on an ongoing basis. So um, I agreed with her, um, especially given, I, I do remember when the city of Santa Cruz um, got the grant to do open open streets. It was a very contentious thing that happened in the community. Um, people were fighting over uh, where the, the signs were placed. Um, and so uh, I, I, I think that the language of a temporary basis is, uh, makes sense based on not only um, some of the experiences in the city, but also, like I said, some of the other language in the general plan. Well, if I could make one more comment on page 49 on this, what we're looking at now, on streets, the second sentence on streets that prioritize bicycles limit on street parking. Is that really a good idea? Oh boy. So that, that's staff's language. I would have to have respond to that. So the question that Commissioner Shepard is asking is, is it wise to limit on-street parking? Well, we're already limiting parking quite a bit now. And I think people will continue to park on street whenever they can. And they're gonna ignore the bike lanes. I don't really know if that's enforceable or practical. You know, this goes back to the concept of the layered street network when you want to do this in a safe fashion. Um, so you don't want to conflict, right, with your protected bike lanes and um, and parking spaces. Um, so I think that's what this was, that language was trying to to get at. And I think what when I read this policy, like that um, this, when they say streets that prioritize bicyclists, so in my mind, this would be, those of, uh, um, I call that, I'm losing my vocabulary, but streets that are ones that people use a lot and there's a name for it, would that are have um, already bike lanes there and you want to minimize parking and they, maybe to make a bike lane bigger, or to minimize conflicts, people opening their doors and dooring up cyclists. And so I'm okay with the link, with the staff's language, but um, I understand the question. We are, oh. we are limiting the amount of parking spaces in new development. And then we say, and bicycle, and, and there, and then say this street is reserved for the bicyclists. I just don't think it's enforceable because people are going to be forced to park on street. Mm -hmm. what, oh, go ahead, Anais. I see you there. <laughs> yeah, hi, thank you. Um, so uh, the intent was to specify that where we are providing parking limitations for par on streets, not off street, but on street parking limitations, that we um, that we actually enforce those. Um, there's a lot of safety issues with both bicyclists and pedestrians when they're not enforced, um, including dooring, which is a really big one, where a door opens because somebody parked halfway in the bike lane, or parked in a place where they weren't supposed to, parked in a bike lane that was intended to not have on-street parking. Um, so the intent of this policy is not to necessarily specify that there would be um, more limitations on existing roadways where there are existing bike lanes, uh, but that we should enforce those limitations that we do have. The second sentence is getting at places where we do wanna prioritize bicyclists and limit on-street parking. Um, where we need a bike lane to connect to others um, for connectivity. Um, and that's a, the, the link is that last sentence to um, provide opportunities for filling a gap. 
So I hope that all made sense there, but it's it's really not to um, create a, a community where there is no on-street parking. It's just to say that where we want to enforce limitations on on-street parking or where we, where we have existing limitations that we should um, make sure that they don't conflict with our bicycle facilities. And then if I could just quickly address 3-34, that page, um, I think a temporary basis on a temporary basis would not conflict with staff's intent on that policy. Great, thank you, and I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? Yeah, while we have you, and maybe Anise, you could hang out for a little bit. Uh, you know, I just want to go through these line by line so I understand them. So um, you're taking away in the second section for protected bike lanes and paths and just changing it to for safety. So, you know, this is saying we are not necessarily prioritizing protected bike lanes and paths anymore. We're just prioritizing safety. That could be vehicular safety. I mean, my question is, would it make sense to just leave what's there and add for safety? I don't understand why you're deleting, because that seems to remove the intent of it. And maybe on ACE, you could tell me if I'm interpreting that differently than how you would. So I, I think the concern was that it didn't, it looked like it was just addressing bicyclists. Yes, that's um, exactly right. We wanted right. to include safety for pedestrians as well. So one way you could you could address that is add the word multimodal in front of safety, or um, okay. you could clarify for safety of bicyclists and pedestrians. Yes, I think that part of it also is it said bike lanes, and so we wanted to change the lane into a person. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I think that uh, Commissioner Violante does that. Is that well? yeah? You? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let me make that change. I appreciate Anais coming up with that language because yes, the idea was that we didn't, we didn't, yeah, we wanted the multimodal or of for bike for the second option of of. Yeah, I agree. I think Commissioner Dan, my brain is stopping working. I think uh, uh, <laughs> I think early I think early in that sentence it it identifies bicyclists and pedestrians, and that's good. And then I think the protect, protected bike lane is too restrictive because sometimes you can't get a protected lane, but you can get an improved bike lane or improved path or improved sidewalk. So just, well, that's, that's I, I don't think point. you have to add for bicycle. I think just for safety, because earlier in the sentence, you already said it was for bicyclists and pedestrians. Thank and, that's you, what, and that's what we felt. Thank you, Matt. We just felt like safety was encompassing. So yes, again, we appreciate it. It looks that. like a good edit to me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any Anything else? Thank you. Um, no, that's great to understand that. Can we just keep walking down the list a little bit? Sure. Next one, thanks. To 4.1 point, just the one at the bottom of the page, I think is. Oh, one. okay. Yeah. Um, thanks. Yes. Require as a condition of approval improvements at major access points that provide services to the public, such as path improvements or maintenance. Recycling garbage collection, vehicle and bicycle parking, beach shuttles, et cetera, or signs. So encourage, it was encourage provision of and or require as a condition of approval. So this is saying you want all new developments to be required to do some form of improvement at a major access point. Which which is the case now. So this doesn't change anything except replaces a subjective word with the objective word. You're saying that this is the case in other code sections somewhere that is This is the case in my experience with any major development project, we require um, some sort of improvement, whether it's a single family home development that doesn't have a curb, we have required curbs. If it's the Aptos Village plan, we require all sorts of stuff. Um, so it's, it's uh, I don't see it as uh, a substantive departure from what is currently the practice now. Maybe. Why not just say encourage and require? That's what it said before, encourage. No, it said require. Yeah, I'm not, I don't understand the difference between provision of and or require. Why? Well, that's why it seemed like it was a little, I wanted, to, I wanted to provide a little bit more direct wording. 
I would say that, and Matt would know this better than anyone, but it's not always required. Sometimes you might be asked to, you know, <laughs> there's certain things that you do like curb strip, right? And you, if you're redoing the sidewalk, that makes sense. And that could be one of the things that you're required to do. Um, but then like, you know, upgrading a light or something or something, a crosswalk or, you know, it might, for example, be in the county's plan to do something down the road and it wouldn't make sense or help to do it now. So I don't know, I, Matt, what do you think? Is this require gonna cause us problems? I mean, the old language actually already had the word require. So I mean, they encourage provision of and or require, seems like the requires already in there. Like, I personally, I don't know, the old language seems pretty encompassing. Um, but if you just go with just require, and if the improvements are already there, then it's a moot point. So it's okay. So, Mr. Machado, are you saying that you would, your, on your experience, that the language of encourage provision of and or require is preferred, or are you saying the require is better language just so we can have? Yeah, I, I would lean toward. I would lean towards the original language where you've got to encourage and or require. I mean, that covers both bases really well, actually. I think the concern was that it wasn't strong enough. Um, no. Can I say something, which is just that sometimes we do have smaller developments that may not be subject to the same requirements as larger developments. Um, I, I think the word provision of is probably extraneous, but um, allowing for encourage where some of these improvements may not be appropriate or may not be have a nexus to the development is gives us more flexibility there. And I used to ask a follow up to that. And just as a real world example of where this could be a challenge, if someone was going to create a new single family home or replace one that was already there where they didn't have to do any street work, it's just a single family home, we wouldn't really want to force them to pay for expensive things like traffic lights and crosswalks and things like that, which wouldn't be typical. In in that scenario, this code would now say that that single family home person would have to do something. And that's what we're saying we should, the old language made it so we didn't have to enforce that on every single person. Am I understanding that? Right, so there are some laws that pro, you know prohibit us from requiring certain improvements of smaller developments, but we don't want the policy and the general plan to be in conflict with those laws. I don't understand exactly because over and over and over again on the planning commission, when people have wanted to say develop a parcel with two that has a single home into two or three homes and use a lot to more advantageous uh, residential development, we certainly have always said that they needed to build curb and sidewalk because we wanted to get curb and sidewalk. Does this change that? No, I, it's this is talking about major access points and larger improvements. So why why wouldn't why would just plain require? It seems like this. I agree. I I think the language is called for. I don't quite understand what you're suggesting. So how about I can change it to require and or encourage which is almost exactly what was there. Does that satisfy everyone? Well, I was gonna say yes, require when appropriate, but then maybe that's too subjective as well, so. How about require when appropriate? I like that. Mr. Machado, what, what is best for your department? I mean, your department yeah. is in charge of these major access points. I wanna, I think the intent is that it's not, so it's not optional when these require, when these access points need improvement. Um, yeah. What what language is best for your department? Is it require when appropriate? Is it require um, and or encourage? And or encourage? What what language uh, is you best? You know, actually, require when appropriate makes a lot of sense. Okay, let's do okay. that. Okay. Thank you. That also allows staff to consider kind of proportionality and nexus mm -hmm. and all those other good things that keep us consistent with state law. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Do you want to? Go on to, to yeah. Great. You wanted to go by these line by line. Yeah. All right, neighbor. Uh, apply consistent and objective criteria as required by law. 
in the review of discretionary development applications that is based on existing code plans policies throughout interdepartmental working group with the CDID. Do you have any questions about that? I don't think that that makes a substantive change because whether we write it or not, it's still whatever law requires. But I think that's fine. Thank you. Um, environment alignment account for the constraints that affect a project's corridor to minimize impacts to physical environmental conditions, locate and design public and private roads to avoid or minimize if necessary impacts to significant biological, visual, and other environmental resources. That's not, that's the first thing? Okay. Any questions on that one? So we're just saying instead of minimize impact plan, avoid or minimize if necessary. I think that's all, it's pretty much the same thing, right? What's the, what's the reasoning for is there just to add, I mean, just not to like go into the weeds, but it's just to strengthen the policy. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. I was interested about this next one. It's you're saying to make it minimum level of service of D and, you know, I, I, don't know this section as well as as you. It's it seems I was not, or maybe I didn't just think about it in that way. But is this is already what we're proposing? It's just really clarifying in this section that you need to meet that minimum level. It seemed odd that the so if you read it without the word minimum, it says required development projects to provide multimodal roadway improvements necessary to achieve a level of service of D. You couldn't do that. Yeah. So, right. I think we. I think the goal in our in our general plan is to bring. I think we'd all would like our roadways to have a higher level of service, right? Which is why we inserted the word minimum. We'd like a level of service to be C or B or A, <laughs> right? That, clarif I mean, that clarifies the intent. I think. So, um, I, I think staff just missed a word, quite frankly. <laughs> and if not, we sure would like to insert it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and then did we talk about the last sentence there? Sure. Or did we already? Sorry. No. The sustainability plan comes for the board of supervisors to add a policy stating a requirement that integration of micromobility shall not obstruct pedestrian access. So micromobility, if you when you read it in the general plan, included everything from electric scooters to bikes. And one of the biggest problems with micromobility is that they conflict with pedestrian access. So as they got rolled out to the community, um, don't want to name any names, there are some companies that were not responsible uh, in their rollout. And we found as a community that many of their equipment pieces were just left uh, in on sidewalks. And I think that the county uh, probably would like to state as a goal that we don't want micromobility to conflict with pedestrian access. Um, so I think it's reasonable that we encourage the board to integrate uh, a, a policy objective that uh, micromobility shall not obstruct pedestrian access. So that means bikeway, bikes shouldn't be left on sidewalks. Um, because people who use the sidewalks and other types of pedestrian access with strollers, with walkers, shouldn't be obstructed as micromobility becomes more common. Got it. Thank you. <clears throat> really great explanation. I appreciate that. All right. Um, there aren't any other questions. Um, I would suggest we take a vote and move on to the next one. Yeah. I think I'm good. Can you do me one favor? Sorry, can you scroll up to the top one again? Sure. Ken, you should also have these in your email as well. I mean, just what we're happy to scroll up. Like, okay, sorry. Right. That's, that's, that's part of the, the conversation at the beginning. I mean, we're happy to have them on the screen as we discuss them to the public who's on. No, but you should also, just so you know, um, I asked Jocelyn. They came from Jocelyn so that I was not emailing the PC. So that uh, uh, Rachel, can email. you make the provision change in... Page, on the page 57, 4.1.12 that you make, can you make that in red so it's consistent? Um, okay, oh, yeah, that's, that's just my some, fault. Some things are in red, some things are in black, but what's underlined is 
in addition. Yeah, anything I, else. Yeah. Everything yeah. else is in red, so. I know, I'm sorry. Um, Tim, did you have a question about something still? Uh, no, that was it. Thank you. I just wanted to refresh one of the things that we already read. So I think I'm good. And so does anyone else have any other questions or uh, suggestions for amendments? I don't. All right, let's vote. Great. Miss, great. I can't see you, but I assume you're here. Can we do a roll call vote? I am. <laughs> All right. Commissioner Lazenby. Yes. Commissioner Violante. Yes. Commissioner Dan. Yes. Commissioner Shepard. Yes. And Chair Gordon. Yes. All right. Motion passes. Thank you. I actually think there's a chance at least I can get through what I want to get through. We have a little more than an hour. So um, I'd like to move on to the AG, ARC, the Ag Resources and Conservation. Let me move this. Whoops. With me. Sorry. Oh, the which? One second. I'm going to move on to the general plan agricultural policies. I can find them. Here we go. That would include sections numbers what? It's the general plan. Right. Okay, I got it. Um, so I'll move the staff recommended um, the staff recommendation with the following changes in this Google Doc that's now shared up on my screen. Oops, I think I'll say chapter five. You all not hear me say chapter five too. <laughs> oh yeah, no, we didn't hear anything. <laughs> Uh, end of day, second it and sector five. Okay, and then can you send it out to Jocelyn? She can share it. I sent it to Jocelyn and she okay. will probably be sending it out. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, all right. So the first change that we're proposing is um, coastal access through ag lands. And this is just calling out that sometimes we need to access public land through ag land in very select circumstances. And so I'm just add, adding some language here to acknowledge that so that, um, so that it's in our general plan that sometimes that occurs. Um, we have a specific situation in the North Coast where this, um, this is the case. The next section is about utility district expansion, which in the study session we had long discussions about, and I really want to appreciate staff's um, attention to this particular issue. And so the language that's added in one and in two, really just to, um, to emphasize and to make more specific what I believe the intention is with these policies, which is to provide service but only to existing development and so the language is designed to reflect that and then we can we'll go back and discuss these in more detail as you guys have questions but um so going on sewer and water lines in the coastal zone again it's the same language that were in the the first two policies um, about this issue so it's just the same language here Then this section is about agricultural buffers. And the added section here is uh, highlighting a section that refers back to any changes in the buffer going through APAC. Um, so this was a confusing one to me because I had to go and figure out what 1.4.2 said and all that. So, um, so it's just adding language there too highlight that. So the next one, okay, the next one, I'm asking that, that actually we keep the current language, the old language, the current language in the general plan, except for a change in the second to last sentence noted below and underlined. Change. Okay. 
what I what am I doing here? Yes, okay. I hope that makes sense. And that's it. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Thank you for that one. Wow. Okay. So well, I'll go back. I'll go back to the top and then we can discuss and take um amendments if necessary. Tim, I think you're muted. Thanks. I was just <laughs> making a joke anyway. Um I was saying that it feels like it takes so much longer to write all these up and it's like this big thing and then it's, oh, it's only like a couple items. It's actually not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all so much reading to get there. Yeah. Um, okay. Rachel, I think one of them got dropped off. Oh, really? Uh-oh. That did seem a little like I was missing something. It's just the one with this. It's one something Tim cares about too, which is the scenic designation. Oh, yeah. That, that happened? should that should be on there. Sorry, Tim. No, I, I don't. Wanna, I I want to make sure it gets added because I think it's something a lot of we've discussed a lot. Um, You're am right. I right? Am I right? That should be on this one, right? That's this um, chapter. Staff, am I right? Sure. The designation of the scenic quarter is in scenic is five? in this chapter. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna add it to the document no. while Tim asks. Yeah. I'm also, okay. gonna need a new motion. I'll we'll probably need to. Friendly amendment, but give me a sec while I get the language. Did I may have missed this? Did we have a we have a motion? Did we have a second on this? Yeah, Allison yeah. seconded it. So I I personally am not in favor of forcing the scenic highway if it's not appropriate. So you know we've heard that staff says that that's not what we have anymore, and I it makes sense to me to to eliminate that until at which point we do have one again. But um. So, but for the rest of these, let's see, I didn't have any questions on the first one. Sorry, let me scroll up. Can you scroll back to the top? Please? Yes, I'm so sorry. Yep. Here so, we are. This, is the first, this is the top. Renee, did you have any questions on the first one? I didn't want to jump past it without giving everyone an opportunity. So this is pretty much all about the coastal zone, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, then uh, I think that I would su support these things in your district because I think you've thought about them carefully and I think these are appropriate changes, yes. Tim, did you have any questions on what's up in this Google Doc? Um, you added that, well, I guess on the first one you added and access to public lands. What's the... Can you give me a little insight sure. on that? Um, so we have a national monument up on the North Coast and one of the access points, um, you will need to cross ag land. And so it's just basically making sure that, um, that that's called out specifically. Okay. It's, it's a rare circumstance, but we have so many state parks and now BLM land that, um, and that's buffered by ag land that I didn't want um, a policy to prohibit accessing public land just because they need to access it through an ag parcel. Got it. Okay. Thank you. That makes sense. Um, second one. I think that makes sense. I, this um, policy for the second one about county sewer district boundaries, uh, utility district expansion. Um, I appreciate the addition. You know, I don't have any problems with it. I don't know if there's like plans or something that, you know, we're kind mm -hmm. of getting, but. Um, no, it's just an added layer of protection and um, this these were policies that coastal staff also was concerned about as well. I think the adequate, the addition of more explicit language is well merited. And so I would firmly support it because I, I you never know what's gonna, what's gonna be proposed. And so, we really need to protect that farming land for the next 20 years. That was the intent. So I'll move. Uh, I'm sorry, Rachel. Can I yeah. can I clarify? Um, so 1.1.13 um, 
there's additional language in that policy now. Are you proposing that that language be removed? Um, when when was it last updated? <laughs> um, so let's see. In the um, in the staff report that was the um, eight twenty four staff report. Um, um, I believe yes. If it's the language from that, I think that I I I liked that language, and I like this language more. I guess I would say. But I, okay. I like. I, I feel like I liked where you were going, and then I I just. Okay, so essentially, I think all that language then is underlined because it, it reads differently than what's in the policy now. So, oh, okay. I wish I could toggle back and look at it. <laughs> I mean, I think it's I think it's getting at the same um, the same intent. So I don't. Um, there is additional language regarding water and sewer lines located below the tillable soil depths, but I think that's addressed elsewhere. Sufficient construction buffers from pipelines to ensure public health and safety. Um, so I think it is getting at the overall same intent. Um, there might be some additional language in the policy that's intended to be protective of ag land. I would I would be happy to add to the motion that you know where staff where staff can add additional language to further strengthen the policies to protect ag land from development is would be welcome okay i would definitely support that um rachel can, if, i don't know if you can scroll down to the bottom if you can see that i added the language back to the proper document and hopefully people can see oh good oh good you have to accept it but good i had I, I put it in the parks and rec document so you're gonna have to go accept but i deleted it out of there but so um what we, we added back in is we actually added highway one's designation from the san mateo county down to monterey and you're gonna have to accept my friendly amendment that we put this back in um, and then there was another, um, and I apologize, the document I sent out to, to everyone did not include this. Um, and then on page 122, um, we just added a direction that the sentence needs to be reworked because um, it's the, the standards on, for considering timber harvest plans, it says where applicable, do not support and or recommend denial of a timber harvest plan based upon its potential for cumulative adverse impacts to water quality, traffic, wildfire, and other affected sources. And I think that sentence could be interpreted that you, the way you are um, assessing these plans, cumulative impacts are not considered. And I think staff, I do believe staff wants them taken into consideration. Um, and if they don't, I think they should, I, we believe they should be. Um, and so I, I we would add a direction that the sentence should be reworked to be clear. In fact, I had some people read the sentence, not, not telling them my own personal views. And they're like, no, no, this is, they agreed that the sentence was recommending not taking cumulative impacts into account and I, I don't think that that's what the county would like to have happen um, so those are the two things that are also in this section that we have intended to include so if the maker of the motion is amenable I believe even as the seconder I can add a friendly amendment um, so yes yes I am thank you so, chair so. chair and commissioners can I ask a question please mm -hmm. on that on that um, sewer districting discussion just a second ago did that was that in the coastal zone only or is that um, countywide my intention is it was in the coastal zone I think that I yeah. think the general plan only deals with it in the coastal zone but okay. staff, staff can probably speak better to it it's been a long time since I've yep. had much so information yeah. <laughs> knowing Rachel. that the, knowing that the coastal zone goes up to the summit and a lot of our northern part of the county will I and I just don't know if it overlaps with our CSA 7 SLV expansion discussions trying to fix some of those septic problems I, I don't know if there's a conflict there I just don't have it in front of me but um maybe maybe one of you know unless we could scroll up to look I'm apologize for taking no, this no, back no 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 that's fine 
Um, this this policy, um, and, and I'm sorry, I, I just about your earlier point too, Rachel, I, I see you're now only addressing one and two, and I was looking at the language at the beginning of the policy. So I think your intent is to keep the language as written plus, but change provisions one and two, correct? Okay, got it. Thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. And um, so this policy um, applies countywide, and it, it talks about type one and three agricultural CA land. Um, so I don't, I, I'd have to look and see whether there was any CA land in in the areas that you were um, referencing, Matt, um, yeah, I, in terms of whether- I don't think it is, but well, I don't know, it could be. I There's, um, you know, there's like seven neighborhoods up in SLV from, um, you know, all the way up through that Boulder Creek area, including the downtown that desperately needs um, sanitation services because their septics are failing. And, and, you know, we're working hard to develop that plan, but I wouldn't want new language here to limit us. So I, maybe we I should do a little- either, but this is just dealing with CA. Yeah, we can we can check that and verify that there's no CA yeah. land. It, that's in district, can you say again, which- just District 5. District five. In, yeah, Boulder Creek, they have some issues up there. Okay. So I will add to my motion if the seconder is amenable to it that um, county staff take a look at those areas outlined yeah. by this DDI director to ensure that this would not prohibit the county from providing a utility district expansion to residences that currently are in need of that. Thank you. I, I doubt it's CA as well, but I, I just want to, out of caution, thank you. I definitely don't want that on my conscience. <laughs> I'm amenable to that, but I also don't, I don't, just to Matt's question, I don't think this would preclude that because it does, I mean, it allows us to serve uh, existing development. It also allows us to address failing systems. So I don't, I don't think that that's a problem anyway, but I'm absolutely amenable to Boulder Ridge. Um, should we go down to the scenic highway and see if there's questions on those last two policies and before we take action? So the intent here is to restore the urban area as a scenic highway, as a designated scenic road in the county. That's that, right, that, that the unincorporated portions of, of Highway 1 be retained as a scenic road. We just reiterate kind of the impacts on our ability to approve urban developments that might be visible from the highway. That would be the one consequence I would just bring up. I do understand that. I think that there's been a couple examples that we've had recently of developments that are violating this policy um, currently that um, should not have been allowed to violate it. and. Um, but that we should, it's a beautiful stretch of roadway and we should strive to keep it that way. And I think that there are a lot of mitigations we can do that are reasonable to development that um, could satisfy the policy. Uh, so any questions on the timber harvest one? I'm uh, I'm still on this on the one before. Sorry, just thinking through this. I mean, these are big decisions that we're making for the county, and I, I just don't understand necessarily is the value of the scenic highway to preclude development. Absolutely not. The value is is to to retain its scenic nature, and that yeah. that didn't happen on accident. It happened because we've had policies. To protect the scenic vistas, so it's not a it's not a um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not an accident that we don't have um, you know billboards or big ugly signs or um, you know you go to other places even along Highway One and you'll see that it looks quite different. And the reason why it's so scenic in Santa Cruz County is because we've had policies that require um, protection from some of those eyesores that you get in other places. I understand that completely. I do, you know, I, I do get that. Um, 
just, you know, I'm inclined to, this is one of those, like you said, you know, the, the planning department has specifically said that this is important for us to adjust this. And they're also going to replant or work to replant a lot of this that they didn't have to include. And so it seemed like they had made concessions to help, you know, make this, make our concerns uh, feel validated with like also getting what they needed to get done and get getting it done. So I don't know, my inclination would be to accept what the planning commission or the planning department suggested knowing that they have a plan for this. And um, without study on what this means, it's hard to just say that it's the right thing to do. And there's well, been so more study as to removing it. Well, I actually would like to see studies on what would happen if we did remove it. I think we already know what happens when we retain it. We retain uh, a scenic, uh, we, we retain the qualities that we have now. Um, so I actually think removing it, I am not comfortable removing it because I actually don't know what that means, except for the couple of mistakes that have been made where uh, a violation of this policy has occurred um, and so I think of that and think, oh, sh that would be all over up and down Highway 1. And that's that's why I want to retain it, because I actually don't know um, what, what it would look like without it. Yeah, I share Commissioner Dan's concerns about what I, I, I absolutely hear Chair Gordon's cons concerns about um, listening to staff. And I know that there's some projects proposed along the corridor that are larger in mass and maybe visible from, from the highway. Um, but I do worry that essentially the, the logic behind removing it is we didn't do a good enough job of enforcing it. So we lost some of our the, the justification for scenic. And that seems like a terrible reason to just continue down the path that got us here. And instead we need to have a conversation about um, better uh, protecting the scenic corridor through um, either visual screening or things like that versus kind of throwing up our hands and saying, well, we're fine with, we don't know what, which is Commissioner Dan's point, which is how, how much are we going to see lighted signs, um, uh, less greenery and things like that along an area that we have historically protected and preserved and the community has, has asked us to. Um, and so I think there needs to be greater exploration about what it would mean to remove the scenic corridor I mean, because essentially you're asking an entire community to to just, we're already designating a lot of these places to have greater development and rightfully so, uh, but we also should have greater conversations about screening um, and not allowing a light pollution into these communities simply because we, we unfortunately didn't, didn't do a good enough job um, historically. Uh, as a community of enforcing some of the protections. Like Ms. Dan said, there are some areas, there are some projects that have gone through in the not too distant past where we have have allowed some of these to happen along that corridor that perhaps shouldn't have. And I, I, I without knowing the full scale of what it could mean to get rid of it, I'd, I'd rather say Santa Cruz County has historically wanted to not have these large lighted developments billboards and things like that along our area. And I know that that's not on the highway, that's not our, but I think it's better to keep the protections we have in terms of trying to protect um, the, the almost bucolic nature that we've asked for in our area um, and to just say no. Well, if I could just weigh on this one, I'd like to support what Commissioner Violante and Commissioner Dan said. I think it's something a lot, most residents strongly endorse and there's so many ways it can be mitigated. I mean, sitting on hearing after hearing, if, if it's in place, then developers look to see how they can fit into that, uh, how they can make it work. And they all, and they have pretty much always been able to do that. And I, I would totally support this language. I don't know about uh, Judy, do you have an opinion? We're at the bottom. Are we ready to vote? Uh, I want to ask one more question on this really quick. So I, I appreciate everyone's um, 
responses and I thank you for digging in a little bit. I just wanted to understand from Ms. Hansen, you know, is this gonna preclude us some developments? Is there a way to say that, you know, uh, we could mitigate developments in the view shed as opposed, you know, if we leave this in, you know, what does it do? And is there a way to either dig in a little more and provide at the Board of Supervisors some alternative where we could keep this in and then also still get the development uh, potential that we're trying to get? Um, There's um, many policies in this section of the general plan that would apply to new development. Um, and Just trying to think, I you know it'll it take more work for those uh, properties that are in the designated area and are visible from this um, portion, and it would take some mitigation. Could I, you know, add to some costs? Um, it doesn't necessarily preclude development, um, but it does take some you know discretionary review to make sure that policies are consistent. So. Chair and commissioners would, uh, and Stephanie, you might know the answer to this, I just don't know. Um, would wireless facilities be impacted by this one way or the other? Because I know up in the North Coast, we do have some real need for um, additional connectivity up there. The, the wireless ordinance um, goes a long way toward its own type of mitigation, so I, I wouldn't be concerned too concerned about about that. Great. They the new ordinance really is, requires them to do quite a bit of work to mask and yeah. camouflage the facilities. Great, thank you. Okay, so just to process what you said, also I think that um, there's ways to mitigate around being by the scenic highway and still be able to build what we're saying we want people to build. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we've had loads of <laughs> developments since the last, since this policy has been in place. Um, so it doesn't preclude development. Yeah, the only thing that I would add to the discussion was that um, when we first started to embark on whether this would be a good change, it was more about mm -hmm. the loss of the trees in the mm -hmm. particular area to disease over time, as opposed to the development itself. So just to add to the discussion a little bit. Right. I mean, so I'm sorry, can you, you're talking about because we lost trees to disease, yeah. That's why we should get rid of it. But to me, that's all the more reason to keep it and just over time, the trees will come back as people replant uh, as part of their no, just, plans. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, just adding, no, that's not what I'm, what I'm saying. I'm just adding another layer to the discussion that it, you know, it was about the, the uh, more of a natural loss of trees as opposed to developments that had been approved when we, you know, when we started this. And so the trees, um, the trees are necessarily not there. The right of way gets pretty, uh, the Caltrans right of way gets pretty skinny in some areas. And so, um, you know, I think when you look at, at that urban portion, it gets hard to say that it's still scenic. So I was just adding a little bit to the discussion, not trying to change the direction. Well, we talked about this a lot. Maybe we should go ahead and vote on it now. Okay, I agree. So I would move for what we've, you we've already had a motion. Okay, and a second. Shepherd. Yep, and a second. And okay. so once we're all done with conversation, then we can definitely go to a vote. But I don't want to feel rushed, like I don't have the time to discuss these because that's what we're here for. Right. So do you have any other additional questions? I don't at this time, but I would appreciate you know. The opportunity and you know not being pushed I don't appreciate that at this time we should take a vote I believe that we are ready um can we please have a roll call vote Ms. Drake yes Commissioner Lazenby oh I think I muted you I keep getting kicked off the island Sorry, when there's background noise at any at all, it it it's I mute I 
been muting folks. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Well, I, I vote yes. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner yeah. Violante. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Dan. Yes. Commissioner Shepard. Yes. And Chair Gordon. No. Okay, okay, that is completed. And do you have another item you'd like to go over, Commissioner Dan? So I can, we can, um, I can bring up the parks. This is the last general plan section. Let's see, here we go. Okay. So this is the parks, recreation, and public facilities. General plan chapter. Um, so I move the staff recommendation with the following changes included in the Google Doc that is now up on the screen. Can you email us out as oh, excuse me? Do we have a second? Mm -hmm. You're muted, Allison. Oh, yeah, I was just saying yes, we were going to email it out. And yes, I'm happy to second it as well. I just sent it to Jocelyn. I think she probably just hasn't sent it because nobody seconded it yet. Yes, I will send it now. And these are just a couple. <laughs> so, um, okay, the first, the first one is... Um, is retaining a sentence in this policy 4.1.2 that actually um, is basically restating uh, in a different way what is in the policy. Um, but the final sentence is you'll see down there in cross out, we are suggesting to retain um, that the county decision making body shall not approve any development project unless it unless it determined that such project has adequate water supply. So it's re-emphasizing um, some language that's also in the policy. Uh, oops, let's see. There's a misspelled word in the second line. Oh, geez. Thank you, Judy. Deter <laughs> determines. Determine oh, thank you. Gosh, you're right. You're welcome. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Um, is that it? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Is that it, Allison? Yes. Okay. So that's it. Was there any discussion? Questions? I'm sorry, I'm reading it still. If anyone oh, else, yeah. Go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead. Yeah. All right. Um, this utility is an infrastructure language, which seems the change you have made is very agreeable to me. But is this in? Parks, recreation, and public facilities element? It is. It's about public facilities as opposed to parks. And I also want to say I sent a whole batch of questions to staff on this general plan chapter, and I just want to thank staff for replying to those questions and and it was super helpful and that's why I just had one because you guys did such a great job responding to those questions that I sent you ahead of time I want to thank you for that thank you thanks to Natisha on that one I don't have any questions on this it seems to make sense I don't understand I don't know what you know there's a substantial change between purveyor and agency but, but, you know, it seems like the terms are probably fine. I mean, the same thing. Um, sounds fine to me. Anybody else? I don't have any questions. Okay. And we can take a roll call vote on this section. 
Mrs. Drake. Okay. Let's see. Commissioner Lazenby. Yes. Commissioner Violante. Yes. Commissioner Dan. Yes. Commissioner Shepard. Yes. And Chair Gordon. Yes. Okay. Motion passes. So we are at 4.30. Um, I understand the chair has a hard stop at five. Um, we have, from, from what I have prepared, um, we have the zoning code and then some other random cleanup items. The zoning code is pretty substantial. I don't think we can do it in a half hour, probably. I, I, would, um, I would be for moving, maybe shutting down our tent a little early. I don't think we're all tired, and I certainly don't feel like I'm thinking on all four cylinders or two. So what about we do have another full day. Maybe we can all plan for as long as it takes on the 24th. May 1st. First. Sorry. 21st. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> could, could I ask a question, Chair? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, will the other commissioners also be offering amendments on the general plan, or would this be the end of the general plan discussion? I, can't. Um, I didn't have anything further on the general plan. So I think if it we maybe the intent is to maybe close that item out, and we could probably do that. If that's, I, I I honestly can't say that I don't have a few more comments. We can also wait. You know, I think that this. I know we got to get through this, but we're here to give each other the time to think through this and do this right. It's a lot of work to go in to be rushed at the end, and so. If you feel like you have more comments, let's let's wait. I just like to leave the possibility open for the meeting on the twenty first. Agreed. Thank you. Well, uh, Commissioner Dan, yes. Would it be helpful if you? Well, I don't know whether this is Justin might not like this, but. Um, to send this out the pages on this next this upcoming section on zones boy would i love to <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> oh, you yeah. haven't finished well, Justin, will not let us. <laughs> like obviously commissioner violante and i are brown acted up and so we've been working together and so I, i'm not allowed to talk substantively about the issues with another commissioner so. okay is there an opportunity to present them now without a motion? And, and um, I don't. I, I would be happy to present them now, but I would want it there to. I would do it as a motion. I uh, don't understand. So, so Commissioner Gordon was asking if I would present Commissioner Violante in my recommended changes to the zoning code outside of a motion and I replied that no, that I am only going to do it as a motion. But we need to wait till next time then. This is long and short of it. Yeah, I mean, yes. We, we wouldn't have to. Commissioner Dan does not want to, sounds like he doesn't want to share those opinions early. I mean, not unless what, we're willing to. What about um, we'll, on, on, on September 21st, is that when we're going to talk about changes to the code? I'm, I don't quite yeah. understand what we're doing Ab here. Absolutely. Okay. On that day, um, I'll be prepared to share a number of changes that Commissioner Violante and I have crafted. And then and then that could extend to the meeting on the, on the 28th. No, uh, I will be we will finish that <laughs> on that day if I have anything to say about it. Second that motion. <laughs> Third. <laughs> so okay. we are going to try and finish up the zoning changes, et cetera, and then get on to the code amendments where I have much more to say myself anyway. Right? So that's our plan for next Wednesday. 
Yeah. Next Wednesday, will not only the zoning code, but any item that we haven't discussed. And I would suggest that we go through all the items that we have to talk about. And then at the end, we can make one motion to approve the remaining items that weren't discussed. Um, and then we'll be done. And hopefully we get through that next week. Do we need a motion to continue the hearing to yeah. next Wednesday yeah. at 930? Yes. Someone like to make that motion? Uh, I'll uh, make that motion that we continue the hearing to next Wednesday at 930. I'll second it. Wonderful. Thank you. Can we have a roll call vote on that, Ms. Drake? Yes. Commissioner Violante? Yes. Commissioner Lazenby? Yes. Commissioner Dan? Yes. Commissioner Shepard? Yes. And Chair Gordon? Yes. Okay. Uh, with that, we can close that item for today, move on to the next scheduled agenda item, which is my schedule. Planning director's report. Well, we just. Real quick, I do want to say thank you to everyone. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'm Thank you. Talking. Really stressful. I appreciate it. And I apologize if I feel a little grouchy. Um, I work really hard to give everyone the time that they need. And I just, some, when I feel rushed, I feel like I haven't been given that same level of respect. And so I just appreciate that you guys give me the time that I need. And I know that took a little longer. So thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you. You've done an excellent job as chair. Thank okay. you. Yeah, and thank you from staff to to the commission to working through all this. It's it is not easy. We we recognize that. Um, we just lost the uh, CDI director to a meeting he couldn't get out of uh, in District One. Um, so I'll just say we have no no director's report. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, report on upcoming meeting dates and agendas. Clearly, we have the. 21st and then after that what do we have coming up um after that we have uh our regulars regularly scheduled meeting date of september 28th um and we have three items on that agenda not related to the sustainability update um and um and then in october the only thing I have on the horizon so far is a potential water presentation on October the 12th. Um, but we're waiting to see if we have other um, PC reservations that come through. So that's tentative. And beyond that, we do not have, let me just, I see. Commissioner Shepard, excuse me. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I was like trying to find a way to mute. Thank you. Um, and yeah, beyond that, we don't have anything on the horizon. Um, however, we do have a lot of projects that will be coming to the planning commission in process right now. So I expect we will see a project or two this winter. Um, I also um, wanted to say two things. One is I wanted to apologize for um, the snafu that occurred on the September 1st special meeting date. It was due to a technical error, Stephanie mentioned that, but I wanted to um, to just say I'm sorry about that. Um, there were some issues with um, the CTV um, overbooking that Zoom link actually is what happened. Um, and uh, so we got that sorted out for the 21st, just so everybody knows, uh, should be um, good to go for the 21st. And then the other thing I wanted to report on really quickly is we are trying to bring um, the meetings back to the chambers this winter, and I'll probably send a poll out to you all to just get your thoughts on that. It comes up every six months or so. We discuss bringing mm -hmm. meetings back to the chambers. Um, so we would like to do that um, if there's support from the planning commissioners. So I'll send a, a poll out there, and I think that's all I have. Great. Thank you. Um, the report on the 12th about the, the water um, information, is that what Mr. Machado was talking about last week? Or Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Cool. Awesome. That's exciting. Um, okay. Then we can move on. to. Could, can I just ask one quick question? Sure. He's going to make a water presentation. Is there a water project coming up? Is there something? What is it? I don't get it. 
It's really, it's really just to um, let the commission know about uh, what the water suppliers are doing. I think um, based on the discussion you had previously, they've reached out to um, SoCal and the city, I think, um, to get their perspectives as well. And water is such an important issue. Uh, I think the director thought it was you know, worth a rounded discussion for the Planning Commission's benefit and the public. Thanks. Okay, um, thank you for that. Any update from County Council today? No report, thank you. <laughs> okay, that brings us to the end of our hearing. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, all the staff. Yes. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Thank you very much.